experience or research. Armed teachers are never an acceptable replacement for law enforcement who undergo extensive and ongoing firearms training. It poses significant risk to our students' safety and sacrifices the primary focus of our wonderful educators. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank you very much. This concludes public testimony. Trustees, are there any questions or clarifications? Um, I have one quick question, um, Superintendent Segura. Can you share with us uh, when the public might be hearing about the district's plans for responding to HB3? Thank you, President Singh. Um, as the, uh, our um, committee members have pointed out, um, a bill has recently passed that requires AIC to take action. Um, I want to reassure our community that the plan that we bring forward will be in alignment with our values. Uh, we certainly um, understand the concerns uh, and we're going to bring back a plan uh, that is thoughtful and that aligns again with our values as a community. So as far as timing goes, uh, we're developing that now. Um, you know, our plan is to have that before the board uh, in August, uh, but we'll be having opportunities for input prior to that. So I would say late July, early August is when you'll see that plan really take, take shape and be able to be presented publicly. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I'd love to yes. I'd love to ask a second brief follow-up. Can you just, um, in just you know a minute or so, uh, clarify for our community the kind of training that the people who are currently armed, our Austin ISD PD officers, undergo? Just the extent of it, and and what our values have set up there. Yeah, Trustee Boswell, I think that's, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that we always talk about is you know having um, officers that are trained and and understanding that. Um, serving students is different than what a traditional, you know, city officer or sheriff would go through. Um, it's different, right? It's community uh, support more than anything else. And so here at Austin ISD, uh, our training process is extensive. Um, before anybody can actually enter a school, we have over almost a year worth of training. Uh, typically, a cadet comes into our organization. We invest in them. We train them. De-escalation techniques, uh, everything that we would want. Um, if someone has to be armed in our uh, campus and that person is trained and that's what our SROs currently go through now. Uh, so we would expect that same level um, of, of a commitment to any person um, that would be part of this plan. Uh, but it is a, a ongoing extended process uh, and it takes close to a year to get someone through it uh, and onto our campus. Thank you very much. Thank you and I just want to um, acknowledge that the district has a school safety and security committee every public school district in texas does but um, that does give folks it does give you a front row seat to what some of the things the district is doing so if there are members of the public that are interested in that um, you'll find more information on our website it's the school safety and security committee thank you all right so we will now move um, to what we've been waiting for uh, which is discussion of the <laughs> fy 2023 budget uh, so next we have our presentation um, on that by Ed Ramos. So Mr. Segura, would you please introduce? Absolutely. Good evening, uh, President Singh and trustees. I'd like to invite our Chief Financial Officer, Ed Ramos, to join us to provide uh, the recommended budget um, for the 23-24 fiscal year. Uh, just before we get started, I want to point out that, you know, when we started this process, we acknowledged that there were a lot of um, needs within our community uh, and, with our, and within our schools, but certainly limited resources. But early on in the process, we identified compensation. We identified the need to support and invest in our staff as one of the highest priorities. And so uh, I think when you see the budget, you will see that it reflects our values. It's in alignment with our initiatives and many of the things that we've been tackling, including uh, supporting um, students that receive special education services to a greater degree are reflected in this budget. Um, it is a challenge. Uh, it always is every year. And as we move forward, uh, there are lessons that we've learned along the way this time that will apply next time, including starting earlier and establishing um, some standards, I should say, early in the process so that we have decisions and known commitments well before we start the planning cycle for the upcoming year. And so I just wanted to kind of start that and, and see the conversation. And now, Ed, I'll hand it back to you. 
President Singh, Superintendent Segura, members of the board, uh, we are here to uh, listen and hear the 23-24 proposed budget. Uh, as Superintendent Segura mentioned, this was a long process. It was a seven month process where we uh, were really proud of making sure that we engaged our community, our staff, uh, our leadership team, uh, our board of trustees, and really develop uh, the priorities as a district. And, and as mentioned, uh, compensation was the number one priority, uh, as well as other uh, areas that we really prioritized based on input that we received uh, from our stakeholders. Uh, I do, before I begin, want to recognize members of my staff who were critical in helping me put these numbers together. We have Adriana Cedillo, uh, our executive director of budget, and Jessica Hart, our director of budget as well. Thank you, ladies. And so as we be began uh, our budget assumptions, uh, one of the things that we really wanted to make sure is we budgeted conservatively. So we uh, based our budget on a flat enrollment. So we are assuming that we are not going to grow uh, next school year with the uh, overall number of students. And that's just us being uh, conservative as a school district. Our attendance rate is based on a 92% attendance rate which is basically where uh, we have been averaging uh, as a school district uh, after the pandemic, during and after the pandemic. And so before uh, we actually uh, uh, kind of uh, really uh, faced the challenges of the pandemic, we were usually at 95 or 96%. So you see the, the difference that uh, how that uh, has affected us as a school district. Property value growth, we're looking at a 14% uh, property value growth. And then we are looking at a uh, tax rate that we are recommending of uh, 92.66 cents, which is actually four cents below what we uh, were estimating to our voters when we had our bond election back in November of 2022. Also as part of the, the budget development uh, process, uh, we are basing our numbers, the numbers that you will see before you tonight, uh, are based on current state funding. So we are not taking into account uh, conversations that are happening at the legislative level. Uh, which right now uh, is not uh, in, in our favor. Uh, but all the numbers that you will see before you tonight are based on current uh, uh, funding uh, from the state. We are also making sure that we maintain our local fund balance policy of 20%. And then we also uh, continue to invest uh, in our employees uh, in this district. And so you will see that in our compensation package that we have uh, already uh, presented, uh, but 87% of our budget uh, goes back uh, and is invested in our employees in this district. So they are the backbones of, of our uh, district, and so we wanted to make sure, especially during this ch challenging time with high inflation, with the cost of living continuing to increase, with uh, teachers leaving the profession, that we really invested in our employees to, to make sure that we made a strong effort uh, to retain our valuable employees. Uh, also, the 88th legislative session has uh, put a kink in our planning process, especially when it comes uh, to really understanding what our uh, funding will be for next year. Uh, as of uh, June 22nd, we still do not know what that funding is going to look like for next year. Uh, we are hearing that there will be special sessions throughout the summer. Uh, we probably won't have any finality to what, if any, uh, education funding increases would look like until September. And so that has posed a challenge in this budgeting process. Uh, but we continue to move forward as a district. We wanted to make sure that employees were able to make a decision early. They are making decisions now. And so we move forward with our priorities. Uh, also, as part of this uh, budget, we are recommending uh, expenditure reduction strategies. And so we are proposing a deficit budget. That's not a phenomenon just only to Austin ISD. Many districts throughout the state uh, will be passing deficit budgets. Uh, was in a meeting with the Texas uh, School Alliance. Uh, many of those districts, if not most of those districts, are passing deficit budgets uh, because they are facing the same challenges. Teachers are leaving the profession. Uh, employees are uh, making decisions whether or not to stay in their districts. And so they knew that they needed uh, to move forward with a compensation package. Um, and then when you look at our proposed uh, budget summary, uh, recapture, we are estimating a recapture payment of $941 million. Uh, that continues to be a challenge. Uh, the only uh, way that recapture payment can be reduced uh, is an increase to the basic allotment. So we'll talk about that uh, a little bit further in the presentation. Uh, our operating expenditures uh, are $884 million. 
And so we're looking at a $1.86 billion uh, budget that we are proposing for next year. Um, and that uh, proposal will include a deficit budget of $52 million. Uh, when we presented uh, at the info session in June, uh, we presented a $53 million deficit. We have uh, dwindled that down to $52 million. Uh, but it's important uh, for the board to note that we are recommending a deficit budget. Uh, our goal is this to be the year uh, that we uh, recommend a deficit budget, and then in future years, uh, it's going to be very important for us to continue to look at balancing that budget in the future. So there are some tough decisions uh, that will come over the next several years, starting uh, this next fiscal year. And then when you look at our forecast, <clears throat> we like to forecast based on our, what we believe to be our worst case scenario. And so when you look at the numbers before you, uh, with the $52 million deficit next year, uh, 68 the following year after that, and 60 million uh, the year after, uh, this is assuming that funding for education doesn't change over the next several years. This is also assuming that we do nothing as a district with regards to uh, reducing uh, our expenditures or addressing our deficit. And so that won't be the case. And so I will show you further on in the presentation the importance of strategies to reduce expenditures and how that affects uh, our long-term uh, financial stability of this district. And so when you look at our unassigned fund balance, our goal has always been as a district uh, to make sure that we keep at least 20% of operating expenditures in unassigned fund balance. Uh, so next year's uh, budget, uh, we still are meeting that goal at 21.4%. Uh, the year after that, you're seeing 16.3% and 9.8. Again, uh, looking at a worst case scenario. Uh, and again, uh, based on current year funding with no additional funding from the state. So that's, that's another reason why this slide is going to become very important as a district, uh, because we know that we have to uh, continue to address uh, our budget uh, situation. Uh, again, we are not alone uh, in the state of Texas. Many school districts, you will start uh, hearing about uh, budget reduction strategies in other districts as well. And so before you, you have some of our uh, preliminary uh, budget reduction strategies. Uh, that includes uh, pos position reductions through attrition. So as employees leave, we, we look at uh, positions and really uh, determine and analyze if we can afford uh, to continue with specific positions in the district. Uh, the majority of those decisions are going to be based on non-campus uh, positions. Uh, most of the campus positions uh, are high needs in this district, so those uh, are not going to be weighed uh, the same as non-campus type positions in the district. Uh, also looking at vacancy savings, uh, one of the, the uh, strategies that we can implement as a district uh, through vacancies is uh, as an employee leaves uh, a position uh, for uh, another opportunity uh, in, in their uh, uh, lives, one of the things that we can do is delay the hiring process. So even if we delay a month uh, for a district our size, that can translate to two to three million dollars in savings. And so those are some of the strategies that we are going to look at. Uh, also looking again at contracts and software costs in the district, really analyzing uh, the return on investment, uh, the outcomes that uh, these contracts and, and software can produce and making sure that uh, uh, we are uh, getting uh, our return on investment for these products. So that is going to be uh, scrutinized and analyzed throughout uh, this next school year. Uh, we also, any budget increases in any area in the district, must be neutral. So what that means is if we really prioritize spending in a certain area, then we're going to have to reduce expenditures in another area to make uh, the, the budget strategy neutral so as not to increase our projected deficit budget. And then again, we have the opportunity with the 2022 bond program to really begin implementing savings uh, through that program. Uh, we have a fund set aside uh, for purchase of HVAC equipment uh, and other equipment. So what that would uh, help our operating budget with is that we would not have to rent uh, high dollar equipment uh, in this district. Also continuing to identify inefficient costs uh, and areas that we can, can begin reducing expenditures. Uh, maximize our Title I funding, making sure that uh, we really uh, are able to supply our campuses uh, with the highest need with the funding that they, that they need as a 
uh, in this district. And then begin a budget oversight committee. So that's gonna be very important uh, for our district as we begin looking at uh, our expenditures. And so we will have uh, community members that will uh, help us uh, look at the data, uh, look at our costs, and give us feedback on our budget reduction strategies. And so with that, we have a timeline. Uh, of course, our fiscal year begins July 1st, uh, which is just around the corner. Uh, August through September timeframe, we are going to, as an administration, begin looking at uh, our expenditures uh, at a high level. And so by the time uh, the legislative process has ended uh, and we come to the board with a budget amendment, uh, we're thinking uh, either September or October, uh, we will already include some preliminary recommendations to reduce our deficit. So uh, we will uh, bring back some uh, budget reduction strategies as an administrative team uh, to the board by the September, October timeframe. Uh, also, uh, we begin uh, our sessions with our budget committee in October. And so we want to really begin the budgeting process early just because of the challenges that we know uh, we will be facing as a district. Uh, and to really uh, give our campuses, our principals, uh, our staff time to really weigh uh, some of the decisions that we are looking at implementing as a district. Uh, some of the uh, begin forming our budget priorities for the following fiscal year. And so we want to make sure that we begin that process uh, much earlier. And so when you look at implementing these budget uh, deficit reduction strategies, uh, you quickly see our projections change. And so just by implementing some of these strategies that we have uh, preliminarily proposed, uh, our budget uh, deficit could uh, reach as low as 19 million next year versus the 52 million. Uh, after that, 30 million and 22 million. And so again, this keeping in mind is based on current uh, year funding. And so it's very important that we really look at uh, these budget reduction strategies. You also see what it does to our fund balance. So uh, in our worst case scenario, we were okay with our 20% local policy for one year. Uh, with these budget reduction strategies, uh, if we do implement them, now we are looking uh, to be strong financially for the next three years. And so that just shows the importance of some of the decisions uh, that we must make as a district over the next several years. This slide basically shows when we adopt a budget in June uh, versus when we end the school year uh, at the end of uh, July. And so you'll see that when we adopt our budgets, we try to give a, a worst case scenario. We usually end uh, the budget much better uh, than projected. So when you look at the uh, 20, uh, 21, 2021 school year, we projected a $48 million deficit, end it with 32 million. In 2022, we projected a 44 million deficit, ended with a $32 million surplus. 2023, we projected a $5 million surplus. We're projecting to end this current school year with an $8 million surplus. And so when you look at next uh, fiscal year's deficit of 52 million, again, we are projecting to end better than what we are projecting currently. And so some of the major uh, investments that we have moved forward with as a district uh, include uh, special ed and special education and bilingual stipends. Uh, we are increasing those from 5,000 to 7,000, so that's an $8 million cost. Uh, compensation and budget priorities, uh, we have implemented those, about 56 million. Uh, there are certain costs that are increasing in this district that we have no control over. Uh, some of those include uh, the electricity rate adjustment, uh, which means our electrical costs are increasing uh, as a district. We are also opening a brand new school, and so that will increase our electrical costs, our operating costs. Uh, our Travis County uh, appraisal and fees, uh, we, we have no control over that. And then property insurance premiums are some of the uh, areas that uh, we must, that basically are fixed costs in this district. Uh, we are also uh, really uh, prioritizing um, are economically disadvantaged and emergent bilingual weights in the district, 6.3 million. Uh, our instructional coaches, we've added uh, instructional coaches on our operating budget, 10 additional positions, that's at almost half a million dollars. Uh, small campus, uh, teacher minimum, uh, we've added 17 FTEs to our small campuses, that's a cost of one million. And then our uh, educational diags and LSSPs, 
Uh, we've invested uh, 50 additional FTEs, 6.2 million. Uh, expansion of Literacy First is a recommendation uh, that we are making as a district, that's uh, $1.3 million. Because of the legislative session and really not knowing where we stand uh, with regards to any increase to the basic allotment, uh, we also are proposing to delay uh, certain investments uh, from our early uh, recommendations. Uh, and again, these are based on the feedback that we've received over the past month uh, with regards to how can we reduce our uh, deficit. And so when we look at uh, some of those areas and, and opportunities, uh, we see General Marshall Middle School, we, we can reduce six FTEs uh, uh, from our original allotment of 30. So that's a $250,000 savings. Uh, athletic trainers uh, uh, hold off on hiring six. That's at a cost of half a million. The Ombudsman's office uh, hold off on one of the two FTEs there, uh, 120,000. And then paper report cards, 320,000. So, with uh, delayed investments in those areas. And what we're saying is we're not necessarily uh, taking those off of the budget, we're just delaying the process until we find out uh, what uh, uh, our ultimate funding is from the state of Texas. And so with those delays, we are looking at a $52 million deficit as a district. We are proud uh, of our compensation package that the board uh, did approve. Uh, that came at a $64 million investment. Uh, that included uh, an increase of $4 uh, to our hourly employees. And so now our minimum pay is $20 uh, per hour. Uh, one of the things that, that really impacted was over 2,100 employees in this district who were below that $20 an hour range. So that's a huge uh, benefit to many of our employees, our hourly employees. Uh, we also uh, looked at uh, special ed and bilingual stipends, $7,000. Uh, that came at a cost of five, uh, $8 million. Uh, our administrative and professionals, 5% uh, for pay grades AP 1 through 12, 3% uh, AP 13 through 16. Teacher pay raises, we have one of the higher percentages in the Central Texas area, 7%. Uh, that was a, uh, at $23 million. And then uh, our base salary for LSSPs and educational DIAGs, a 20% increase. Recapture continues to be a challenge uh, for our district. Uh, we are estimating a recapture payment uh, for the 2023-24 fiscal year of $940.5 million. Uh, the year after that, in 24-25, we expect to reach over a billion dollars in recapture payments. So recapture, as you know, is uh, funds that we send back to the state of Texas. As a school district, we uh, that uh, recapture amount, the 940.5 million, is enough to fund another Austin ISD. So that is uh, the amount that we send back to the state of Texas. It's 55% of our local tax collections. So uh, over half of our tax collections go back to the state. Uh, the only way uh, opportunity for that recapture payment to be reduced would be an increase to the basic allotment. And so uh, we await to see what the final outcome is this legislative session. We also monitor our administrative cost ratio. Uh, TA does have a recommendation on the uh, ratio that they would like uh, districts our size to maintain. Uh, that's a standard of 0 0.0855. And so we are projecting to be under uh, that standard. And so that was a goal that we set out uh, as a district this year to make sure that next year's budget, we were below uh, that threshold. So we will continue to monitor that and ensure that we uh, do maintain and, and, and continue to uh, be below that uh, TA ratio. And then this just simplifies our budget in a $1 bill. Uh, showing that over half of our dollar uh, goes back to the state in the form of recapture, uh, 940.5 million. Uh, and then we have $922 million uh, left to operate as a district. From uh, those $922 million, we continue to invest 87% uh, in our teachers and our staff in this district. So we are uh, proud of that uh, percentage. It's one of the higher percentages in Central Texas, so we continue uh, to be committed to our employees. And then this slide basically uh, cuts down our uh, budget by functional area. And so our biggest uh, functional expenditures occur in instruction. Uh, then we also have facilities and operations, instructional 
uh, and school leadership, student services. So this is just a way of looking at our total budget. Uh, when you look at our schoolhouse, the majority of our budget goes uh, back uh, to the state and recapture. And then this uh, splits our budget uh, by program intent code. And so basically uh, what that means is you look at different areas uh, of uh, programs. Uh, those include comp ed, uh, career and tech, early childhood, uh, athletics, dyslexia, bilingual education, college career and military readiness, and gifted and talented. So this uh, graphic breaks out uh, how we as a district spend in those different program, programmatic areas. And then our tax rate, uh, we are proposing, or we will propose in September, a tax rate that is seven cents uh, less than uh, our current year tax rate. Uh, as stated earlier, uh, we are also projecting uh, four cents below what we had promised our voters. And so we are keeping that promise. So we are looking at 92.66 cents. Uh, one of the uh, current discussions that is occurring at the legislative level is with uh, tax compression. And so there are two uh, different plans that are being proposed legislatively. You've probably heard about them in uh, the media. Uh, the uh, Lieutenant Governor's plan is that uh, really concentrates on homestead exemptions, $100,000 homestead exemptions. So that plan really benefits homeowners. Uh, then the plan on the House side is uh, concentrating on appraisal caps, 5% appraisal caps. And so that uh, version really looks at also assisting businesses uh, in the state of Texas. And then the legislative process. And so we are continuing to monitor uh, the legislative process. Uh, unfortunately, it uh, has not been the outcome that we were hoping for. Uh, we were hoping for an early decision uh, from the Texas legislature uh, with regards to funding so that we could really uh, determine uh, the, the maximum amount that we can invest uh, in our district and our employees. And so, uh, again, looking at uh, the conversations that are occurring at the legislative level, uh, we probably won't know uh, a final outcome until September. Uh, so they have set aside $3.9 billion in school funding, uh, but, but as of now, uh, we have not seen uh, any increase to the basic allotment. So there is no additional funding for school districts at this point. Uh, when we talk about property tax relief and that costing about $12 billion, uh, that is no additional funding to school districts in the state, including Austin. And so uh, when, when they talk about investing uh, in property tax relief and lowering school district tax rates, uh, those are not additional dollars that come to any school district in the state. Uh, also, the conversation that's occurring uh, currently is with vouchers, and so vouchers uh, would really hurt districts throughout the state, including Austin. And so that is a conversation that uh, continues uh, at the legislative level. Uh, we estimate that for uh, every student we lose as a result of vouchers, uh, we would be losing about 6, 000, over $6,000 per student uh, in this district. And then safety and security, uh, they have uh, passed an allotment of $10 per ADA, that's a 28 cent increase over the prior allotment. Uh, they've also added $15,000 uh, per campus. And so what we are uh, projecting is actually a net shortfall uh, from that safety and security allotment of about a little over uh, close to two and a half, three million dollars uh, <laughs> from those requirements. So uh, a further challenge that we'll have to address uh, as we continue this budgeting process uh, for the next fiscal year. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Trustees, any questions? Hi, y'all. This is Nelly, uh, Trustee Lugo. I have a question. Yes, Trustee Lugo. Thanks for zooming in. Absolutely. So um, just in case you all hear background music, I am in fact at Fort, in Fort Worth at one of our um, trustee leadership conferences. Um, so first I wanna say thank you for allowing me to join by Zoom. Second, um, thank you Chief Ramos for providing um, a thorough update regarding the budget constraints that we're facing um, as a result of decisions made at the legislative level. Um, I did want to ask a couple of questions um, just to make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're being transparent about the 
incredibly difficult decisions we're making. Um, I appreciate that we're talking about which investments we will move forward with, and the fact that um, although what's being proposed tonight is that we um, delay or maybe slow down um, other investments, including investments in athletics. I'm wondering if you could uh, revisit, I believe, I don't remember what slide it was on, but you talked a little bit about um, the full-time employee positions, the FTEs, and which ones uh, would be filled sooner rather than later. Um, can you provide a little bit more context around, um, for example, what are some of the realities and constraints that we're facing if we were to fill um, athletic positions since those um, coach positions generally begin their contracts July, I think it's sometime in July, mid-July, July 19th. Um, what are some of the realities that we would face if that were the course of action that we would take? So we do know if, if we delay uh, the hiring process, uh, specifically uh, Trustee Lugo, I think you're referring to athletic trainers. And so if, if we delay the hiring process with athletic Yes, that's right. Okay. So if we delay uh, hiring athletic trainers uh, until September, uh, we would have a more difficult time in, in filling those vacancies. And so we would have to look at, as a district, if that is – uh, still one of the uh, delays or uh, that we would recommend, uh, again, pending uh, board feedback. Uh, one of the options that the board always has uh, is amended budgets, and so those can happen at any uh, board meeting. And so after you have conversations and, and we hear feedback, uh, we could always amend a budget in August, in September, in October. And so those are uh, 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 options that the board uh, continually has. Uh, to move forward with. Yeah, and Trustee Lugo, this is Matias. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to, to make sure was, was known to our community is that, you know, we absolutely believe this is a need. Um, it was identified in the long range planning process. It's something that has made its way in our budget this entire time. One of the things that we attempted to do in the information session two weeks ago was to identify which things, you know, could potentially be slowed down only because they hadn't actually occurred yet, right? That was really uh, the focus of any adjustment we could make at that point because as you all know, our communities, are, our, our school communities are already staffing up all the way across. And so as the team and I sat down and identified any opportunity, we could only identify those ones that hadn't been hired. And unfortunately, just because of timing processes and, and where we are, um, you know, the, the fact that we hadn't hired all of the uh, the additional um, athletic trainers made that kind of the, one of the only things we could logically slow down that wouldn't have an impact on staff that had already been hired. Uh, but it's a commitment from our, the administration and certainly from, uh, you know, all of our conversations around it, you know, we want to get to a place where we can bring them in because we do view it as a security, as our, sorry, as a safety concern for us. And so it'd be our goal to get that back to the board as quickly as possible in one of the amended budgets in the near future. That'd be our goal. Okay, um, thank you both, and uh, I'm having some technical difficulties on this side, but hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, so can you help me understand, what, I think it, it may also be um, the phrasing, right, that, that it wouldn't have an impact, but we know that there is an impact um, if we delay the hiring of us athletic trainers, but can you put into context what you mean by, like when you're looking when the administration is looking at, you know, right, the, again, those fiscal constraints, we know any decision to, to not move forward, there is an impact, but can you provide some context around in relation to other decisions? And I think you, you said it, but if you could just kind of help me, help, help drive the message home for me. So I'm, I'm going to attempt to do it, and then I would ask perhaps Ed to, to weigh in, um, you, you know, one of our goals as an, as an administration, as an organization, is to ensure that all of our campuses are properly staffed. Uh, I know our human capital division has been working tirelessly for months to make sure that we are staffed and, and we are currently much better positioned than we have been uh, in recent years. The challenge we have is 
um, when we think about the upcoming school year, we have to add FTE allocations, and those cannot be added until a budget is identified. And that budget can only be identified once the board approves it. And so recognizing that we were already in a deficit budget, we needed to make a, an adjustment back based on feedback we'd received in the information session. And the only reason that these ident were identified as the opportunity is because, again, they had not started. Now, I will say um, for us as an organization, you know, any uh, 5A school, high school that, that identifies, or one of the six remaining, we would want to understand how it's going to impact, um, you know, scheduling, how it's going to impact perhaps uh, the ability to provide coverage at some of the athletic events. We'd work with the athletic uh, department to provide coverage. Uh, it may not be a one-to-one -one early on in the semester. Uh, perhaps it's a, it's a little bit later um, where we can finally get to an amended budget and bring them back in. But we certainly want to provide coverage. But right now, because of the way the budget's represented, we can't, you know, kind of commit to that allocation. Uh, but it's our goal to find the funds in the very near future to be able to come back with an amended budget so that we can do it. Uh, that being said, you know, we're always looking to hire, uh, and I know that process can be challenge, challenging for our, for, our, um, for our school communities whenever something like this occurs. I don't know, Ed. Absolutely. No, that's perfect. And then one last um, uh, maybe request for consideration. Um, you know, this is one of those moments where I reflect back on um, what I used to say before I sat on the board. <laughs> now, now I'm on the board and it's a lot more complicated and difficult and um, gut-wrenching uh, decisions that um, feel like we, we really have a, a, although a long game is, is there, right? No, no pun intended. Um, but I, I think the short-term, um, the way folks may feel about the short-term uh, decisions um, certainly it, it isn't something that I think any of us any of us wish to um, inflict on on the coaches, our students, our community. Um, so, t in that vein, if there's anything that that I or the board as a body can do to support the communication as it's relayed to staff and students and the community at large. Um, my hope would be that, that the administration would call on us so that we can also echo that we are fully committed to um, making sure that we do what we say and we say what we do. Um, and this is one of those times where it, for me personally, it just feels like uh, I'm having to, to put off paying one bill because the repo guy is right at my door, right? So um, it's not pleasant at all. <laughs> Thank you, Trustee Lugo. Appreciate your comments. Um, was there anything else that you had? No, thank you, President. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Any other trustees have questions? Trustee Hunter? Um, not a, uh, two questions, but also something for the administration to consider. Um, when we say athletic trainers, people have a lot of things in their mind. And we know that it's a safety concern, and we know what they do, and we know what happens when they're not there. Mm -hmm. They're our first responder, right? So I think that's really important for people to understand that we're not talking about, like, training, right? We're talking about if a child goes down, if someone is hurt, if on the football field the kid bangs their head, they got a concussion. That's what – and if there's no one there for that, I mean, it's one of those situations where you really can't go, is there a doctor in the house? And so um, I appreciate the administration for thinking about that, because as you were speaking, I was like, oh, those are you just answering all of my questions. And I just think it's important for our community to understand what that means, because we in this room know, I'm not sure how many people out there know, right, what an athletic trainer does and why it's so, ah, you know, we need this because it's safe, but how do we pay for it? And we haven't hired him yet, so one month, but one month could mean a big deal. So that's the tension for us sitting here for, for our community just so that they can understand kind of like our thought process and why they're wrestling. Because I know someone's at home is like, just don't hire them. The kids can work out later, right? But that's not what they do. They do so much more than that. And then I have a question, and you can help me. Um, if in a special session some unfunded mandate should arise, how well positioned are we, or does this 
Is this the, like Noelita said, right? You know, I've just got enough to pay the light bill, but the repo man is here. Now my kid just got hit and I got to go to the doctor. I mean, how well are we positioned if we get an unfunded mandate of any sort from our state at this point? Any unfunded mandate uh, that we were received from the state at this point, uh, we would have to quickly make decisions uh, to reduce budgets in other areas. So we could not, uh, in essence, my recommendation would not be to add on to our $52 million deficit. We would have to find, uh, reduce sources of expenditures in one area to fund these unfunded mandates. Thank you. Trustees, any other questions or comments? Yes, Trustee Sabata. Thank you, Mr. Ramos and, and uh, your amazing staff for this hard work. Math is not my <laughs> cup of tea, but it's, uh, it's a very hard task and uh, with so many numbers and lots of money. Um, but I, um, I just, you know, I was just very disappointed when I lear learned that we had to send back money, that we didn't spend all Title I money mm -hmm. the last year when so many of our schools need every single penny. Right. And so now um, uh, I hope that you did say that we hope that we are going to spend all those dollars. I, am st I would still like to have a presentation to our community of what Title I is, mm -hmm. because um, that is something that has changed for me from when I started years ago. Uh, and I'd really like us to make sure that there's a way that we are uh, watching those dollars and that we do not send one penny back, right. you know. We cannot afford it, especially this year, you know. So I don't want our schools to suffer. And, and I just want to make sure that we are, that they have access to those funds. And I don't know, uh, you know, it, just, it would be helpful for me in the community to understand how Title I works and, and how it's dispersed and, you know, just so that we can make sure that we're accountable to the uh, to spending those funds because okay. we need them. <laughs> um, the other thing is, um, so I know uh, we wanted to compensate everyone, and there's uh, there was a lot of some calls about you know we are overpaying so many people here at central office, and then there was a proposal for a cap. Could you explain to the community how we changed that? that there's a cap and how and who is getting um, the pay increases. So, um, Trustee Zabata and, and, and uh, uh, Chief Financial Officer Ed Ramos, I believe um, Trustee Zabata is referring to the 5% uh, AP scale and versus the 3% at, I think, AP 12 and above? 13. 13 and, and above. above. Um, and I believe that's what it is. So I'm going to attempt to respond to that. And Arnie, if you'd like to approach the the table um, to clarify for me. So uh, one of the things that we recognized was that, you know, we needed to invest in all of our staff, especially the staff that are supporting our campuses. Mm -hmm. And um, we have an administrative professional scale, and that scale goes from, you know, campus level staff all the way through central administration staff up to our senior executives uh, within uh, Austin ISD. And so what we did when we were going through the process was we recognized that everybody, because we needed to support the entire system, needed some level of adjustment, but that we wanted to focus those um, percent increases lower in the system so that executive directors and, and below would receive the 5% and those above would only receive the 3%. And again, that's in an effort to be competitive, ensure that our entire system is supported, but that differentiation, um, I think, does just that. Trustee Zapata makes that differentiation between um, AP 13 and below. Is that correct? And then 3% uh, for AP 13 and above okay. versus 5%. Okay. So, so you're saying that every single person in AISD is getting a raise? That's correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. I think I got it correct. <laughs> and just that last year AP did not get a pay percent increase. Correct. Thank you. Right, right. Um, okay. Um, 
So I, I and, and I think that was the concern that, I mean, uh, the, I, we thought, we had heard that there was gonna be a cap of people who made only so much and above that there was no gonna, you know, there was a certain level of administration and that we would be able to say, reduce our, our de de uh, deficit by doing that. So, so that's not the, the case here. Not, not with this current proposal. Uh, again, one of the things that we are looking at is uh, delaying some of our hiring as vacancies occur. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, and then we had also talked about uh, about some of our priorities that we we understood were you know we couldn't really move forward because of of the deficit, but. And, and I'm glad, you know, literacy first was one, and then also the ombudsman. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were going to have conversations, so we added it already. So did we, is that something that we already, so, I don't remember we voted on that. Yeah. So. So, so, so we haven't voted on the final budget, that's tonight. But in this proposal, literacy first is included as one of our investments. Uh, the ombudsman, we had two <coughs> positions uh, originally, and we're uh, delaying one of those positions. So one is included in the budget, one is will be delayed until September when we find out uh, the outcome of the legislative funding. Okay, but it is going to, uh, so you are hiring one person That's to correct. begin the yes. process. Okay, all right. No, I, I, I think we need literacy first, but I know that the ombudsman was critical mm -hmm especially to help help us to mm -hmm. be held accountable as a district in every everything that we do uh, and as a, 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 an opportunity for a community to have a, someone they can call and you know to help us really bring to our attention things that we need to pay attention to right so uh, thank you that's yes. all I have thank you other trustees trustee Kaufman I just want to go back to the trainers for a minute and just understand, like, if there are, if we're, if the initial goal based on the LRP was to have 12 new trainers, and now we're looking at hiring six and delaying six. Am I reading this correctly? So, it was to provide. I mean, I've, I want to make sure I get this correct. A minimum of two for comprehensive high schools, knowing that six A's have two, but then five A's have one, and it's because of the allocation, and it's based on student capacity, but we know, sorry, enrollment, but we know that you don't have left sports just because you have you know less students in a comprehensive high school. So what we did was added that second to all of those schools. But for instance, you know those schools that don't have those programs wouldn't necessarily get it. Right. Um, so I, I don't remember the exact number, but that was the logic in building that total number up. So when I'm looking at the numbers here, I see on the proposed investments, I see six Point oh FTEs and on the kind of delayed um, IC6 FTEs. So am I reading that correctly that we're moving to a to fund some of them but not all of them at this start of the year? Well, so I, I want to I know that some of them have already been hired. Two, two. two had already been hired, and mm -hmm. so I my understanding is that it was eight, but I, I want to it was eight. Two had been hired, and so based on feedback from the information session, we're trying to slow down things that had not been completed yet, we decided to slow down the six. That was the, the logic behind that. Okay, and so when we think about where they'll be distributed then, are we, if, if we do not fund the whole package, how will those decisions be made about which 5A schools get their second and which ones would have to wait? Would it just go to whichever one's higher first and then everyone else has to wait or well, would there be a more strategic decision so for making sure it's equitable, excuse me, making sure it's equitable and that it's contributing to the safety. Uh, so unfortunately, Trustee Kaufman, I think w the, the challenge we have is that trainers are hired by the principals and the administrators on the campus. And so those who started that process earlier just have completed earlier. Uh, but you're right in that, you know, we're not allocating the FTEs. We released the eight, and then we're only able to slow down the six that hadn't started. Um, so I'm not sure where those campuses are, but I can get you that information, the two that had actually gone through the process and completed it. And do we have, from the long-range planning process, is there data on um, estimated injuries that may have been exacerbated because we didn't have the trainers or on any type of 
um, you know, so that we don't come back six months from now and have a, you know, a fatal concussion injury that we could have prevented if we had done this? Like, do we know about, like, the facts around the current impact of not having them? So at that time, we didn't have our own data. We were using information that best practices, information from around the country around, you know, what that type of coverage does do as far as improve safety. Um, I, we can provide that information that was collected back then. I, will, I want to restate that it is a commitment for us as an organization to find the funds. Like this is con going to continue to be a safety concern for me yeah. and for the administration. Uh, so when you say six months, I don't want anybody to leave the dais or leave the evening, the meeting tonight thinking that it will be six months. Uh, when I look at the ones that have been delayed, the 13 FTEs, the, the, the trainers are the priority out of those for certain. Um, but I can get you the information. I just don't have the um, long-range planning data with okay. me. Okay. I appreciate it. And I just want to like, highlight publicly that these are the types of decisions that districts are compelled to make when they're facing budget shortfalls like this. And I don't think it's really clear sometimes when people talk about like putting, focusing first on instruction or on, you know, trying to make, reduce costs because we have bloated budgets. Like that's not accurate. Like the, the running a school system that does more than just put kids in a desk in front of computers to do busy work, right? Running an actual school district that involves high levels of instruction plus a rounded education for kids to be involved in all the different types of activities that give them satisfaction in coming to school, that make them well-rounded well people, that tie into their passions. Like, it costs money. And this is um, it's just frustrating to see the neglect of our public school system that re results in discussions about whether we can invest in the safety of our children. Thank you, Trustee Kaufman. Anyone else? Trustee Boswell. Um, Thank you, Trustee Kaufman, for that. I think it's it's really important in all of this, and I appreciate, Mr. Ramos, you sharing the perspective that so far we have gotten zero in the basic allotment from the state when the state has an immense amount available um, if, if they had chosen to do that, and that they can still choose to do that in a special session. Um, that is still a possibility, and, and we remain hopeful, and we remain realistic that we are having to make incredibly difficult decisions in a very wealthy state that is choosing to underfund our schools. Um, and this is the impact. Um, and, you know, would like to remind people we fund in the bottom 10 states in per student funding in the country, and we fund about $4,000 less than the national average. Inflation has been 19%. Um, we would need more than $1,000 per student to catch up with the value of our dollars from 2019, the last time this was increased. Um, the last proposal that came from the legislature was 50 per student. Um, so we are facing incredibly painful choices that have a real impact on our students. So I also would love, um, and, and also wanna say, and Ms. Montgomery came in after you were naming your staff, so Katrina Montgomery was also part of the budget process. Wanna make sure that you get called out for your good work and thank you all for your fantastic work. Um, really appreciate that you have brought us a budget that does, I think, a very good strategic focused um, job really want to commend you on involving the community in this budget. I think that work is reflected in what has been brought to us um, and really leaning into data and, and want to give everyone a chance to um, talk a little bit. We talk about strategic investments, hoping to get outcomes that will improve outcomes for our students, <laughs> academic and otherwise. Um, and we talk about the cost benefit of these investments. We're going into a deficit to make sure everyone gets a meaningful raise that will allow them to continue working in our schools um, when there are many other options they have. And, and the vacancies last year in our teaching staff versus the vacancies this year at this time, my understanding is that we had um, about 1,000 last time this year, and we have 80 now. And that is due to these investments. It is due to a real investment in culture and climate. It is due to incredibly creative recruiting. Um, I am thrilled to see that paying off already, and that will have a direct impact on our students. So everyone who has been involved in that, thank you for that. 
Um, thank you as well for really leaning into the administrative cost ratio and making sure that is one of many measures to make sure the dollars go into our schools um, as, mu as much as they can, the cl as close to our students as they can be. So thank you for that. Um, I also would like to remind people that recapture um, we don't receive less under the state formulas. We just pay a whole lot more. We are taxed at twice the rate to get the same amount of money for our schools as a district that doesn't pay recapture. Um, we don't have less. Every school in Texas doesn't have enough. Um, and, and recapture is a major issue here in our community for many, many reasons. Um, but no one has enough and, and we're facing the same thing. Um, a couple of questions. Um, one about the paper report cards. We know that a lot of our families don't have access um, in a meaningful way to looking online. Um, my kids, I found it incredibly difficult to go online and find some of this information. Is there a plan to make sure teachers are using perhaps some of the planning time, something, making sure that families are connected with when students are not doing well so that families do have meaningful access to that in lieu of the paper report cards? So, uh, Trustee Boswell, I know we've had multiple conversations about how to mitigate this cost mm -hmm. um, and provide that resource and that document when it's needed. Uh, at the scale that it's introduced you know, in the budget, mm -hmm. it, it's a different cost. Uh, but we certainly recognize that there are families, there are communities that don't have the ability. I mean, I don't even access them. I mean, it, right. it's, it's very, it can be difficult and cumbersome. Uh, so I don't have the plan in details. I do know that Oscar, our Chief Technology Officer, has been working with Lakeisha Drinks um, and the rest of the school leadership team to find out to develop a plan for it. I know what's, I have seen it, um, but I don't have it in front of me. Uh, but I can provide that to the board via board update at some thank point you. in the future. I'm happy to know the conversation is, is happening, so thank you for that, I appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure families will have some guidance, as, you know, some thoughts as well. Um, I also wanna um, flag the literacy first investment. It's unusual to see a specific partner named in a budget in this way. And, and I understand there's some real capacity building for our district, um, really leaning into the need to make sure every student is reading, which is the linchpin of so much that happens in our district and a proven track record of that, but also some capacity building for our own staff. Can you help me understand that a little better? So <clears throat> the investment uh, and the expansion in Literacy First actually uh, involves a new program with uh, teaching assistants. Uh, versus uh, the, the current model that's in place. Uh, the goal is that is for the program to eventually become self-sustaining, uh, where we as a district can uh, not only invest in creating and moving forward with this new plan, but also expanding it in the future. But it'll uh, impact more students. Uh, and the goal, again, is not only to impact our students, but to come up with a plan that will make this a sustaining uh, program long term in the district. And so this was a, a program actually proposed uh, by the Literacy First organization. Uh, it was exciting when we heard about it. And so we, we really, uh, knowing that reading is an area of focus in this district, we wanted to make sure that we invested uh, in that program. Thank you very much. I um, also want to ask specifically about special education and the investments and um, kind of how that fits in with the work we're doing in that area. <laughs> Uh, well, in multiple ways, you know, I, I often think about a budget as kind of the receipt for, you know, confirming that it, everything we do aligns with our values. It's the, one of the things that the board, one of the few things the board actually is required by law to do. Um, and so within this budget, you'll see multiple uh, connections back to um, the work around uh, special, providing special education services for our students. You can see it in um, additional uh, diagnosticians and LSSPs, uh, just the sheer number. Um, of, of, of those positions. Uh, so in the past, we, uh, for the several, a couple of years now, our numbers um, to support the valuations has dwindled down to where it's just over two dozen. Uh, in order to, to actually address the um, backlog and to respond um, you know, in, a, in a real fashion to the challenge, we had to staff up, but we also know we have to compete. So we had to add FTEs and at the same time also make sure that it was a competitive um, right to attract those um, who have either left Austin ISD or maybe are outside the region that we need to pull in. So uh, both of those things are reflected here as well. 
The other thing that you'll see is additional um, staff allocations, uh, and that's really an acknowledgement that you know as we provide the support um, in in these areas, we're going to need to pro provide the support in the classrooms. So additional uh, special education uh, educators, uh, that's another line item. And then on top of that, we have the stipends. And so again, it's it's really doubling down and acknowledging that you know we have uh, an area of focus. It's an initiative. It needs to represent itself in everything that we do, but most importantly in our budget. And I think that it does that. So um, those are the ways that it's represented in the budget. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate understanding that um a commitment to understanding that money does matter and that money alone won't fix it. Oh, yeah. um, and that, that both are really being undertaken in a thoughtful, strategic way. So thank you for that. Um, also would love to ask that um, I understand the really ugly choice of focusing on academics versus trainers and, and having that be a, a later item for now. Um, I am angry that we were put in that position. And I know there are many, many, many other things that we know we could invest in to make a meaningful difference for our students academically and in that well-rounded education and in you know, post-secondary and what happens when they graduate in all kinds of ways. Um, and I would love to put that back on our agenda in August if we could, just for an update on where we stand and whether we think that's an investment we could make as sports are beginning in the fall. Um, I know it could be a Title IX issue that if you only have one trainer, which sport are you going to football or volleyball, you know, kind of where are you going? Um, and that women's sports are, are often just as dangerous for our athletes as men's sports. Um, and, and I would love just an update on where we stand if that is out of the budget that we finally approved tonight. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, Trustee Boswell, you, you said something earlier, and I don't think that we properly acknowledged all the kind of um, support around vacancies. Uh, we actually have uh, Mr. Gutierrez here today, and so we always see Brandy, um, but I do want to acknowledge a lot of the uh, innovative ideas, a lot of the, the work that has gotten us to this point is actually his work. Um, so I want to say thank you publicly. We are much better positioned now than we have been for multiple years, and a lot of that's because of your work. And it seems like he's been here for a long time, but it's only been months. Uh, so thank you very much, and just wanted to point that out. Trustee Zapata. Talk, talk about angry. I'm, I'm still pondering on this compensation. Uh, the 3%, uh, the people who are getting the 3%, what is that equal to uh, in dollars, Mr. Ramos? I mean, I don't, uh, I just want to make sure. So I believe that was about 250000 for the 3% uh, in the pay scale 13 through 16. Okay. So how much does it cost to get these trainers? So the trainers, uh, six, we're looking at about half a million dollars. So that would help get some more trainers, at least, right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, not, there's not, this is not to disrespect anyone, but I just think our schools need our trainers. And um, I, would, I would be more supportive of this budget if we're able to move those dollars to help support, recruit those trainers that we need in our schools. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Trustee Zapata. Anyone else? Yes, Trustee Gonzalez. <clears throat> Thank you, President Singh. Um, I just wanted to express some, some thoughts. I am very happy personally to see the inclusion of Literacy First, and so I look forward to how that is going to fit into a larger literacy plan as a district. Uh, and I also was very um, glad to hear about the intention to 
make it sustainable. Um, I hope it becomes another pipeline into teaching. I've talked with at least one person who's a literacy first tutor that is thinking about that very seriously. And so I'd like for that to be something that's formal. Um, so thank you for that. I also want to raise up the concern that Trustee Zapata raised about um, the Title I money. Um, I also would like to see all of that, you know, I'm sure you would too, <laughs> uh, spend. And I, I do want to just ensure that the the campuses that, that have spent all of their Title I money, that have really, you know, intentional, purposeful designed those funds into what the programs are that their campus delivers, that they aren't penalized in, in how the district re-envisions um, making sure that that all of those dollars are spent. Um, I know at least, yeah, a, a particular campus community has raised raised that concern. And so um, I just wanted to, to bring that up since we were speaking about it here. Um, I also appreciated the, the context for explaining which items were delayed and, and how you came, the administration came to the conclusion around the athletic trainers. I also wanna just, you know, repeat what Trustee Hunter and Trustee Kaufman said, I was on a high school campus and I, we had a very transformative athletic trainer that didn't, you know, that's a, an individual that touches every single sport in our athletic department. And our athletic trainer also had student trainers and they had transformative relationships with students that really affected academics because those students have to pass. They have to meet UIL eligibility in order to be present at those games to participate. And so it, it is connected to academics. I see it connected very, very clearly. And so I also want to agree with the, the point that Trustee Zabata just, just raised. And we're, we're looking after student outcomes. And so I see this as a decision that really clearly affects student outcomes. Um, Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. All right. Any other comments or questions from trustees? Yes, Trustee Willie Chu. Um, so I just want to I want to talk about how excited I am to be able um, to be a part of of doing something that I promised I was going to do, and that was increase our wages for the people on campuses who touch our students the most closely um, for that you know four dollar an hour wage that brings our minimum wage to twenty dollars an hour and to employees who have stuck with us for so long and said i'm so grateful that i can quit the other two jobs that i work and these are the hardest working people in their full-time job already and they love our kids and they love our district and for them to get to fully commit to doing that is so important. And our teachers who have um, stuck with our kids um, and are getting this raise that they, they so deeply deserve. And for the folks who are being attracted into our district, the teachers who left who are texting me that they've applied again and people I've worked with in other districts who never considered working in Austin ISD, like both for our reputation as an inclusive district as a great place to work and of course compensation this is this is a job this is our work and it really matters and I'm wanted to ask a question we might not have the answer yet because I'm also so excited like it's it's showing that it matters and because we've gone from that 1,000 vacancy person vacancy teacher vacancy that was terrifying to parents and to school staff at, at the beginning of the year and put us in in horrible in a horrible position all year long um, and our you know our kids and campuses struggled because of it and to be to 80 which is incredible um, but I, I would love to know um, you know because I, I saw a lot of those vacancies were um, special education teacher vacancies which is you know that's kids not getting what they need and we're giving this this substantial stipend to those teachers and then a lot of multilingual classrooms where they're being combined into huge classrooms um, 
do we know yet where it, there's like a cluster with those 80 vacancies that we're seeing or have we not like been able to analyze that data because it's still in flux? Yeah, yeah. I thought you might know. Come on up, Mr. Gutierrez. So thank you. Um, right now, a lot of them are special ed and bilingual. That's where we're seeing the most um, we have right now. But we're working with the Met Department. I'm meeting with them tomorrow, um, as well as the my team, to see what we can look at. But, um, what we're also looking right now to see if people are certified, either bilingual or special education, and are not teaching that, so that we can then offer them an incentive within their own school to be able to move into those positions so that we can fill other positions. And um, we have our classified career fair this Saturday, so we'll focus on making sure we're finding special education teacher assistants as well as the regular teacher assistants as well because those are the individuals that support the campuses and their work for teachers. So we're gonna make a just a consolidated effort to not only make sure we're staffing our teacher vacancies, but we're also staffing our teacher assistant vacancies because they all have to be staffed. And that's my goal is to come back and say we have zero teaching vacancies and everything's covered on the first day of school. That's my goal. Well, thank you so much. And I appreciate you being so smart and flexible and pivoting and doing everything you can. You yeah. have to do that in this market, so. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Thank you. And we started early, we started in yes. April. And sometimes that was, looked at, but we started very, very early securing quality talent and making sure we're offering pre-hires and lining talent and project, making projections on looking at data from the past five to seven years as well. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's the most important thing we do. Yeah. It's for our kids. It's, yep. it's super important. Thank you. You're welcome. I love that little exchange. <laughs> that was great, and I appreciate the hard work as well. Did you have another question or comment? Okay. You made me think of something, Trustee Willichu, which is, you know, the research that talks about how a highly qualified teacher is the most important school-based factor in student achievement. And I do feel like that this budget that the administration is bringing to us um, reflects our commitment to our students' academic outcomes. I feel really good and excited about future board monitoring reports because when I ask, but what, did we have vacancy? Like, you know, were there actually teachers in those classrooms? You know, we're gonna get an answer. Yes, <laughs> there were, and that's why, you know, we when we talk about fidelity of implementation, the most basic piece of that is, was there a qualified teacher in that classroom? You know, you can talk about all the training you want or all the PLCs or whatever, but if there's not a teacher there, you have, you don't really have um, what you need. And so thank you um, to the staff for just working so hard to work on that piece and to our, um, my colleagues for just being so persistent and so good about clarifying, you know, what our values are as individuals. And um, I think I feel good about this and I, and I, at the same time, I, I see the cuts we're gonna have to make and I hope that we put the same um, thoughtfulness in, into seeing where we need to trim and really remembering um, history and you know <laughs> in our district and, and how different decisions impact our district in the short and long term and just continue to get better and I have total faith that um, we're gonna really, that we're gonna be able to do that. So um, with that, are there any other questions or comments on the budget? Okay, all right, thank you, Mr. Ramos. All right, so at this time, we will adjourn our public hearing, take a short break, and then return to open um, the regular voting meeting. So Secretary Boswell, do I have a motion to adjourn uh, this meeting? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, having a motion by Secretary Boswell and a second by Trustee Sabata to adjourn. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. The motion passes unanimously. This meeting, uh, this, uh, meeting is adjourned at 6.58 p.m. Thank you. Um, so.
All right. <laughs> okay, welcome back everyone. And just um, so the public is aware, we're starting a little late because we had our board um, public hearing on the budget earlier and that ran a little over. So, <clears throat> let's see here. All right, so good evening. In compliance with Chapter 551 Open Meetings of the Texas Government Code, I call to order a regular voting meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Austin Independent School District for Thursday, June 22nd, 2023 at 7.12 p.m. A quorum of the board is physically present at the AISD central office to conduct this meeting. This meeting is streaming live on AISD TV and Apple TV, and it's also being broadcast on cable channel 22 through Spectrum, a sound broadband, and on channel 99 through AT&T UVerse. Closed captioning in English is available on these platforms for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. And to our audience tuning in remotely and here in person, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. So we'll move to the approval of the agenda. Secretary Boswell, do you have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, having a motion by Secretary, Secretary Boswell and a second by Trustee Zapata to approve the agenda. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All right, the motion uh, passes unanimously. Secretary Boswell, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and the Pledge of the Texas flag? Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Juro lealtad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la república que representa, una nación bajo Dios, indivisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Te honro bandera de Texas. Te juro lealtad, Texas. Un estado bajo Dios, uno e indivisible. Okay, um, our next item is under the president's uh, report. So I wanted to just share uh, that the board completed a self-assessment as a team of 10 with the superintendent um, last, when was that? It was last, it was on Monday of yeah, this week, right? Yes, I believe so, feels like. And um, we, it was a really great session. It was facilitated by uh, uh, David uh, Keppel from TASB and really went through a, we did a survey um, that TASB developed. It's based on research and it really looked, helped us look through different aspects of our work together as a board, um, you know, ranging on topics from our uh, commitment to student academic outcomes to our teamwork and synergy and everything in between. So it was a, I feel like it was a pretty productive conversation. It really helps us to think about where we've been, um, where we are and where we wanna move forward. And that um, conversation culminated with a sort of a list of to-do items for the board. It seems like we have an endless list sometimes, but it is so important for us to prioritize and I feel like that conversation really helped us do that. And one of the big things that, we, that came out of that conversation, I think it was five out of eight of us there um, said that our biggest priority in terms of our like behind the scenes kind of board work was to uh, was to work on our board monitoring um, reporting system and really work with the administration to to come together on a format that would be really useful and so as you know every month we talk about different scorecard measures which are our real student outcome priorities and um, the way they're reported to us is through something called a board monitoring report. And so we have an opportunity right now, I think with this board um, and with some of the new leadership and the staff coming in to, to think about how we can better as assess how we're doing on what we have identified as our most important priorities for, for our district. So at this time, I would like to just ask if any other trustees have any comments on the, the board retreat or the self-evaluation, anything you'd like to share? 
Trustee Boswell. I just want to share a brief comment on how aligned I found us on what needed work and what was working well and um, how nice it was to one of the benefits of that is to know what we need to do better and one of the benefits of it is to have a conversation about things that you know how are we working together that we we don't always take the time to stop and have that conversation so I really appreciated the chance um, and and what we learned yes Tracy Gonzalez thank you President Singh I just wanted to say how also to echo Trustee Boswell's comments, Trustee Hunter and Trustee Zapata and I attended the training that Trustee Lugo is at right now, currently, last week in San Antonio, and we got to be with trustees from all across the state of Texas, and we got to hear about all the different dynamics on, on boards across our state, and I am just really, really thankful from the bottom of my heart for each and every one of you. <laughs> I really am. Uh, and I also want to say how much I learned from um, the self-evaluation that we did. Like, it was really clarifying. And I, I look forward to the updates that we make to the progress monitoring that, that President Singh just mentioned. So thank you. Thank you, Tracy Gonzalez. Um, anyone else have comments? All right, at this time, I would like to um, offer a point of privilege for our colleague, Vice President Foster, Trustee Foster. Uh, thanks, just really quickly, I almost wanted to withdraw my, but um, I just wanted as we, you know, to recognize that we're going into the, finally the end of the end of the end of this academic year. We're about to approve a budget. We've made tremendous progress. We're not where we want to be on student achievement, but the conditions for success we've been setting all year long, and I think we've been working very hard. And over the last two years that I've been here, while well, in this particular role, there's, there's, there's new learnings every day, but the newest learning that I've been taking on is just how hard, in addition to the teachers working hard, in addition to all the different folks working hard, the people in this building work tremendously hard. In, in the back there, and I don't know if this is gonna get me into trouble to say this, but there's this old little chair that was appeared one day because people know that some days when I'm here, like 10 hours, I take naps. And one day they said, they put a little chair in the ante room and it's it's not new, and it's but it's it's so comfortable. <laughs> and um, the, the care that, that people extend to us as trustees, um, is, is beyond measure, and it makes this possible because it's really hard. But however hard it is for us, I realize that when we ask questions and we are digging into data and when we have this set up, uh, we put a lot on the staff, and you all are so tremendously gracious time and again. I know that Jacob sometimes sends me things three different times. Laura sends me things three times. Are you gonna fill out this form? Are you gonna do this thing? And when I'm at my most reflective moment, I say, if I were held to account the way we held others to account, what would it really look like? And I realize that I, as a trustee, don't do, I'm not as good as I want to be. And I think as hard as everybody works, we can always be better, and we're committed to being better. But part of the conditions for that success is the grace that you all have extended to us. So I just really, from the bottom of my heart, wanted to thank you for the way you take care of us. Thank you for the way you love on us. Thank you for the way you uh, continue to be there for us. When, and sometimes when we're really pushing and really asking hard questions. So I just asked our president if I could have a point of privilege, just as we end the school year, to say th thank you to all the leadership in this building. Thank you, uh, Vice President Foster, and I'll just add that that chair was supposed to be for all of us, yeah. but every time I go yeah. back there, you know you're what? on it. It was supposed <laughs> to be for all of us. They say, that's Kevin's chair, that's Kevin's chair. I say, it's, no, it's not. So, yes, we it's everyone's chair. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. So um, at this time, I would like to invite trustees to provide committee reports. So Vice President Foster, can you share the report for the board policy committee? Uh, nothing new to report tonight. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Trustee Whitley Chu, can you share the report for the Austin Education Fund, please? Yes, on May 23rd, um, 
Superintendent Segura, Trustee Hunter, Trustee Boswell and I had um, the pleasure of honoring the recipients um, of, or the Austin Ed Fund, we got to, sorry, we, um, as part of the Austin Ed Fund, honored the recipients of the 2022-2023 Inspire the Future grants. And it was an amazing evening with um, amazing staff who, who really deserved um, to be celebrated that night. And that brings us to a really important point that the deadline for this year's grant is tomorrow, June 23rd. So it is not too late to get your grant application in. Um, visit the austinedfund.org and click on for educators to learn more and apply for um, money to support your school. Um, so support from this program comes from our amazing community. And the Ed Fund's biggest fundraiser is the Inspire the Future Luncheon. So we hope you'll mark your calendars to join us on Monday, October 30th. And the Austin Ed Fund Board will meet again in August. Thank you, Tracy Whitley Chu. All right, um, the District School Safety and Security Committee also held an official meeting on Tuesday and a special meeting last week jointly with the Student Health Advisory Committee. And the special meeting last week was allowed, uh, allowed an opportunity for school safety and the Student Health Committee to discuss the district's current work on fentanyl awareness and provide additional collaboration between the committees to address other areas of focus and support around fentanyl awareness and, um, and drug use and um, really the response on our campuses and I was fortunate to be part of that that special call that special zoom session and one of the key takeaways was really defining what the problem is in our schools with regards to drug use and drug abuse and um, and really you know hearing what the district um, is going to do to help address that and there were a lot of great ideas around like you know developing curriculum or awareness campaigns um, engaging families and things like that and I know that there is already a lot of that work happening um, at our schools and with our many partnerships and I look forward to just you know helping support the district as it continues with that work um, especially if you think about our commitment to reducing the school to prison pipeline because I, I think I do recall that one of the main reasons that we have students for example in our ALC is because of, of drug use and we want to really make sure that we are supporting our students and that's why it was important to bring in the shack um, so that we are continuing to think about drug use as um, in a not necessarily in a punitive way but really as like a health and wellness um, lens so I was really uh, excited about the possibilities as we continue that work um, the regular meeting of the School Safety and Security Committee held two items, which included a review of legislative changes to school safety during the recent completed regular legislative session and an update on school audits. And these are the school safety audits. Um, the administration will also provide an update on school safety audits tonight, and the board will schedule a time for the full board to receive a legislative update in the early fall. So trustees, are there any other um, committee or training reports to share tonight? Okay, so the next item is the superintendent's report. So, uh, Mr. Segura. All right, well, trustees, uh, this is my final report of the school year. Um, what a uh, semester it's been. Uh, it's been a privilege to, to be in this role supporting our community. Um, went by fast. Uh, we did a lot of stuff. And it's I feel really good about the direction we're heading. So just wanted to just kind of express my appreciation for the opportunity to support our community. Um, so wanted to start off with a big congratulations, class of 2023. Uh, between May 25th and June 2nd, Austin ISD hosted 15 graduation ceremonies all across the city. Uh, we are so proud of the nearly 4,600 graduates. The class of 2023 earned 110 associate's degrees through our early college high school program in partnership with ACC. We increased the number of career certificates earned by students enrolled at ACC from 52 in the class of 2022 to 78 for the class of 2023. 40 members of the class of 2023, 2023 earned their dual language seal of biliteracy representing all four dual language high schools, Aikens, Crockett, Travis, and Navarro. 
Uh, next year, LBJ will become our fifth dual language high school. And a big round of thanks to our Austin ISD staff. All the blue shirts, you know who you are. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, they were every, everywhere during the graduation. Uh, one of the things that I, I think um, is often missed is that this is a true opportunity to build community within Austin ISD staff. We have the finance department, the operations department, the school leadership department. We have everybody in the organization supporting our students uh, and making sure that everybody's staff, uh, I mean, everybody's uh, safe. And certainly want to shout out to our police department. Um, the work that they did making sure that our students were safe uh, was incredible. Uh, so just a lot of folks doing a lot of great things to support our students. We had back flips, we had front flips, we had uh, a lot of posing going on, uh, but you know, it, it was fantastic. So just, just the trustees. That was just, <laughs> uh, and, and also want to acknowledge that our trustees, uh, you know, they were there, they were present, they were engaged. Certainly want to uh, highlight Trustee Hunter who made it to all 15 graduations. Um, so uh, just an incredible moment. And again, congratulations, class of 2023. Uh, we're so proud of, of what you've accomplished and can't wait to see what you do next. Um, so again, one more round of applause. I mean, come on, like, that was awesome. So uh, moving on, congratulations to Lasta, class of 2023 uh, graduate, Yadira Manduhando Manduhando, who earned a $5,000 scholarship from the Mexican American School Board Association, or MOSBA. MOSBA is a voluntary nonprofit statewide education association that has served uh, local Texas school boards since 1970. MOSBA is focused on closing achievement gaps in our Texas public schools, especially for English language learners. Uh, Yadira was one of only five MOSBA school scholars chosen statewide. Uh, Yadira uh, and the other 2023 MOSBA scholars were selected for their outstanding academic achievement, strong leadership qualities, and commitment to further their education. Uh, the Yadira will be attending Texas State uh, University in the fall, so congratulations, uh, just an incredible um, achievement. Uh, Austin ISD understands the importance of home ownership for our employees. Uh, on June 2nd, Austin ISD hosted its first ever home buyer education event for employees. We know how hard it is to, to own here in Austin, and as an organization, we're doing everything we can to support our staff. Uh, and this event focused on what it takes to be financially ready to own a home, the responsibilities of being a homeowner, and how to apply and qualify, qualify for a mortgage loan and, and more. Uh, thanks to our partners, uh, organizations, Amplify Credit Union, ATX, Benjamin, Realty Group, BCL of Texas, City of Austin Housing and Planning, uh, a Colonial Mortgage, Mueller Foundation, and Habitat for Humanity. Again, just an incredible event, and we'll continue to have more of those uh, as we develop the overall program. So moving on, uh, wanted uh, to certainly acknowledge Austin ISD hosted its Social Emotional Learning and Cultural Proficiency and Inclusiveness Symposium on June 15th at DOS uh, Elementary School. This year's event titled Connected on Purpose uh, brought together educators, community leaders, and families for a collective learning experience. The event featured keynote uh, speaker Tamisha Williams, a dynamic facilitator, transform transformational coach, and equity practitioner with over 10 years of experience in the field of education, as well as interactive sessions hosted by districts, teachers and staff, community partners, and equity leaders. This June, Austin ISD celebrated or celebrates Pride Month. Uh, Pride Month is an annual global commemoration and celebration of the LBGTQIA community, their history, and their ongoing struggle for equal rights and acceptance. Uh, Austin ISD is celebrating Pride all month long, hosting a range of events, including our Pride flag raising ceremony at Central Office. Uh, we had several trustees there. Thank you for the support. Uh, what an incredible event. Uh, Food Truck Thursdays featuring LBGTQIA uh, women and minority-owned businesses and a cross-industry queer leadership panel discussion which took place right here at Central Office and uh, it was an incredible event. Austin ISD celebrates Pride Month as a powerful opportunity to stand in solidarity with the LBG, LBGTQIA plus community to embrace diversity and to create a more inclusive and accepting society. These conversation, conversations and events are not limited to one month. Uh, Austin ISD is committed to embracing diversity, advocating for our marginalized staff and students and building community all year long. On Saturday, June 17th, Austin ISD marched in the annual Central Texas Historical Juneteenth Parade. Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day or Emancipation Day, 
commemorates the announcement of the abol ab abolish <laughs> abolition sorry, of, of slavery in Texas. Even though the Emancipation Proclamation took effect on January 1st, 1863, it could not be implemented in places still under Confederate control, which included Texas. Two and a half years later, on June 19th, 1865, Union troops arrived by ship in Galveston and announced that the more than 250,000 enslaved black people in Texas were free. This day came to be known as Juneteenth by the newly freed people of Texas. In this year's Juneteenth parade, <coughs> students, staff, and community marched behind the Austin ISD Juneteenth banner, along with the all-star band under the direction of Northeast Early College High School band director, Roy Geis. Uh, and so uh, just an incredible event. Uh, you can see the community uh, just very, very proud of, of all of our support and, and just being able to contribute and participate in those types of events is important. Uh, so we also want to um, continue on and, and commemorate uh, the Ayed, Ayed Ataha, June 28th and 29th. It's the Feast of Sacrifice honoring the prophet Ibrahim's willingness to sacrifice his son Ishmael. This holiday is observed by the Muslim community through a day of prayers and social gatherings and certainly wanted to acknowledge uh, that important date. Moving on, I uh, wanted to um, talk about the launch of our uh, new ERP system. You've heard us uh, talk about it before. We've had a couple updates along the way. Uh, the system is effective. It goes live July 1st. Our, ta our, ta our team has been working very, very hard for a very long time on this huge initiative. Uh, I'd like to invite um, Oscar Rodriguez, our Chief Technology Officer, to provide an update on the ERP. And, and just before we get started, I want to acknowledge it is a joint effort between human capital, finance, and technology, but all of us are supporting it. Uh, it has significant impacts in the system and will help us become much more efficient and really understand where those opportunities are as we look at um, costing opportunities moving forward. Thank you, Superintendent Segura, President Singh, Board of Trustees. Um, going to recap tonight quickly what the ERP uh, will provide us. We go live July 1st, uh, fiscal year closeout, so that's where the transition takes place. Uh, it's a big milestone for us as a district for various reasons. Uh, you've heard all of the system opportunities, security, data, all of those things that it takes to provide quality education to our, our students. Um, this is one of those uh, foundational systems. Uh, so we will be launching July 1st. Uh, so what is this? Will, what will this impact? Um, this will impact payroll. So we've been communicating about the semi-monthly payroll changes and hosting information sen uh, sessions for staff. This will mean we'll have new time clocks. And so uh, we are sending information, creating training for staff to make sure they know how to clock in and setting up clocks uh, across the district. And then lastly, uh, a new system will allow us staff to request time off, access pay stubs, uh, all of those things that uh, are part of these, these kinds of systems. Uh, simple, standard, secure. So that's our philosophy, that's our strategy. Uh, keep things simple. Uh, you see before you sort of what this system really entails uh, and where all of these systems will begin to talk to each other, streamline processes, uh, and make the work of supporting uh, education a little easier for our staff. Uh, lastly, this is a two-year project in the making. Uh, uh, two years of work with thinking about how we operate, the future state, changes in business processes, um, all of the uh, information, how it's going to flow, what, what does it mean for our staff. Uh, and so, yes, it represents three divisions. Um, I think s we've had on this project three superintendents, two CFOs, two chiefs of human capital. So this is uh, an endeavor. Uh, but we're bringing it to fruition. And then lastly, uh, yes, thanking all of the staff and their countless hours, nights, weekends, um, uh, and dedicating their work to make sure that uh, the system goes live, it does what it's supposed to, and we can continue on with the bigger pieces of focusing on, on our student outcomes. Thank you, Oscar. So as we end the school year with our last Board of Trustees meeting, um, I wanted to encourage everyone to, to have fun, uh, have a restful summer, uh, be safe. Um, please remember that summer is an opportunity to continue to learn in all of your endeavors. August 14th is right around the corner, believe it or not, and we are excited to welcome back our families and our students on the first day of school. 
the work will not stop at central office. Um, we will uh, spend a lot of time planning, preparing, uh, and making sure that uh, we continue to align our practices with the values of our community uh, and with the work of the board. So we're certainly excited to do that. And so thank you, trustees. That concludes my report this evening and happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Superintendent Segura. Trustees, are there any questions? Trustee Zapata? I don't have any questions, but I just want to also thank you, uh, Superintendent Segura, for your leadership. And uh, I've learned a lot from you and with you, and, um, and I hope you rest as well. <laughs> and uh, just anybody know, he just had a birthday. He's just turned 25. <laughs> so uh, just wishing you a very happy and safe time off. Hopefully you will take it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Trustee Sabata. Anyone else? All right. Thank oh, you. Like oh, sorry. Go ahead, Trustee Lugo. It's like the voice in the sky. Oh, we see sorry. you now. Um, <laughs> so um, I just wanted to, you know, I don't know how many folks are kind of tuned into the whole uh, enterprise resource planning tool, but um, it doesn't sound exciting probably for, for folks who don't work um, with those types of tools, but I mean, this is not just a big endeavor in terms of the effort that has gone behind bringing it to fruition, but the um, increased effectiveness, and again, I know all of these words are really, they're probably not as exciting as what people want to talk about. But the ERP is incredibly important for organizations, especially for organizations the size of AISD. It helps our organization run more smoothly. It helps us understand. And please, um, Superintendent um, Segura <coughs> or others um, from the administration, please chime in if I forget something or if I'm mischaracterizing unintentionally. But an ER ERP system really helps organizations manage um, not just their the the way that um, people are kind of sent out and kind of paired up with where they need to be in terms of campuses or the work that needs to get done. But again, it really just helps the administration work more smoothly, more effectively. Um, and so I'm really, I'm really excited about seeing the ERP um, go live. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's made that possible. Thank you, Trustee Lugo, appreciate that um, comment. Um, and we really appreciate the ERP for sure. So thank you. Okay, um, so next, um, so I've had a request, oh well, I had a request to maybe to do public comment next because I do know we have a lot of people here, but I wanted to ask our board council if we wanted to do that, is that okay? And Yes, that's okay. Are you okay with that? Sure. Um, Okay, uh, appreciate that. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, so sorry for the switcheroo there, but um, let me get to that part in the agenda. Oh, okay. So we are going to skip over the um, intruder detection audit and move that to after public comment and then Mendez as well. So apologies for those um, presenters. Um, are you okay with that? That's, yes. You can, okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll now move to public testimony for items on the consent agenda. Members of the public wishing to participate in the public testimony portion of our meeting called a dedicated AISD phone line in advance of the meeting to sign up to speak in person or to audio record their remarks. Tonight we have nine who signed up to speak in person and we have 29 who left a recorded message. Um, so we will now move to the in-person testimony. In order to provide as many opportunities for input as possible within a limited time period at this meeting, each speaker will be allotted one minute. No substitutions or yielding of time to others is permitted. Callers who signed up to speak in person are welcome to come to the microphone when their name is called. 
<laughs> as you come to the microphone, there is a device that will light up as you move through your one minute of allotted time. And when the buzzer sounds, please make a final thought in one sentence. Again, we ask that whether you come to give a complaint or praise that you reference a staff member by position or by abbreviated last name. We ask that all audience members, whether speaking or not, please show respect for others at all times. The Office of Translation and Interpretation provides a Spanish language translator for audience members who need assistance when uh, addressing, uh, who, who need assistance understanding comments made to trustees during public testimony. And if translation is required, the speaker will be given twice the allotted time. So um, if you need the service during other portions of the meeting, please speak with our interpreter, Mr. Aurelio. Uh, where's Mr. Aurelio? Oh, there you are, thank you. And Mr. Aurelio will repeat portions of this message in Spanish. So our in-person speakers for tonight um, are... Uh, so oh, I'm sorry. Please, do. Thank you. Uh, con el fin de ofrecer el mayor número posible de oportunidades para realizar aportaciones dentro de un tiempo limitado en esta junta, cada participante dispondrá de un minuto. No se permiten sustituciones ni sesión de tiempo a otros. Los participantes que se hayan inscrito para hablar en persona pueden acercarse al micrófono cuando se mencione su nombre. Cuando se acerque el micrófono, habrá un dispositivo que se encenderá durante su minuto de tiempo asignado. Cuando suene el timbre, le pedimos que hagan una reflexión final en una sola frase. Una vez más, les pedimos que, tanto si se trata de una queja como si de un elogio, se refieran al funcionario por su cargo o por su apellido abreviado. Pedimos a todos los miembros del público, hablen o no, que muestren respeto por los demás en todo momento. La Oficina de Traducción e Interpretación proporciona un intérprete de español para los miembros del público que necesitan ayuda para dirigirse a los miembros de la Junta Directiva o que necesiten ayuda para entender los comentarios hechos a los miembros de la Junta Directiva durante el testimonio público. Si no se requiere interpretación, el, el participante dispondrá del doble de tiempo asignado. Se si necesita este servicio durante est otras partes de la Junta, por favor, hable con el intérprete Aurelio Espada. Gracias. Thanks. Gracias. So um, our first two in-person speakers for tonight are Myra Rank, and then we have Chris Dougherty. Um, after that, um, just so that you're ready to spring into action, um, Virginia Badillo and then Jose Carrasco, and then I'll let you all know who else is next. Thank you. So Myra Rank, you may come up to the podium. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Mayra Ren. I'm a blog leader and promoter for Austin Voices Family Resource Center. Uh, Austin Voices provides food distribution, adult education, and more. When Austin Voices Family Resource Center helps a family that has struggled with rent, food, utility service, we need to notice that we are not only helping a father, a mother, we are helping also the child who does not do their best in class because he or she are seeing their parents are stressed, worried, by not knowing what tomorrow holds for them. Uh, the funds that Austin ASD provides to the Austin Voices Family Resource Center brings relief, hope, balance to so many families, ASD families that are suffering in one way or another. Thank you to, uh, to your financial support it has been possible uh, to help so many ASD family. So thank you, ASD. Thank you. <coughs> Next, we have Chris Doherty. Yes, I'm Chris Doherty, and I'm chair of the board of the Austin Voices for Education and, and Youth. And I'm going to second all of the positive comments that all the parents and, and family community volunteers are going to give you, which are going to be a lot of them because Austin Voices has operated family resource centers for 16 years, uh, continually receiving national recognition for our work, including a recent visit by the U.S. Secretary of Education. You can also see from our impact report, which you got last in the last meeting, uh, that Austin Voices has been a rainmaker of outside funding for the family resource centers. The bulk of the money to operate these centers has been raised by Austin Voices independently of the district, including money from the city and county, as well as from other public and private sources. Major changes in the operation of the family resource centers would need to be cleared with the city and county and likely with other funders as well. I think the entire process requires a reset. Uh, we propose that you extend our contract for six months 
while you bring everyone together to restore the level of communication and collaboration we've had in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Y ahora Virginia Badillo. Uh, buenas noches, gracias por su tiempo. Good night, thanks for your time. Uh, es rápido lo que vamos a comentar sobre el Centro de Recursos Familiares. Es muy importante para todas nuestras familias tener estos recursos disponibles. Uh, it's going to be fast what I'm going to say. It's very important for us to have the resources for the Austin Center, Family Resource Center. It's important for our families to have these funds. Creo que es un link entre la comunidad, la escuela y las familias. I think, eh, it's a, it's a, I think it's a good link between the families, the school, and the, and the, and the kids. En lo personal, eh, eh, me ha ayudado mucho a obtener información por mi familia. Yo he participado en clínicas como promotora de salud, como líder de bloque dentro de esta comunidad fantástica I, de Centro de Recursos Familiares. I think I've had a lot of uh, help through this, this agency. I've been, pro I've been using my, my, my help as a promoter of health in the community with through the links that I have with this association. Y yo creo que es importantísimo para toda nuestra comunidad, miembros del distrito escolar, padres, hijos, sea parte esta comunidad de transformar el centro de recursos familiares en algo más poderoso porque and ha traído cambios al norte de Austin. And I think it's very important for the uh, community and the uh, Austin Independent School District to keep funding for this association because it has come, it has brought a lot of changes for all the families and the communities in the north of Austin. Por ejemplo, hoy este tiempo estamos trabajando para llevar a las familias el seguro médico de MAP, una importante información donde aplicamos y ayudamos a esta comunidad a ser parte de una comunidad saludable. Uh, for instance, we're having uh, the opportunity to take MAP, the, the medical insurance, to the families, and I think it's a very good opportunity. All the families in the, in the community has good uh, uh, health insurance and good op uh, health opportunities. Durante la pandemia en el COVID tuvimos una gran eh, participación invitando a la comunidad a vacunarse y eh, tuvimos una gran respuesta por parte de nuestra comunidad y gracias al soporte que nos dio y al entrenamiento que nos dio esta organización. Gracias. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, do I have time to, do, uh, during the COVID pandemic, we have a, a lot of chances to uh, give all the uh, information to the community and have access to the vaccines. And it was a very good way to help the community through this pandemic. Thanks. Muchas gracias. Next we have um, Jose Carrasco, and after that will be Luis Malfaro and then uh, Gabriel Estrada. Hello, my name is Jose Carrasco. I am the National Community School Coordinator of the Year, thanks to the Institute of Educational Leadership. Um, I'm also here to talk about 11.4, which is uh, the splitting of the FRC contract. I just want to note that in phase one, which is attachment three, phase one, we were up four points. I'm not too sure why there was a phase B. We've never had a phase B, but there was. And three key people were not included in phase B, which was the high school principal, middle school principal, and that LMHP. In phase B, our numbers are drastically low for questions like a yes or no question, which is question three of if we understand the 30-day process of how to bill for the last 15 years. Yes, we do, and that was the answer. Not too sure why we got a four and somebody else got a five on that question. The question of historically knowing what the FRCs are, not too sure why we got so uh, low of a score. And literally, phase B should just be thrown out at this point. I don't understand it, somebody should talk about it, but the scoring of that 2.8 is not nationally known community schools. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have Louis Malfaro. Good evening, trustees. Louis Malfaro. I'm the associate executive director at Austin Voices. Austin Voices developed the family resource centers before there was any public funding. We eventually brought the school district, the city, and the county together as funding partners. It's always been a collaboration. The FRCs were developed to meet a need that was not being met, wraparound family services. Now, we've worked for years with CIS. They do a great job mentoring and counseling kids. We do a great job doing wraparound services for families and leading schools through the community schools process. If your goal is to get us to work better together, this proposal tonight should be voted down because it does exactly the opposite. It pits us against each other. We're asking the board tonight to Go back to the administration and rerun the FRP. Get the city and county 
who kick in half the public money at the table and bring CIS and Austin Voices to the table. We want to work together. We want to see FRCs expanded. And what the administration has set up here, as you heard from Jose, is an exceedingly flawed process. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll have um, Gabriel Estrada, followed by Ken Serafis, uh, then Janet Iturbe, and then John David Saucedo. Good evening, my name is Gabriel Estrada. I'm a proud alumni of AISD schools as a student, a teacher, a parent, and community supporter. I'd like to clarify the background information surrounding the development of family resource centers. In 2007, the community of St. John and members of Austin Voices worked to develop the first family resource center, FRC, at Webb Middle School as one of the community-driven solutions to turn Webb into a thriving and high-functioning middle school. Because of the success of the FRC at Webb in 2007 at stabilizing families and paving the way for students to focus on their academic success, Austin Voices worked with AISD, Travis County, and the City of Austin to develop the FRC model at five other schools in 2009. The Family Resource Centers in Austin are a national best practices model, and Austin Voices looks forward to working with partners, including the city, county, and AISD, to support FRCs across all Title I campuses in Austin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry. Next, Ken Serafis. <coughs> Good evening, Board Superintendent, uh, Interim Superintendent. Um, I'm, my name's Ken Serafis. I'm President of Education Austin, a former teacher, and my most important role is a parent. And I'm here to speak on two organizations that I have incredible respect for, CIS and Austin Voices. Uh, they've impacted me as a teacher, as a parent, and as a union leader and I have a lot of admiration for both. What I'm concerned with is a process that was led by the district that I think in, in three different areas was problematic. One was the process or the purpose. Why or what is the change? What's the goal? And that I think is a little bit vague. Process, how are we processing to find out who the best partner is? And I think that you probably had a lot of calls lately and comments tonight that will indicate flaws in the process itself that bring question to it. And lastly is how do we post this and communicate it to our community? And I think these things have left some questions. And I would strongly encourage the district to take a pause to take time, go through this process again, and if, so that we can meet the needs of our students, our families, and our communities, and the schools they serve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next we have uh, Janet Iturbe. Gracias. Hi. Buenas tardes, antes que nada. Buenas tardes, y muchas gracias por escucharnos. Before anything, good afternoon, and thanks for listen, listening to us. Mi nombre es Janet Iturbe. My name is Janet Iturbe. Y estamos aquí para abogar por el Centro de Recursos Familiares Austin Voices. And we're here to advocate for the Family Resource Center Austin Voices. Para que sigan brindando los fondos necesarios para que siga existiendo este recurso que brinda soporte a la comunidad. So we can still have funding for this uh, organization so we can keep uh, giving help to the community. Que están asistiendo a las familias que están asistiendo a, a las escuelas del IST y a la comunidad en general a los más necesitados. So they actually exist to the, to the families, they, they attend the ASD schools and all the uh, community members that are more needed. Y más en estos tiempos que hay más necesidad. And especially in these times that we have more difficulties, there's more need. Participo en el Centro de Recursos Familiares desde hace tres años. I participate in the Center of uh, Family Resources since three years ago. Como líder de bloque y promotora de salud. Es a block leader and a health promoter. Hemos trabajado muy duro siendo el puente de información directo en la comunidad. We've been, hard, we've been working very hard uh, as the link of information in the community. Desde tocando puertas en los departamentos, etcétera, para hacerles saber los recursos que existen y que están brindando. We are knocking, literally knocking on the apartments to let them know all the resources they have and all the things that they're giving them. Al alcance de todos, como bancos de comida. Uh, so um, to, the resources are reachable for all of them, like the food bank. Asistencia de renta, de luz. Rent assistance, electricity assistance. Clases de inglés, de computación. English classes and, and computer Clínicas classes. Clínicas del condado, como las de vacunación, como los nombraron. Uh, co county clinics, like the vaccination that you mentioned before. 
Y bueno, para cerrar con broche de oro, a, a, agradecemos y ustedes cuando decidieron dar este recurso y apoyar a esta organización, están teniendo un buen éxito. Los números están, no nada más son números, se está beneficiando toda la comunidad. Gracias. Uh, well, just to finish, when you, um, uh, when you um, agree to give us the funds for this, for this organization, we're actually having very good numbers with this, with this organization too. We're, thank you so much. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thanks. Um, and the last one is John David Saucedo. Good evening. A family resource center is not just a building. It is not simply a facility. An Austin Voices for Education and Youth Family Resource Center is a lifeline for a family in crisis. It is a beacon of hope for a struggling family. I've had the opportunity and the privilege to work with the Dobie Family Resource Center. They have helped our Walnut Creek families through food distributions, access to vaccines, rent assistance, utility assistance, job training, access to adult learning, and they even provided bikes for our kids. During Winter Storm Uri in February 2021, I personally witnessed the Doby Family Resource Center help obtain hospice care for a young dying wom woman, a mother of one of our students from Walnut Creek. They also facilitated grief counseling for the two children. An AV Family Resource Center will not and cannot solve every societal ill and problem. However, they do provide help and hope for a better life and a better tomorrow for many Austin ISD families. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so we will now play the recorded messages uh, for public testimony, so please listen carefully. I'm Susan Moffat, former AISD parent and community member, asking you to postpone your vote on item 11.4. The attached contract would give all family resource centers to communities and schools. CIS is a wonderful group and does great work, but they have never run a family resource center. Austin Voices, which has done outstanding work with the district's family resource centers for years and is a nationally recognized model, was inexplicably scored a half point lower than CIS, an organization that has never done this work before. As far as I can tell, the city and county, which together put in over $200,000 support to support this work, don't know anything about the proposed change, not to mention the over 100 community partners Austin Voices brings to the table. Austin Voices has an excellent record going back years with AISD's family resource centers. There seems to be a lot of confusion and perhaps some irregularities in this process. For these reasons, I'm asking you to please postpone your vote and extend the Austin Voices contract temporarily until these concerns can be addressed. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Linda Battles, Austin Voices board member. I urge you to postpone consideration of agenda item 11.4 relating to the service agreement for the family resource centers. At the board's June 8th information ses session, it was stated that at the June 22nd board meeting, you would be voting on an RFP for the FRCs. It was reported that there were a total of three proposals with two very strong proposals from Austin Voices and communities and schools. After going through the procurement and evaluation process, it was stated that the difference in the point system between the two proposals was less than half a point. Therefore, the recommendation was to begin contract negotiations with both vendors. However, today's agenda item 11.4 is approval of only one vendor for the service agreement, communities and schools. There appears to be no public record of how the recommendation changed from contract negotiation with both vendors to only one vendor. Again, I urge you to postpone this decision and determine if a new procurement process needs to be initiated to ensure transparency and fairness to all interested vendors. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Hello, my name is Yonor Vargas. I am a former AISD employee and a community stakeholder. I'm calling you to urge that you approve the expansion of Literacy First Early Reading Intervention Program under item 16.1. I had the privilege to work with Literacy First when I was an AISD employee. When students are struggle with learning to read, early intervention is the most effective way to help them quickly reach grade level expectations. 
We all know since the pandemic, the number of students requiring support in reading is overwhelming classrooms and special education teachers in our districts. Literacy First is a proven solution to this dire problem. I strongly urge you to vote for this proven science research-based, reading-based solution to one of our district's most pressing problems. A generation of young leaders needs your support now and for the years to come. Expanding the Literacy First program means that more young readers and teachers will be supported by well-trained professional staff beginning next year. Again, I urge you to expand this program. Gracias. Hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es Rina Mejía. Soy promotora de salud comunitaria y a la vez una líder de bloque comunitaria para los centros de recursos familiares y pues para toda la comunidad, ¿verdad? Eh, estoy llamando porque, pues, eh, mi opinión, los centros de recursos ayudan a miles de familias de los Tinaití que necesitan ayuda con vivienda, alimentación, salud médica, empleo, y, y también ayudan a nuestros hijos a que ellos aprendan más como estudiantes para saberse desempeñar más en el estudio. Como centros de recursos comunitarios nos ayudan a mucho. Necesitamos apoyar los centros de recursos familiares, no quitándoles los fondos que ellos tienen, porque son muy indispensables para, para los centros de recursos. Y, y ellos son de mucha ayuda para miles de estudiantes de las escuelas de Austin ISD. Eh, eh, también hay muchas muchas madres que, que apoyan sus hijos y ellos ayudan a esas madres para que tengan unos hijos eh, excelentes. This is an English interpretation of Rina Mejia's message. Hello, good morning. My name is Rina Mejia. I am a community health promoter and at the same time, a community block leader for the family resource centers and for the whole community. I am calling because, in my opinion, the resource centers help thousands of families in Austin ISD who need help with housing, food, medical care, employment, and also help our children to learn more as students to know how to perform better in their studies. The community resource centers help us a lot. We need to support the family resource centers by not taking away the funds that they have because they are very important for the resource centers and they are very helpful for thousands of students from Austin ISD schools. Uh, there are also many mothers who support their children and they help those mothers so they can have excellent children. Uh, buenos días, mi nombre es Norma Hernández. Estoy llamando para apoyar y abogar por uh, Austin Voices. Soy un líder de bloque comunitario y nosotros uh, hemos trabajado con la, con la comunidad. Sabemos las necesidades que tenemos y no hay otra organización como Austin Voices donde nos sientamos apoyados y sientamos que, ten, que tenemos la, la, la ayuda que necesitamos, que bien sea de la comida, bien sea de, de ropa, que ellos saben a dónde dirigirnos en cada necesidad que nosotros tenemos. Sería muy triste para nosotros que nos quiten uh, o nos recorten la ayuda que tenemos con los invoices. Uh, me gustaría que trabajaran más de cerca con nosotros, con los papás de los estudiantes, de Austin ISD, uh, para que se den cuenta las necesidades que nosotros tenemos y que la única organización que ahorita nos ha estado ayudando y apoyando durante este tiempo muy difícil de COVID fue Austin Voices. Entonces, uh, estoy uh, llamando para uh, decirles que no nos quiten fondos. This is an interpretation into English of Norma Hernández's message. Good morning. My name is Norma Hernandez. I am calling to support and advocate for Austin Voices. I am a community block leader, and we have worked with the community. We know the needs we have, and that there is no other organization like Austin Voices, where we feel supported and we feel that we have the help we need, whether it is with food, whether it is with clothes. They know where to direct us for each need we have. It would be very sad for us if the help we have from Austin Voices is taken away or reduced. I would like for you to work more closely with us, with the parents of the students of Austin ISD, so that you will be aware of the needs we have 
and that the only organization that has been helping and supporting us right now during the very difficult times of COVID was Austin Voices. So I am calling to tell you not to take away their Hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es Sandra Zamora. Soy mamá de un niño de, de la Escuela Navarro y también soy líder de bloque. Y quiero decirles que um, Austin Voices ha sido una bendición para mí a partir de que fue la, empezó la pandemia. Para mí fue una bendición encontrar gente maravillosa que me ayudó desinteresadamente. Y hasta el día de hoy <coughs> sigue siendo mi bendición. Y considero injusto que quieran quitarnos esa ayuda porque en realidad fue lo que me sostuvo todo este tiempo. Y hasta el día, ustedes pueden ver incluso mi récord, es el más grueso, lo que es mi, mi, donde guardan ustedes toda la información. Ustedes pueden verlo, toda la ayuda que yo he recibido. Estoy muy agradecida, me he sentido muy bendecida y también soy parte de Austin Voices ayudar a las personas a conseguir ayuda es lo más hermoso y no entiendo por qué la decisión de quitarlo espero que consideren este, y piensen en las personas que hemos sido bendecidas a partir de ese programa porque hasta el día de hoy como se lo repito ha sido una bendición del poder This is an English interpretation of Sandra Zamora's message Hello, good morning, my name is Sandra Zamora I am a parent of a child who goes to Navarro, and I am also a block reader. I want to tell you that Austin Voices has been a blessing for me since the pandemic began. For me, it was a blessing to find wonderful people who helped me unselfishly, and to this day, it continues to be my blessing, and I consider it unfair that they want to take this help away from us, because in reality, it was the one that supported me all this time. You can even see my record. It is the thickest one where you keep all the information. You can see all the help I have received. I am very grateful. I have felt very blessed. I am also part of Austin Voices. Helping people get help is the most beautiful thing, and I don't understand why the decision to do away with it. But I hope you will consider and think about the people that have been blessed from that program, because to this day, as I keep telling you, it has been a blessing. This is Kathy Doggett, AISD parent and early childhood community leader. I'm calling to urge you to approve the expansion of Literacy First Early Reading Intervention Program under item 16.1. When students struggle with learning to read, early intervention is the most effective way to help them reach grade level expectations. The number of students requiring support in reading is overwhelming our AISD classroom and special education teachers. Literacy First is a proven solution to this dire problem. Expanding the program means that more young readers and teachers will be well supported this coming school year. I've observed the powerful interventions Literacy First provides firsthand. It works to help all children reach grade level reading. I strongly urge you to vote for this proven science of reading based solution to one of our district's most pressing problems. Buenos días, soy Guillermo Ramírez, soy un padre de familia. Estoy enterado de que está planeado retirar los recursos eh, económicos del Centro de Recursos Familiares, FRC. Um, me gustaría ser reconsiderada, ya que ellos me han apoyado a mí personalmente y han apoyado a miles de familias, tanto con alimentos, uh, calzado, servicios médicos y, y otro tipo de, de apoyos como psicológicos. Entonces, me, me gustaría que todo esto fuera reconsiderado, uh, puesto que eh, todos los recursos son aprovechados para no tanto solo para los niños, sino también para los alumnos, incluyendo maestros de las de los planteles. Entonces, creo tienen que reconsiderar el hecho de, de regresar esos recursos a, a, a FRC. Gracias. This is an English interpretation of Guillermo Ramirez's message. Good morning, I am Guillermo Ramirez. I am a parent. I am aware that it is planned to withdraw the economic resources of the SRC Family Resource Centers. I would like it to be reconsidered since they have supported me personally and have supported thousands of families with food, shoes, medical services, and other types of support, such as psychological. I would like all this to be reconsidered since all the resources are utilized, not only for the children, but also for the adults, including the teachers of the campuses. 
So I think they have to reconsider returning those resources to SRC. Thank you. Buenos días, mi nombre es Guadalupe Cardoso, soy promotora de salud. Me gustaría que no se le retiren los fondos a los centros de recursos familiares, ya que ellos apoyan con comida, vivienda, salud mental, no solo para los niños, sino también para las familias. Pido que no se le retire el presupuesto. Gracias. This is an interpretation into English of Guadalupe Cardoso's message. Good morning. My name is Guadalupe Cardoso. I am a health advocate. I would like to ask not to take away the funds for the family resource centers, since they support with food, housing, mental health, not only for the children, but also for, for the families. I ask that you will not take their budget away. Thank you. Hello. My name is Charlotte Blanche. I'm a community advocate, a parent of three struggling readers in the district, and a Literacy First tutor. <laughs> I'm calling to support the expansion of the Literacy First Early Reading Intervention Program under Agenda Item 16.1. When students struggle to, with learning to read, early intervention is the most effective way to help them quickly reach grade level expectations. The number of students requiring support in reading is overwhelming classrooms, resources, and teachers in our district. Expanding the Literacy First Program means that more young readers and teachers will be supported in Title I schools by well-trained professionals beginning next year. This project draws upon community's resources, own resources to meet its literacy needs. I strongly urge you to vote for this proven science of reading-based solution. Let's help our emerging readers reach grade level success. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you take this to heart. Thank you. Mi nombre es Teresa Rivera, promotora de salud de Austin Voices. También soy un líder comunitario y también soy un padre de Austin ISD. El día de hoy les estoy llamando porque necesitamos apoyar uh, el programa de Austin Voices de las escuelas comunitarias. Y yo soy un líder comunitario. Yo eh, Austin Voices me ha ayudado a ser promotora de salud, eh, de tener mi certificado de, del estado de Texas. Ahora yo soy devolviéndole a mi comunidad lo que ellos me han lo que ellos me han enseñado yo ayudo con las aplicaciones de, 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 de las familias con las, las aplicaciones del map del, del medicaid uh, seguimos ayudando a, a la comunidad a los niños con alimentación con, con recursos que, que, ellos, que ellos necesiten uh, con, con vivienda Um, necesitamos el apoyo a Austin Voices y que no se le quiten los fondos para sus proyectos. Es como quitarle algo más a nuestra comunidad, como se pasó con los counselors, con servicios mentales y otras y otras cosas más que pedimos. My name is Teresa Rivera, health advocate for Austin Voices. I am also a community leader and an Austin ISD parent. I am calling you today because we need to support the Austin Voices Community Schools program. I am a community leader, and Austin Voices has helped me become a health advocate to have my certificate from the state of Texas, and now I am giving back to the community what they have taught me. I help families with Medicaid and MAP applications, and we continue to help the community, the children, with food, with resources they need, with housing. We need to support Austin Voices and not take away their funding for their projects. It's like taking away something else from our community, like what happened with the counselors, with mental services, and other things we asked for. Jamie Haynes, Agenda Item 11.4. Greetings as team trustees and Superintendent Segura. My name is Jamie Haynes, former AISD teacher at Martin, where I had great experiences with both CIS and Austin Voices. However, I do not believe that the contract for FRC should be awarded to CIS. In addition to contradictions in the bidding process, CIS will not be as effective managing the FRCs because of their focus, emphasis on quantitative assessment, and the law of diminishing returns. First, CIS provides direct services to students and has no experience with providing wraparound services. Second, the numbers CIS provides are compelling, but a deeper look shows that case managers are expected to carry 75 students. One person I spoke to planned on resigning 
from their position with CIS because their work was, quote, all about the numbers and not about the quality of services. Finally, CIS's ability to provide current students services is already diminishing. Expanding their scope will serve to accelerate this process. Please consider awarding the contract fully to Austin Voices. Remember how CIS fared during the partnership with TSTEM at Mendez? Let's not make the same mistake twice. Hi, I'm Kim Betty Ancilla, a speech therapist with AISD for 25 years. Thank you again, Board of Trustees, for listening to us all so you are informed when making the right decisions for the students we serve. AISD lost a dozen speech therapists this year and is at risk for losing more speech therapists if we do not at least get the 7% raise that we were told we would get last month. As it is, speech therapists are not getting the 20% raise that the LSSPs and educational diagnosticians are getting, which is because of the evaluation backlog and TEA conservatorship. Speech therapists have always kept AISD in compliance with TEA by meeting all evaluation timelines. We have never caused an evaluation backlog. Also, speech therapists bring in thousands of dollars to AISD annually through Medicaid reimbursement for speech therapy and speech evaluation. So please vote yes on a pay raise for speech therapists and show us that AISD values speech therapists. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent and Board of Trustees. My name is Roxanne Evans, and I'm speaking to agenda item 11.4. I'm a longtime community advocate and a former AISD employee. I mentioned my employment because I was with the district when Austin Voices began its groundbreaking work with the district. Austin Voices has been an outstanding partner and has provided valuable resources to students and families that will likely benefit for generations to come. Upon hearing that there may have been some irregularities in the screening process for this RFP, I think that the district and community would benefit from reopening the RFP process and doing a second review. Given that there are two stellar organizations as finalists, the best outcome for the community would be for Austin Voices to prevail as the contractor and communities and schools partner with them to enhance the service of the Family Resource Centers. But a clear and clean redo of this process will determine that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth and I'm an AISD community member. Um, I'm calling to support the expansion of Literacy First Early Reading Intervention Program under Agenda Item 16.1. When students struggle with learning to read, early intervention is the most effective way to help them quickly reach grade level expectations. The number of students requiring support in reading is overwhelming classrooms, resources, and teachers in our district. Literacy First is a proven solution to this dire problem. Expanding the Literacy First program means that more young readers and teachers will be supported in Title I schools by well-trained professionals beginning next year. This project draws upon the community's own resources to meet its literacy needs. I strongly urge you to vote for this proven science of reading-based solution to one of our district's most pressing problems. Let's help our emerging re readers reach grade level success. Thank you. Hello, my name is Melinda Diaz, and I am a Austin community member and a parent. I am calling to support the expansion of the Literacy First Early Reading Intervention Program under Agenda Item 16.1. When students struggle with learning to read, early intervention is the most effective way to help them quickly reach grade level expectations. The, the number of students requiring support in reading is overwhelming classrooms, resources, and teachers in our district. Literacy First is a proven solution to this dire problem. Expanding the Literacy First program means that more young readers and teachers will be supported in Title I schools by well-trained professionals beginning next year. This project draws upon the community's own resources to meet its literacy needs. I strongly urge you to vote for this proven science of reading-based solution to one of our district's most pressing problems. Let's help our emerging readers reach grade level success. Thank you. Hi, my name is Docs Gonzalez, and I'm a parent of a rising eighth grader and a rising fourth grader in AISD. 
I respectfully ask that the board approve the expansion of the Literacy First Early Reading Intervention Program as you consider the 2023-24 budget in, an item, in item 16.1 of your agenda. Early intervention is the most effective way to help students struggling to read read reach grade level expectations. Literacy First is a research-based and effective solution to this dire problem and can help lessen the burden on classroom teachers. Expanding the Literacy First program will mean more well-trained professionals will be available for some of our neediest schools to help support young readers and teachers. This project draws upon the community's own resources to meet students' literacy needs, building the district's capacity to provide this effective tutoring on its own in the future. I strongly urge you to approve this proven science-based solution to one of our district's most pressing needs. Your support now can mean a world of difference to young readers for generations to come. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cheryl Jones. I am a speech language pathologist with AISD for about 17, 18 years now. I want to thank you again, the Board of Trustees, for always listening to all of us speech therapists. I know we are a rather large group, but we are also a very good and efficient group. Um, in the past years, we have lost a lot of great speech language therapists throughout the um, years, and it is, we are at a risk for losing even more, and that is because we are not being compensated for the work that we are doing. Uh, it is not comparable to what we are seeing in neighboring school districts or nationwide. Uh, that's why I am calling to urge you to please vote yes on a pay raise for speech therapists. Uh, we always need our evaluation timelines. We are very diligent about that. We have never caused any kind of backlog. We are uh, also able to provide those speech services to students and then also uh, bring in thousands of dollars to AISD through Medicaid reimbursement for those services. So please consider voting yes on a pay raise for speech therapists. Thank you so much for your time. Good afternoon. I'm Libby Doggett. I am a parent, a grandparent of three, or formerly four, uh, AISD students. I'm also a community member and an interested uh, person who very much appreciates all the work you all do as board members uh, to support AISD. Uh, I love our school district. I'm just calling today to urge you to approve the expansion of Literacy First Early Reading Intervention Program under item 16.1. Uh, I know firsthand that when students struggle and don't learn to read, uh, it has repercussions throughout their lives. And I've seen the, uh, uh, the research on Literacy First and firmly believe it is one of many programs we need to have in place that will help our children learn to read. We need to put more programs that follow the science of reading in place. Thank you very much. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es María Ochoa y estoy hablando a favor de Austin Voices for Education and Youth acerca de mi sentir, acerca del bono que están este, dando a los centros de recursos. Pienso que para si no hay estos recursos a las familias, vamos a muchas familias vamos a salir de, de Austin y por ende van a tener menos alumnado en las escuelas. En lo personal a mí me ofrecieron la oportunidad de ser voluntaria y después promotora. Ahora hago llamadas para responder información de lo que ofrecen en los centros de recursos a las familias. Para las despensas de comida, los programas para los niños y padres. Y ahora mismo estamos haciendo um, aplicaciones para el MAP, Medicaid. Entonces siento que es mucha ayuda en los centros de recursos para las familias y por favor este les pido que no les quiten este bono eh, porque realmente ayuda a, a todas las familias en diferentes áreas. Gracias, les agradezco y puedan tomar en cuenta mi opinión y la de muchas familias. This is an interpretation into English of María Ochoa's message. Good afternoon, my name is María Ochoa and I am calling on behalf of Austin Voices for Education and Youth about investing, about the money given to the resource centers. I think that if we don't have these resources for families, we will, many families will leave Austin, and therefore we will have less students in schools. Personally, I was offered the opportunity to volunteer and then become an advocate. I now make calls to provide information about what is offered in the family resource centers in food pantries, programs for children and parents, and right now we are doing applications for MAP and Medicaid. So 
So I feel there is a lot of help in the family resource centers. And I ask you to please not take away that money because it really helps all the families in different areas. Thank you, and I will be very thankful if you can take my opinion and that of many families into consideration. My name is Jace Klein, and I'm a teacher, cheer director, and UIL academic coordinator at McCallum High School. I'm urging the school board to consider increasing stipend pay for UIL academic positions at all high school campuses. Currently, only $400 is given per year to coach a UIL academic event. Unlike most sporting events, which pay thousands of dollars a year for a short season, UIL Academics is a year-round commitment for our teachers who must prepare students for invitational district, region, and state academic contests. Given this information, I suggest that we increase the base stipend for coaching an academic event and specifically give individual stipends for each event offered at the UIL Academic Meet. In promoting the mission of AISD, we should do better to fund academic growth in our students through UIL competition. Students are prepared for college coursework via the Science, Math, and Literary Criticism Contest, Students are prepared for and introduced to careers via the accounting, computer applications, and computer science contests. Finally, students are prepared for life by competing in the spelling and vocabulary, current issues and events, social studies, and more. All events promote sportsmanship and teamwork, providing essential SEL foundations for our students. In addition to this, UIL offers TILS scholarships for, to students that qualify to the state level competition. Please feel free to reach out to Jace Klein at McCallum High School, and I'll be happy to continue this conversation. <laughs> Hello, I am an employee of Austin ISD. I am an athletic trainer at a 6A high school. I have the privilege of being one of two at the 6A high school. Um, this last spring, we were told that the 5As would be an additional athletic trainer because right now they only have one, leaving a lot of things uncovered, students not getting a quality care, and so forth. We had already proceeded to do interviews, and HR had posted the posting for eight additional athletic trainers, and we were told today that we were no longer getting those. The quality of care and the standard of care that are providing to these students in the communities of Austin ISD is going to fall. And it's very unfortunate that there, this is not a priority um, for our budget no longer. It's very sad that these athletes and these students at these high schools were, will be without an additional athletic trainer, leaving the quality care of not only the students, but also the athletic trainer who has to work at these schools by themselves. Um, I hope you can push this further, um, or you are going to potentially see a loss in, in the quality of care that we are able to provide because of this. Thank you. Hi. Good evening, trustees. My name is Marisol Foster. I am a proud AISD parent, the executive director of the Weber Family Foundation, and a strong supporter of Literacy First. Related, I'm calling to urge you to expand the Literacy First program under agenda item 16.1 today. Literacy First continues to be the only program of its kind in our region that provides data-driven intensive reading intervention led by rigorously trained tutors and paraprofessionals. As you know, following extended school closures, the number of students requiring significant support in reading is overwhelming our classrooms and our teachers. This work is now more important than ever. Because Literacy First has a long track record of positive student outcomes, it's no surprise that it has attracted support from diverse sources. However, philanthropy and private funds cannot fill the gap needed to serve the young learners of the largest school district in Central Texas. We need your partnership. I strongly urge you to vote to expand this program so that together we can better prepare our young readers for a life of success. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael Quo, and I am an athletic trainer with Austin ISD. I'm calling to comment about the additional athletic trainer FTE item on the proposed budget for fiscal year 2023 to 24. Austin ISD have previously committed to hiring eight additional full-time athletic trainer positions for our district that desperately needs these positions. And now when the proposed budget is released, these, bu these positions have been removed for next year. It's unfair that you are willing to go another year to neglect the hiring of athletic trainer positions that are needed in our schools and communities. And it's unethical that you have posted them and even allowed the interviewing and recommendation of potential hires for these positions only to later remove them. This is messing with the livelihood of people who are excited and looking forward to having these jobs. It's also highly disappointing for a whole community and section of your school district that's working for you and needs to feel supported by you. You've gone back on your word and broken trust with your community without giving any intentional communication beforehand. I and others require remediation for this during today's meeting by asking that you reinstall all eight additional athletic trainer positions for fiscal year 2023 to 2024. 
Hi, my name is Teresa Delgado Moya, the athletic trainer at Travis High School. I'm calling in regards to the removal of the 5A athletic trainers from the budget uh, for the 2023-2024 school year. I am absolutely appalled and disgusted that the board and the school district would move to remove these positions. We had already gotten the approval to interview and hire for these positions, and now we are going to have to go back and tell people that, sorry, oops, we made a mistake, uh, and you no longer have a job. That is a terrible look for the district. In addition, this is a safety and health issue for the district, for our student athletes that directly affects every single high school campus. And what this decision is telling everyone is that safety and health of student athletes is no longer important. Also, the work environment for the current athletic trainers in the district is also no longer important. This needs to be rectified. This needs to be fixed immediately. It cannot continue this way, and the board cannot approve a budget without including these positions, and it needs to be fixed. Hello there. My name is Dewan Lewis. I'm an athletic trainer for Austin ISD. Um, I'm calling to comment about the additional athletic trainers and the FTE items on the uh, proposal budget for 2023-2024. Um, the Austin ISD previously committed to hiring eight additional full-time athletic trainer positions for our district that we desperately need for these positions. Uh, now, when the proposal came out, the district released that they are no longer trying to hire athletic trainers for this upcoming year, which is probably one of the most disappointing uh, news that we can hear as athletic trainers looking for. We've been looking for help for years now. Um, not only disappointing to us, but this will be disappointing to the standard of care for all of our lower uh, inner city uh, students, um, especially for schools like Eastside, Northeast, LBJ, Navarro, Crockett, Travis, um, because they need this standard of care. They need someone to be there to take care of them. And with just one athletic trainer, we don't have the time and we don't have the support that we need to be able to do those things for them. So with this being said, like, I really, you know. My name is Sue Torres. I'm an athletic trainer at Lhasa High School. I was so disappointed that the additional training positions have been removed from the budget. So many practices and games had not had medical coverage due to inadequate staffing by AISD. When a medical emergency occurs a and a bad outcome is the result, you will only have yourself to blame. AISD is so undermanned in athletic trainers. It is just a matter of time. Please reconsider this budget cut and take care of our student athletes properly. We thought we had this resolved. We've interviewed and uh, we've made uh, recommendations only to find out that these positions were cut. That is so, so disappointing. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ara Marjongan and I'm with the Community Advancement Network Community Council and I am uh, providing testimony in favor of the budget item for Literacy First to provide tutoring in additional Title I schools. Uh, as you all know, our students are behind and have uh, delayed learning from COVID, and the research has shown that without significant intervention, our students won't catch up. And as you know from your own uh, local test scores and the recent NAEP, NAEP report, uh, this is a serious and ongoing challenge. Fortunately, uh, in the Community Council's last year's and this year's report, we identified tutoring of the kind provided by Literacy First as a very effective evidence-based approach to helping kids deal with delayed learning. And as an, an added item, the research has also shown that tutoring is a very effective strategy for dealing with the achievement gap. So uh, we encourage you to, to review the CAN Community Council report from last year and this year, and to please approve that budgeting item for Literacy First. It'll be a significant. Hello, I am Brendan, a former bilingual tutor for Literacy First. I am calling to urge you to approve the expansion of the Literacy First Early Reading Intervention Program under item 16.1. Every child deserves the opportunity to learn to read. Some children need more support to do so. Literacy First provides these children the early interventions which are needed now more than ever. 
providing one-to-one -one professional tutoring to struggling students changes lives for the better. I strongly urge you to vote for this proven science of reading based solution to one of the district's most pressing problems. A generation of young readers needs your support. Thank you. I'm Susan Moffat, former AISD parent and community. All right. So that concludes uh, the public testimony. Trustees, are there any questions or clarifications? Okay. All right, so we will now, um, oh, so just as a reminder, please feel free to share any general comments or questions on non-voting items with the board by email at trustees at austinisd.org. So um, our, we're now gonna resume our regularly scheduled programming and go to item 5.2, which is the Notice of Intruder Detection Audit. Dr. Reach, <laughs> Chief of Governmental Relations and Board Services will provide this update. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reach. Good evening, President Singh, Board of Trustees, and uh, Superintendent Segura. Uh, thank you for allowing me to come to give our end of the year school safety door audit report. So as I've shared with you at previous meetings, uh, this requirement started previously, or at the start of this school year, as a requirement to conduct checks and audits of all of our exterior doors. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the whole spiel tonight because we have not had any new audits conducted since we last met, but we did wanna briefly give you an end of the year report and uh, share with you one next step in some of the work we do during the summer. So during this school year, we had 90 campuses audited, which works out to about 79% of all of our campuses in the school district who were checked. 38 campuses had no findings when they were visited, and 52 had one or more findings. For safety reasons, I won't get into what those schools were, but what I do want to assure the board and assure our community is that when we had a finding, one or more finding in any of our campuses, our first steps was one, if it had to do with a door that was a malfunction or an issue that should be fixed, uh, we prioritized that fix. Um, two, we would go out and meet with that campus where we would uh, make sure that everyone was trained on the process for safe doors and locked doors and whatever else that audit may have indicated, uh, make sure that we put an action plan in place. Uh, and then three, we would share that information out with our safety and security committee. So as I mentioned, we are done for the year, uh, but our next step is to submit our end of the year, I wanna make sure I get the name of this right, school safety and security audit which is done every three years to the state of Texas. And so as is required by the education code and the Texas State, the Texas School Safety Center, we will provide the Board of Trustees with a copy of that report before we submit it. And I am using this time now to share that public notification that we are preparing to do that. And that overall audit uh, not only includes all these door safety audits that we've discussed, but also the processes that each campus go through every year to ensure that they are scheduling all of their own assessments, that they are creating their own audit team, that they are scheduling their own on-site audits, and that they are going through the different parts of that on-site audit, which includes a campus emergency operation plan, a student handbook, um, campus disciplinary data, campus improvement plan, and that that information is shared with that campus CAC. Um, and then uh, finally, that we have a, fun, a written report that summarizes what we as a district have done for that three year period. So we'll be submitting that by the end of August, hope to have it to the board um, sometime in July, uh, but that will uh, conclude our 2022-2023 door safety audit checks for the year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reach. Uh, trustees, are there any questions? All right. So our next item is an update on Mendez Middle School and Third Futures, 1882. Thank you for your patience. Yes, thank you. Tonight we'll have Mr. Zach Craddock, Mr. Jeremiah Willis, and Mr. Brandon Thurston here uh, to present uh, an update for the end of the year report for Mendez and Third Future. So welcome. Good evening. Good evening. We'll get you all situated.
Good evening, President Singh, trustees, Superintendent Segura, thanks for having us back. We appreciate it. So I believe this is our third, third meeting, and we're happy to finish our first year at Mendez. So take you through slide two, just has our, our mission statement, your mission statement, our mission statement. You see how they overlap. And it's been a privilege to serve the students of Mendez Middle School and work collaboratively with AISD this year. There we go, apologize. There we go, okay. So we're briefly gonna go over some of our goals. I'll t start us off with the finance goals and I'll turn it over to Mr. Jeremiah Willis. I'm sorry, I didn't do introductions. Mr. Jeremiah Willis is the incoming principal. He's been assistant principal there this year, exceptional instructional leader. And Dr. Thurston's being promoted to director of instruction for Central and East Texas and our new school in Baton Rouge. So um, we're happy to see him in a new leadership role. So we'll be working with more kids, roughly 2,000 students now across two states and three cities. So, and in the back we have Ms. Jasmine Terrain, assistant principal, so she's here as well. All right, so we'll start off with some of our financial goals. You'll see that our uh, annual financial report and data submitted to the district within 180 days. That is scheduled to be on target. It's not complete yet in the year because we're not doing the fiscal year. Um, we're looking at, was there an unqualified opinion in the annual financial audit? That's scheduled to be on target. EOY is not complete. We've checked yes to number three and yes to number four for our financial goals. So we're looking solid on all of those as well. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Thurston to go over some of our campus achievement updates. And so we'll start with our campus outcomes achievement goals and so we know that our goal this year is to move the campus from an F to a D at this point we are still eagerly and anxiously awaiting the final results from the state and that is pending here in September also the same for 2.1 and 2.2 um, all that's pending final state results as far as the map assessment um, and as you recall that's an assessment that's given three times a year, and that assesses the average growth of each student in each content area. And we did hit our metric of 1.6 years worth of growth. And that means compared to the average school, our kids at Mendez grew 1.6 times what every other kid did. So kudos to the team there and Mr. Willis and certainly to Ms. Terrain who was um, a big part of that instructional coaching. One, oh, let me speak to that just real Please. quick. That's also second highest in the network. So we're very proud of that growth that Mendez made in year one. So excellent jobs of the team. I'll also say that their, um, their status, so when we look at percent, percentile points gained in one year, was I believe 4.8 as well. So if we can replicate that two, three, four years in a row, you've effectively closed the achievement gap. So well done. Going to the art of thinking, that's an internal assessment. That's a critical thinking class. Unfortunately, we didn't reach our metric there. No campus in our network actually met that metric, and so we're really assessing that um, alignment of the content and the standards um, along with that assessment. And also, Mendez, mid-year, devoted some of that time from critical thinking into math and reading to ensure that we could get that 1.6 years worth of growth. Um, we'll go on to the attendance and enrollment. We did not reach the goal of our enrollment. We know that sixth grade was taken away from the campus and concerning the attendance, it, we did not hit the 96. However, we did increase from 82% in the first semester to 86 in the second semester. Concerning the campus surveys, um, I know that we've sent those questions to you and here are the outcomes of each of those surveys from parents um, and their satisfaction along with students and staff. Let me touch base real quick on Please. it. So these are baseline years because we're ju we just administered those. 
So we, and we received thank you very much for sending us the panorama data that you guys conducted for Mendez. So a lot of those questions that, that we use there. Um, I am happy to say that the campus staff survey was second highest results in the network. So when we really look at two key metrics, we look at overall is my school headed in the right direction and is the instructional leadership I'm provided help me improve my teaching. And when you take those two metrics and look at those, Mendez had second highest scores in the network. So th those are very positive results for the team. All right. And I will turn it over to Mr. Willis, and he'll talk about our campus action plan. And that's our internal metric that checks each of these indicators of success for each campus. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so quickly here on this first slide, um, these are our six key actions. Um, we'll go into a bit more detail as far as the first three are concerned. Um, it will show that we've met our goals on, on those first three. Um, <clears throat> Key action one, um, our goal was for 65% of our teachers to score to be proficient um, in delivering high quality, high quality instruction. Um, we wanted that to increase to 75% in May. We actually exceeded that goal and got to 86% um, of our teachers being proficient. For key action number two, we also met that goal as well. Um, our students know what they're learning. They know what they're learning. Um, they know their learning objective, they know why they're being held in class to receive more personalized instruction, and they know why they're being pushed out of class um, to either work independently or um, collaboratively um, with a partner. And then if you take a look at key action number three, um, the goal was for us to have 80% of teachers agreeing or strongly agreeing, and we actually met that goal with 87% of our teachers um, agreeing or strongly agreeing. And here on the next slide is just an overview of kind of some of the things that I just spoke on with key actions one, two, and three. All right, so the last time that we presented to you, I believe, was in, in March. Um, and so there are a few things that we did a little bit differently the second semester, the last quarter of the school year. We are excited to say that we did successfully send three students to Japan and seven students to Washington, D.C. So we're excited that those students, based on their growth and their attendance and their um, behavior, were able to earn their trip to Washington, D.C. and to Japan. And Dr. Thurston attended as well. And Japan I was trip. able to go to Japan. <laughs> Also, students who actually stayed on campus all year long and did not transfer in and out actually made 1.7 years worth of growth compared to those who may have missed a week here or there, transferred or something of that nature, made 1.6. And we're so, so excited about that growth because that means we are closing the achievement gap for kids who were struggling. Um, our seventh grade basketball girls, um, did an amazing job and they were, I believe, second in the district zone. So um, excellent job to the Lady Mavericks. I'm so excited that two of our teachers at Mendez as well as um, Mr. Willis are being promoted to assistant principals at other campuses in the network. And then of course, Mr. Willis is taking the reign there at Mendez. And I know, I know that he will be um, successful because he has been my right hand all year along with Ms. Terrain, and so I had to have both of them here just to tell them what I've told them privately a number of times, how much I appreciate them and how valuable they are to the work and the kids there at Mendez. If you haven't, please check out TikTok, because we're going viral. We are going viral on TikTok. Um, we are using some student-led recruitment efforts to get those kiddos back to the, to the Austin, um, district and so we have a seventh grader who is interviewing campuses uh, or interviewing teachers and principals about the food they eat and the clothes they wear and their favorite store um, and so if you see a video you will know that my favorite store is indeed Ross Dress for Less. Um, a few other things here excited that we currently have about 117 students who are currently enrolled for our fifth quarter and that's our summer school program to ensure that we're closing those gaps and we are holding kids and families accountable for their attendance as well. We know that we need kids at school and so shout out to Mr. Willis and the team there who are in I believe day three and moving into day four tomorrow of their summer school. 
Um, at this time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Craddock. Yeah, real quick, to go back to quarter five, so not only is that academic, so students have three options. They can attend AM, they can attend PM, or they can attend full day. But that includes our dyad program as well. So students are still getting the extracurricular opportunities, not just reading, writing, math, and science. So the dyad concept is still comes in at fifth quarter. We think that's an important part of learning for students. So we do that not only during the school year, but also during quarter five. So what we've learned so far, what we know is, and I really appreciated, Superintendent, what you said about your, your talent HR department. You guys getting from 80 vacancies right now is outstanding. Um, and hiring well is the number one key, the task that I put on directors and that I put on our building principals. You gotta hire well. And I'm happy to say that the team has zero core vacancies at Mendez Middle School as of today for next year, zero core vacancies. So we'll have a highly qualified teacher um, in all positions. Not only that, we've talked about our staffing model with teacher apprentices and with our learning coaches. So anytime we do have a maternity leave or an extended absence or just a day out because a child is sick, we have an effective teacher. No subs have entered into any buildings in third future this academic year. We've, we have an effective staff model um, that ensures we have 185 instructionally effective days. Diet outreach and community stakeholders, those are critical. Um, Third Future is opening five new schools that are set to open August 2nd, 2023. And we know that there's no better person in the community to spread the, good, the message of the good work that's going on than local professionals in the area. And in and, and Mendez, that's in the Dove Springs area. And so by bringing in, whether it be the guitar teacher, the photography teacher, leadership, whatever it may be, they see what's going on on a daily basis in each and every school, and there are best advocates to spread the good word that the team is doing over at Mendez. So we gotta continue that, we gotta expand on it, we gotta get better at that. We must improve attendance immediately. So Mr. Willis and his leadership team will have a plan to do that. As you saw, we went up four percentage points for ADA second semester um, because the team did put in incentives. So it's not enough just to be punitive. We have to do some positive behavior support, get those kids there. Now, that's gonna be a challenge to start. First day in Austin ISD is August 14th for kids. We start August 2nd. So, you know, those are not all, we got some weekends in there. So we're gonna start messaging right after July 4th. So July 5th, we start messaging that. Now that we're, we, we, we're, we've been here, they know us. Last year is a new partnership. That was a little bit of a challenge due to just frontline and A numbers and everything. We have all those logistics down now. So the leadership team is gonna start on that immediately on July 5th when we come back from the July 4th break. Our only big instructional initiative next year that's new is the science of reading. And I like all the public comment and all the conversation you guys have had around literacy. Because Third Future, we're investing close to $750,000 in the science of reading. So that is not only a core base curriculum for K-4, but it's also dedicated staffing to support that. So the five components of literacy. Science of reading has, has won the reading war, in my opinion. and so. We, we, are, we are implementing that network-wide, and as you, can, as you see in the data that we provided you, our seventh grade ELA scores look good. Our eighth grade did not look as good as seventh. And so we're gonna make sure we close those gaps network-wide, and that's our only big new instructional initiative. And lastly, we gotta to continue to train leadership. So um, we have two teacher leaders that were promoted to assistant principals. We're excited about that. Uh, Mr. Willis was promoted to um, principal. You're not going to find two better instructional leaders in our network. We're not going to find they can they can model the instructional practices and demonstrate real time for our students and on the job coaching. It's not about words on a piece of paper. It's about actually performing that instructional strategy real time with kids so that a teacher can be coached effectively and what that looks like. So how are we doing that? Well, we have our entire building leadership team and network instructional leadership team. Um, going to after college prep in Odessa because I have 350 students in summer school. I have a good site. And 22 teacher leaders from across the network will be going, two from Mendez, possibly three, depending on the numbers. And we're there in a week long on the job training around instructional feedback, leadership, and culture. And then we have a protocol in place for next year where Dr. Thurston, Mr. Willis, and myself. They, each teacher leader will get a minimum of a half day a month around effective coaching, on the job coaching at the school around that. Because one thing that we've learned is we, we have any time third future works with a new site, 
it works best if you have a, one leader who has experience and reps in the instructional practice and leadership and culture. And so we're, we're implementing a, a formal protocol on how to do that. And that starts July 10th. July 10th, we're at Ector. Mm -hmm. Turn it over to you, sir. Okay, so just looking ahead, some of, these, some of these things have already kind of been stated, but I will be transitioning as the new principal. Super excited. Um, the work has not stopped. Um, we're already, I'm already basically doing a lot of those things now during summer school. So it, we're just transition. It was a smooth transition for the most part, um, and it hasn't stopped over the summer. Um, staffing updates, we are about, these numbers, are probably going to be updated by the end of the week. I like to think that we will be 100% staff core and support staff by the end of the week, but we are, as already mentioned, 100% um, staffed for our core subjects. Mr. Rain um, has already visited um, our elementary schools, so we have a list of incoming seventh graders where we're already working with them to build schedules and get them into um, classes and some of our diet classes. So Ms., uh, Mr. Rain, who's our other assistant principal, uh, built together a team of some teachers and they went around to those campuses just spreading all the good things that's happening at Mendes. Um, and then we've already talked about how we're going, or how we have already gone viral, 26,000 followers. More than that. I thought uh, followers. It was, yeah, over a million views. We have, oh. we have a lot of views, yes. <laughs> uh, so those are just some things that we're doing with student recruitment. One thing I want to touch on is the staffing update, the 80% staff. So one, and I'm not sure if the board is aware of that, this, but we, we over staff by three teachers at all third future schools. So Mr. Willis has the authority to hire an extra ELA, extra math, extra science. Because stuff happens over the summer and stuff happens August 2nd and people need to move, whatever it may be. So every third future campus has three extra teachers, one in each of those content, so that we are never down and short a staff member. That's our goal. So not only is it teacher apprentices and learning coaches, we've done this at selected sites in hard to fill areas, such as in the Permian Basin. This year it was just standard operating procedure at all of our schools to do that. So Dr. Thurston has that same autonomy to do that in Beaumont and at, in, in Baton Rouge as well. All of our schools have that. So a new initiative to make sure that our school-based administrators, like we said, have an effective teacher in every classroom, 185 student teacher contact days. Well, we appreciate your time this evening, and we're certainly open to questions, and we're looking forward to um, a continued partnership. So we'll take your questions. Thank you so much. Um, so I guess I love the energy. Thank you. Congrats on becoming principal. Um, so trustees, are there any questions? Yes, Trustee Hunter. Good evening. I actually have a question for Dr. Reach before I ask you, because if it's information I missed, then it's it's my bad. The panorama information for Mendez, did we get that? It was part of, so two different parts. Um, I, I uploaded their own survey results, which is not panorama, mm -hmm. into board docs. So that's available there. The panorama parents who responded for Mendez was part of the access that we gave you to all of the district's results. Okay. So I did not send you, I did not send you Mendez individually. You'd have to go click on the drop down campus and select mm -hmm. Mendez. Okay. Thank you. So um, then I have a question and then um, a comment. I guess my question is, and I think you might have answered it because it said 47 percent. Um, your support staff, I don't know what you include in there. What I'm um, interested in is like uh, special education, how we're supporting special education students, and then how we're supporting our emerging bilinguals. Great. So let me just touch briefly on, on, on the SPED and emerging bilinguals and I'll let you guys take over. So and, and I know we've talked about the instructional model, and I'll just briefly go. So traditionally, historically, in third future schools are emergent bilingual and SPED students outperform their peers. And the data that you that we've provided, there's six assessments you'll see there for NWA. So if you look at now what we labeled as ELL, and I'll change it to emergent bilingual and special ed, I think emergent bilingual outpaced their, their peers in four of the six and sped in three of the six. So our, our model, our, our instructional model allows kids to show what they know in a variety of ways. 
And so that is usually why, and the, the, just how it gets done from grade level instruction and then personalized differentiated learning, how those two groups of students normally, in most cases in all of our schools, outperform their, you know, their, their English speaking peers and their, and their non, uh, their students without disabilities. Do you guys want to touch specifically on what you did? Because we made some instructional changes after Christmas sure. based specific to Mendes. Sure, and, and so some of the things we did was kind of reallocate that critical thinking time. We know that's an important skill. We value that across the network, but we also know that our kids were really struggling with reading. And so we took some of that art of thinking time and we, you know, we paid the price for that on those assessments. However, those kids, the, the uh, ELL students, SPED students, any student who was struggling with reading was able to get that second dip of reading based on their needs. And I think that'll, that'll bear out for the final results on the star. One other, next year even with schedule changes, with adding in the science of reading, that'll be an additional hour for students that are identified that need that. So not only will students get grade level instruction, personalized learning, they'll get their, their, their special ed minutes, they'll get dedicated ELL support during LSA time, and 60 minutes a day of science of reading if they need that additional support. And that's across the network, all schools. We're actually putting a little bit more into Mendez than we are in our other middle schools. Okay, thank you. Make sure that's still on. Um, so I was looking, um, thank you for providing um, the survey information, I mean the questions, uh, so that we could see like what, what we're asking parents. And I'm glad that you guys got our panorama information so you can kind of see how we like to tease it out. Um, I just have a request that in the future, um, like I see these questions here and I, I want to request that when we get data on any kind of survey because it's part of um, 14, I think. So um, when we're looking at did I write that one down? Let me see. Yeah, it's uh, culture of respect and customer service equity and um, the percent of family satisfaction measured by the school climate survey. So our goal is to move from 71 to 80. You guys, you know, topped it off. I think you said, was it 86? Staff. Staff was 86. Oh, staff, staff was 86. Was, what was families? 80. 80. 80. So parents. you actually hit that mark. But when we look at questions like question four, the child feels safe and happy at school. Like we're rating one to five. I really want to know, did a parent say two or did a parent say five? Right? Because if a parent said five, then I want to know what you're doing, right? If a parent said two, you know, then you guys know what to do. Um, question seven is another one. Like, the school administration and processes are very smooth and effective, right? Was that a one or was that a five? And then finally, um, question 11. Considering your overall experience with school, would you recommend the school to a friend or colleague for families? I think that's really powerful information. Um, and we looked at attendance, right? And we saw that that attendance is not what you guys want it to be. Definitely not what we want it to be. I will just share a really quick antidote because we're already pressed for time. I went to school every single day. I loved it because there was joy at the school. Now, I didn't go to class, <laughs> but I was in the building because it was a place I could get what I needed. And when I wasn't getting what I needed, you know what I did? I didn't go to school. Like, I went to somebody else's school, like I hung out at LBJ or whatever. But I think that that's important for us to understand as educators, all no matter where we are in that process, is that when there's joy, kids are going to show up. When there's not, they don't. And I remember calling parents, and the mom's like, I can't make him go to school. I dropped him off. Now, he didn't go in the building. This year, I had the experience of calling the school when I dropped my daughter off. She'd be horrified that I'm saying this. I was like, I just saw a kid get out of a car and start walking down northeast. She is not coming to your school today. You might want to get out there real quick and grab her. And so that's just something I thought I would share. I really want to know what parents think so we know where to improve and how to reach out um, and how we can support you, right? Because Mendez is our school. You're our partner, but it is still our school. And at the end of the day, we're responsible for what happens there. So I want to do everything I can do personally. I know that we want to do everything that we can do to make sure that that school is successful. And uh, thank you for the report and the information. Yes, ma'am. We'll do that with the parent survey. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Hunter. Um, anyone else? Yes, Trustee Kaufman. Right, so thank you again for coming today and for all your work this year. Congratulations on the promotions all, all around. Um, I wanted to ask a couple questions. Um, first, I just wanted to confirm with our administration, is, is that our interpretation of the MAP data that when there's a 1.6 growth, that that means it's 1.6 times the average growth? Is that our administration's interpretation when looking at our AISD data, at our um, other schools' data? Heather, you want to, or Dr. Diaz, either one. Good evening.
evening. So when we report out on our map data, we're using the premium report that we have access to internally and then the correlation. Um, so we know that 50% growth is average growth and then when you get to the north side of 50, then you're looking at more accelerated growth further away. So probably like a 75% growth rate would translate to 1.6. So what would be, so 1.6 is 1.6 years of growth, or what, what is yes. the 1.6 yes. reference? Yes. Okay. yes, sir. So when, when the, the national average is one year's of growth in one year's time, and so and we've broken it down, seventh grade outperformed eighth grade, but when you look at that total growth, and it's a weighted average, so it's a weighted average, that Mendez was 1.6 as a school, they achieved 1.6 years of growth in one year's time. Okay, perfect. So I just wanted, because what I heard was, 1.6 times the growth of average students, which is a very different interpretation. Yeah, it's, okay. Yes. I just want to make sure, because part of what our, my goal in this is that we're learning from um, other instructional practices so we can inform what we're doing. And so putting into context, not only the absolute growth that we want to see for our Mendez students, but also our, you know, what are we learning that, you know, compared to, what, what are our students learning compared to schools operating in our traditional district model? Yeah, so, our, our high point was seventh grade ELA at right at two years of growth in one year. They were our high, that was our highest scoring content area. Okay, so I hope, I trust that our administration will be providing some comparison data for us in terms of, of being able to compare apples to apples and Mendez to our other middle schools. We can absolutely do that, and I think as we work through the monitoring report, mm -hmm. uh, if, if that's how the board would like to see the data, we can definitely provide it in that way. Um, so that's another opportunity for us to improve. All right, well, I will ponder that and perhaps consult with a couple of colleagues before I make that request. Okay, and then, um, thank you, Heather. So um, also in December when you presented to us, um, you said that the, net, that, that the, the um, success of Third Future, part of that had been that you were achieving a 1.85 growth across your network. And I'm just curious, as, as we all struggle through these days, what do you attribute that drop from 1.85 in previous years to 1.6, which was, you said, the second highest in the network? What's, yeah, what's going on? That's great, because we, we had, um, I had a, a two, well, I've had two board meetings last week and one earlier today as well, so I've been talking to my boards and, and, and a lot of our boards about that. So last year, our, our network average was right at, it was 1.78, so right at eight as a network. This year, the network average, we dropped to 1.63. Um, and then our, our proficiency was a 6.5, and that, that was down slightly as well. So I, I think, and, and that we, I'm looking now big pictures network. When I, when I look at Mendez, um, and I look at leading indicators, so I look at spot observations, we look at our SRT data, um, we look at our, our demonstration of, of learning data. I think there's two, two things, two things. Number one is literacy. We got to do a better job, and we recognize that, which is why we're implementing the science of reading. Um, and I think that specifically ties in to Mendez because our lowest performing was our eighth grade ELA. That that was a big that was a big gap. There was a big gap between seventh and eighth grade reading proficiency, and so that's why we're we're investing in there. The other piece that that I'll say is. We, we implemented a formalized writing protocol called a short constructed response, just a third future strategy. We didn't do that until October. Now across the board, we were compliant on that, so we did it, but I don't think we did as effectively, like really looked at the quality of student writing. So students are writing more, yes. Did we have a rubric? Yes. But if, if we, and, and we did this, together as a team. When we really looked at students understand and see what good writing really was, I don't believe as a network we, we did that as well, and I, and I think that impacted Mendez as well. So what are we doing about that? Well, we've implemented a better protocol where we're gonna randomly you know, get blind samples, and we're gonna assess that every quarter as a leadership team, as a, as a network leadership team, and then coach building administrators on how to really look at that, look at the quality of that writing, and then how to coach teachers effectively to communicate to students what's the difference between a zero, one, and a two on our, in our writing rubric. So we were compliant, but I don't believe we were effective and we're gonna work on that. Those two things, our testing window just ended June 1. 
So we were testing right up to June 1. We just got the data. You guys were the first ones to get it because we knew we had to get this in the board packet. So as a network team, we haven't even met to really look at this yet. Appreciate that. Um, and then you mentioned, um, I think, updating the terms to refer to emergent bilingual. I encourage you to do that with all due haste and okay. sincerity around that effort because the, the changing of the term in the state of Texas, um, AISD preceded the state of Texas in making that change in our policy to refer to our students as emergent bilingual. And it's not just because it's a name, it's not just because it's different words, but it's reflecting a different set of beliefs about the potential of our students and making sure that we're recognizing that students who come into our schools learning, knowing other languages are in the process of becoming bilingual. They're not yes. erasing the language they came with and replacing with English, but they're actually becoming bilingual. And so not only do we wanna see in our district practices that recognize and value the languages that students bring with them, but we also wanna incorporate instructional practices that leverage that home language and allow them to use that in their schools. So there's a whole lot behind the term emergent bilingual, so I really encourage you on your network, but especially in Mendez to do some exploration into that when you're looking at how you serve your emergent bilingual students, starting with the term and then moving into the beliefs and really thinking about what are the best services for them. Because I remain concerned that we have a school um, operating in our network that in our district that doesn't provide a dual language program for our students when it's really almost a majority of students would qualify to be in a dual language program. And so I want us to really make sure that, that we're working together to meet the values of our district surrounding how do we serve emergent bilingual students. Um, of course, the most important thing is that they're successful, and I know that you're aiming for success for the students, um, so I appreciate that, and I hope that, again, that we can learn from each other about this process so we can, we can see them soaring on the English assessments, but we can also look at the other approaches. So I just encourage you to really think through that, that term. Um, and then uh, um, last question, Superintendent Segura, we still have, um, are we still providing options to students at Mendez who would be in dual language from elementary to continue in dual language with busing to other schools if they choose not to attend Mendez? <coughs> That has not changed. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So perfect. So I do hope that we can continue to see the enrollment stabilize at Mendez, but I also want to make sure that we're providing options for our students who do want to participate in dual language so they can attend a school where it's offered. Thank you. Thank you. Genuinely, <clears throat> thank you for all your work. Thank you, sir. That was not, that was not a hissy fit. That was just moving my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Any other trustees have questions or comments? Um, oh, yes, Trustee Zapata. Thank you uh, very much for your report. Um, as I would like to uh, just ask uh, if you all would be, uh, if we could set up a time to meet as your trustee. Uh, I'd really like to, you know, I know at, last year we had a couple of, of visits, uh, but as a collabor if we want to really build a collaboration, I'd, I'd like us to meet more often just to see how, how we're doing, what is it, what more do we need to do. We have a very strong, vibrant community that wants to see Mendes succeed. And so the only way that we can do that is to work side by side with you to make that happen. So if we could set a time to meet uh, before uh, you start school, uh, that would be very helpful. Uh, there are some ideas that we would like to share with you, and um, and and that's you know I think that would be a way to to really build a, and strengthen that collaboration uh, with the community uh, that we love and we we'll love our community and not only our current students but that this would be an opportunity to also figure out a way how we drive all our feeder school students to Mendes. So uh, if we could uh, set a time to do that, Mr. Craddock. We'll do, ma'am, you just let us know. We'll be more than happy. Okay, excellent. Um, also, um, uh, when you were talking about you have already uh, um, hired your entire staff, you said for this coming year? 100% of core teachers. 
So oh, Mr. Okay. Willis still has some support staff in the extra positions that I named as well. We factor in the extra, posi extra positions just so we have a true, honest look at all of our campuses. Okay. Well, was, is your, do you, did you hire a counselor? Because I know there, there was a counselor, but she wasn't in person. She was doing it online or I we had we started with a full time and then she relocated i think um and then we had to we had to go online the the school does have an ft allocated for a counselor have you hired counselor? yes we have okay yes, so that's a very critical partner to yeah have they um, they made that known to me how critical the counselor was many Absolutely. many times okay well that's great to know thank you because one thing i want the, the the board to recognize is that mendez roughly 230, 40 kids, we have three full-time administrators. Mm -hmm. That ratio is much different than, than your schools, I'm sure. But we, we know and we believe at Third Future that that's the level of, of leadership you need to get that instructional feedback and that mm -hmm. on-the-job coaching. One, because I, I would say in a school of this big, you probably maybe just have one administrator, maybe not even assistant principal at a school that size. Mm -hmm. But at any new school we open, we've actually changed our protocol. Now it's four. Right. No matter the size, it's going to be one principal and three assistant principals. Right. Because there's no harder job than that first year. That first year, you have to have a lot of coaching and teachers need support. But we do have a counselor, man. Well, that's great because our students need that support. Uh, the students come with a lot of a lot of issues, as you know, and uh, they have to have some someone they can also go to, right? So I'm glad to hear that you have at least one counselor. Maybe three would be good too. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that's that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Any other trustees have questions? Trustee Boswell. I um, want to share appreciation for all that you have brought and also congratulations on the promotions. So um, we will miss seeing you here um, unless around. you're coming back. I'll so thank around. you. Yes, um, yes. You're going to be traveling a lot. But yes. yeah, congratulations to both of you um, for that. Want to also really express appreciation for the extent of disaggregated data that you pre had provided. I know it's not in the presentation, but for anyone who's watching, there is a very large appendix. Uh, really, I know that's a conversation we had had in the past, and, and thank you for showing up with all of that in so many different ways, um, including by gender, um, which is something we don't do as much internally, but really appreciate all the different ways you've, you've presented it um, for people who are interested in one thing or another. Um, so I want to direct people who are watching to that appendix if they're especially interested in our emergent bilingual students, students by um, race and ethnicity, students by, you know, a bunch of other measures, special education status. Um, and, and wondering if you see patterns in that data that you especially want to flag for us while we're here together. We do. We do. So concerning to, to me mostly is the eighth grade ELA. Grade. While, while we did make gains second semester, um, it's, it's, not, it's not good enough, bottom line. Um, we, we made some instructional changes that Dr. Thurston talked about, um, but th it's, and, and we did improve, but we didn't accelerate that rate enough for those students, in my opinion. Um, I, I don't have historical map data, so I, I can't compare what that has, has been. Um, the highlight was our, our seventh grade um, ELA group, but right at two years. So we can get another year like that. We know those kids are going to be leaving Mendez and whatever high school they choose to go, they're going to be better prepared than they've ever been. So that, that's what we're really, really going to focus on. Like I said, our window just closed June 1. We have, and with fifth quarter starting Tuesday, um, we're sitting down actually next week for the fourth and, and reviewing this as a, as a core leadership team. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, that seventh grade data is um, really impressive and, and sending our kids into a really terrific future in eighth grade and what's ahead. So yeah, that was exciting to see. And thank you for breaking the other concerns down. And then um, my other question is the student discipline. If I look, um, 54 individual students um, either in in-school suspension, out-of-school suspension, or um, removal, which looks like there were nine, uh, 20 removals. Um, which I, by my mouth, is a quarter of all students. And that, again, seems high to me. And just wondering um, what your take is on that, what you're doing to address that, 
um, you know, students are out of school, they can't be learning. I know you have an unusual, you know, a different in-school suspension where everyone has a camera in the classroom, they can continue learning. Um, we've talked about that in the past. Um, but, you know, I see kind of 37% disrupting the learning environment and then some other things, drug use, fighting, disrespect to adults, and just wondering um, how you're navigating that and kind of what you hope to see next year that sure. might be different, because I know the goal is to continue reducing that. Sure, um, and so I'll, I'll just kind of talk about some things that we did this year to address that, and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Willis. And so in Third Future, we really harp on habits of success, things that students do that we know will lead to success, being on time, being respectful. Um, and we keep those high expectations. We keep those high expectations. And we know that as we enter into the first year of a, of a campus that's been struggling for years, we're really changing the culture there. And so it was important for us to maintain high expectations. Yes, these numbers are, are a little bit higher than what we wanted, but I'm proud that we kept very high expectations. Mendez was and is a safe campus. And as we move forward into next school year, I know that Mr. Willis and, and the team there is, is digging more into the things that can be done in terms of incentives, student travel, lunch on the principal, and things of that nature. And so um, I'll let him speak to that. Yeah, um, I'll just speak briefly on it. Um, yeah, we, we did, you know, try to increase some of those incentives. Um, we also got a lot of student input on, you know, things that they want. So, it's, so we're not just kind of blindly incentivizing them. Um, so I, I anticipate trying to lean on that a lot more. I, I also believe um, we got a slow start with the habit of success um, this year. So year. hitting the ground running next year. Uh, we have our morning meeting times where I kind of um, reemphasize, you know, what is our um, habit, of, habit of success that we're going to focus on for the day. So we have that time at the very beginning of the day. It happens every single day. Um, so just reemphasizing it through that as well as our um, incentive system that we could hit the ground running with much sooner next year. Fantastic, thank you for that, I appreciate it. And um, again, in, in um, response to Trustee Kaufman's point that we're all in partnership and learning from each other, I, I look forward to hearing what your students have to say because our students uh, have a lot to tell us about what they're looking for and what will work for them. So I look forward to hearing more about that as well so we can all learn from each other. So thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Boswell. Any other comments or questions? Okay, um, I do have a question. First of all, thank you. I really appreciate you all putting um, the scorecard goals just really clean so we can kind of zip through this. Um, and do you know when you are gonna receive the state data and let us know um, how, how we did on the campus rating? And I'm thinking early September, but you guys will probably know faster than I will. Okay. And then um, I just wanted to clarify again, not to you know, beat a dead horse, but the 1.6. So I'm, uh, I'm reading the slide, and it says students will demonstrate an average of 1.6 times the growth. 1.6 times the national average. So okay. the national average is one. Okay, the national average yeah. is one. Yeah. Okay. The national right. average then is one, and, and so. Okay, yeah. got it. <laughs> then that works. And then um, the last, the other question I had was about student membership. Um, so 5.1, uh, so the two, so you got, so at Mendez we have seventh and eighth grade, correct? Yes. So help me understand the two grade levels, sixth and seventh, um, that's written on the slide. Is there a misprint on the slide? It should be seventh and eighth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's okay. a misprint. Should be seventh. We would love to have sixth grade if you want to, <laughs> if you want to bring them back to us. Great, okay. So, um, the three, the goal was 305, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, your outcome was 216. How, how is the 305 derived? How was your goal derived? So that was originally, that was, I believe, in the original negotiations with um, Superintendent Elizalde and, and the board. And so my understanding, which I was not part of those conversations, that was Mike Miles and, and Michelle Moore, um, was that was originally set in the performance contract. And at that time, I believe the decision had not been made to to hold sixth grade back at our feeder elementary schools. So that was a that was set from T STEM, I believe was the was the former partner. Yeah. So that was the that was the perf, that was the goal, the metric that was set under the original performance contract prior to us knowing that sixth grade was not going to attend Mendez. Is my understanding of that? Oh. Okay. Wait, so the 305 was based on? 
I think sixth grade being in. Oh. That the enrollment when when we prior to us taking over was sixth, seventh, and eight at T STEM was not much higher than that. I want to say it was like three fifty. Now what we have tried to do is we're surrounded by seven charter schools. And so the team has done a focused and concerted effort. We put a goal and actually, I don't know how we track it, but it's just a goal. I want to recruit 10, 10 kids from each one of those charter schools mm -hmm. to bring 70 kids back next year. To bring 70 kids out of those standalone charters, back to Mendez, back to AIST. But the original goal, that, that 305 number to my knowledge, that was when we were still thinking we had sixth grade. Okay. What, is that something we should revisit then? Or so I, what I can do is um, go back revisit the, the agenda okay. item and, and work with Dr. Reach to figure out precisely what that negotiation looked like and then bring it back to the board and mm -hmm. see if an adjustment conversation is warranted. Okay. And we're, we're okay with that goal. Mm -hmm. That's okay because we're going to work hard to attain it, mm -hmm. you know, knowing that it is a stretch goal because we're missing one grade level. We're okay with that. I, I, I'm okay with that. Are you, sir? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. We're going to keep working. We are surrounded by seven mm -hmm. charter schools. Mm -hmm. We want to bring them back. We want as many kids. We, we can... We, we, we can fit more kids in Mendez Middle School. We want more students. So well, we're okay that. with that goal as long as the board and, you know, for all, oh, if we're I'm all, all okay. for it. Um, I just want to make sure that we are clear on where that 305 yeah. came from. <laughs> so it helps provide some context. But what I am interested in is knowing how many, so you currently have 216 students enrolled, correct? That was at the end of the year. So right now we have, we're over 230. We're over 230 in frontline, I believe. Can I okay. intervene? The 2021-22 taper report shows 484 students enrolled at Mendez in 21-22. 484 in 21-22, so the year prior to okay. to this year, last year. When there was a sixth grade. So T-STEMs last year. With sixth year. grade, okay. right. When, okay. they, when they had sixth grade, it was 484. Okay, that was higher than, than I recall being in there in the school. Yeah. Do you guys um, have a sense of how many students um, left Mendez during the course of this school year? About 40. 40. My understanding, yeah, my last discussion with Dr. Castro was 40 students. Okay. Had started at one point or transferred or moved out, whether okay. moved out to, whether transferred to another AISD school or actually left the district. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. got it. And then I also was interested to know if you have, if you can, and I'm glad to hear that you're fully staffed in your core courses. I was curious to know what the um, attrition rate, I know that's not one of the scorecard goals, but I was curious if you knew that. Um, of staff? Of staff. We have 47% of our teachers returning. So just, just, just under half of okay. all faculty and staff. Okay. And that doesn't account for the teachers who were promoted to different positions and things of that nature. And so not all of those are resignations or terminations. Some of those are transfers um, into other campuses in the network. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And then during the course of this year, so that's, so you have 47% of your teachers that are going to continue on next year. Do you have a sense of during the school year? Um, how many teachers stayed? How many left, like, in the middle of the school year? We could get that information. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, we'd have to break it down by teacher apprentices, learning coach. Um, we wouldn't do diet because they're, they're independent contractors. We can get that information for you. Okay. That's not a problem. Okay, cool. All right. Okay, I think those are all my questions. Staff, are there, or trustees, are there any others? Yes. I'd just like to follow up and add a little more to um, the taper data that Trustee Hoffman mentioned that um, if you break it down by grade in the taper, there were 136 in 6th grade in 21-22, 169 in 7th grade, 21-22 when those students move up, that was a total of 305 students. And if you look at the contract, um, the goal is that membership will not decrease. Okay. So that's what we're, what we're working with. So. Okay. Um, just to clarify. Then that must have been adjusted after Superintendent Elizalde then did change it. Then I was unaware of that. So, so yeah, that's what we're looking at. Oh, that's so, helpful. Okay. Yeah, it'll help now us, and it'll help us to know what we're looking for next year. Okay. One, one Thank you. Done. So the 305 <laughs> was based on just two grade levels then yes. is what I'm hearing. Okay, cool. And it was the two that moved up last year. Okay. Okay, got it. Got it. Thank you. And then we know what we're looking for next time. I would be curious to know, I don't, is there a way that we can find out where those students went? I would be curious to know if they stayed in AISD or, you know, the ones that left or if they're going to charters or what. We can, we'll have some of that information. 
Okay. And if they went private, uh, we wouldn't have that. If they went out of state, we wouldn't have that. But okay. there's certainly things we can't try. Okay, it would certainly would be good to know that. All right, uh, trustees, any other? Oh, yes, Vice President Foster. Um, yeah, just with, uh, with regards to the um, staffing, and, and this is kind of a follow-up. So having all core subjects covered for next year and being at 86% overall, great. And then as part of that conversation, the, the acknowledgement and understanding that you also had 47% leave, some to promotion, some to somewhere else. Can you just help me with, in terms of like philosophy of practice, the, the role of stability of teachers, or is, I don't want to say churn, that sounds value-laden, but is, is turnover built into the model and, well, that's okay? Or is like, no, 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 we don't like to see that 47%. That, that depends. So the answer is a yes and a no. So um, our, our goal is this, and it's different than, than, than most charter networks and districts, is 185 effective instructional days. And so we're not an underperforming teacher or a teacher who cannot provide quality instruction. We're going to coach. We're going to remediate the team. This, this team does an excellent job because I've witnessed it. Um, but we're not going to allow that person to continue instructing kids that are behind. And so is it built into the model? Those safeguards are, those coaching pieces, those conversations. We have the most rigorous interview process that I know of. Um, every teacher has a performance interview. They get their, they get to choose between three lesson objectives when they come in the door, and they get ten minutes to plan because it's about content, knowledge, and presence. Um, now, obviously, you know my job is working with directors, executive directors, and principals on on how to refine that because we talked about what do we need to do well right now, and that's hire well. And so we revised that hiring protocol to really look at seven key characteristics that research is, is, is proven works no matter what the field. Um, do we always get it right? No. Sometimes, and, and, and then life happens too. I'll be honest, there, there's an expression I call, it's called tears by Labor Day. I tell the principals, I don't want to see tears by Labor Day where you were not honest and transparent with a teacher or any staff member and they, they don't like it. So when I interview people, and these gentlemen have been in, every candidate that I'm about to offer a job, I tell them, this is going to be your hardest job in education because our standard will not lower. And you're going to get feedback every day, multiple times a day. And if they're not OK with that, then their future is not the place for them because I need 185 days of a quality person instructing the students at Mendez in all core content areas to include emergent bilingual and special ed. And so what, sometimes they don't want to do that as you all are aware as a board, they're not up to that challenge. And sometimes they can't do that. And we'll coach them and we help them. But I'm not, we're not going to allow poor quality instruction for the students at Mendez. And I hope that answers. Yeah, it does. And it, it, it raises sort of research questions for me. Like I'm, I, there's one intriguing aspect of this whole moment is, and not pitting against one another, but comparative data. And we're going to get a treasure trove of comparative data over the next you know, year or two and learn something about practices, best practices around hiring, retention, et cetera. Because there's things we do that I don't love. And I say, gosh, I wish we were a little bit like that. There's things you're doing that I'm going, I don't really understand. And then I'm saying, but there's something to learn there. And maybe you're onto something. And maybe there's something in the middle. Yes. You know, that sure. sort of thing. So I, I'm, I'm intrigued. 47% uh, uh, sounds alarming to me out the gate. But there might be a philosophy of practice around it. And it sounds like part of what you're saying is that part of the model is to, um, I don't know how to say this delicately, but the, <laughs> there's a part of the model that is going to move people along a little more quickly than traditional systems do. Correct. E example. If, if you're not ready for instruction three times in a row, we're having that conversation. Or th never forget, in a row, three times. I mean, we're, we're, we're paying very, very competitive salaries. We're going to train you up. We have a learning coach that's going to grade your papers. We have a copy clerk that's going to make all your copies. And we have LCDs that are going to provide you with all the resources. If you come unprepared to teach three days, I expect these gentlemen to have that conversation with a staff member. Additionally, the work we do at Third Future, especially here at Mendez, it's it's different type of work. It, it's not just running a school. It is turnaround work. 
Mendez has been a struggling campus for some time now, and so that's a different type of work. It, um, it takes a different type of grit, um, uh, just um, a different type of dedication, and so the work we do is different, and we do have high expectations, and so we're gonna maintain those, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue to close those achievement gaps because of the high expectations for teachers and principals. Well, thank you all for being here tonight, and thank you for, for the insights and information. I look forward to learning more. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think, any, anyone else? Last chance? All right. <laughs> thank you, really appreciate you being here. Okay. Oh. We got more stuff. <laughs> All right, yes, power through. So next we have our um, scorecard goal, um, item 7.1. And tonight we're going to be discussing scorecard goal four, which is the sixth through eighth grade end of year map reading and math. So um, this item is part of our commitment to discuss student achievement um, and really take a close look at, at how our students are doing um, and really look forward to hearing the presentation. So, Mr. Se uh, Mr. Seguda? Absolutely. I'd like to welcome Dr. Diaz, Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Academics, Dr. Angel Wilson, Interim uh, Assistant Superintendent of Secondary School Leadership, and Ms. Heather Petruzzini, a Special Assistant to the Superintendent, uh, to present tonight's uh, scorecard presentation on Goal Progress Measure 4.1 through 4.4. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Pritchini, would you like to kick us off? So, good evening, Superintendent Segura, Board of Trustees. My name is Heather Petruzzini. I'm the Special Assistant to the Superintendent. I am Dr. Susan Diaz. I am the Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Academics. Dr. Angel Wilson, Interim Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Schools. Happy to be here. We do not have a TikTok, but we did say we will We're get what we'll get one, um, get and one. we'll go viral ourselves. That's right. So what you are currently seeing on the screen is the data from our scorecard that pertains to star assessment and map growth. Our scorecard goal is related to actual performance of students experiencing poverty on state assessments at the meets grade level or above. Once we receive our state assessment data via taper, we will update the scorecard to reflect the actual percentage and provide that to the board. We currently have our map growth data and that will be the focal point of tonight's presentation. The map growth data is included in our scorecard as a progress measure to reach goal four. By comparing our map growth results in yellow to our actual target goals that are circled in blue, we understand the challenge that lies ahead of us and we remain diligent in ident identifying the students' um, solutions to effectively meet the needs of the students that we serve. Next slide, please. Okay, so take a look at the highlighted column which shows a modest increase from the MOI to the EOI in all four areas. If we look at the BOI to EOI scores, we see that our African-American students gained a ground in reading, as did our Hispanic students in regards to math. We missed our EOI targets in all four areas. We know that this is not where we need to be, and we have a plan to address this for the upcoming school year in a very systematic way. Next slide. This chart provides a high level point of comparison for student groups. In reading for our African American students experiencing poverty, 47% met their projected growth target and 43% of our Hispanic students experiencing poverty met theirs. Both student groups did not yet meet the 50% threshold, which is considered average growth. I'd also like to point out that the Department of Accountability and Assessment has added in two additional columns or categories for student groups to broaden the comparison as well for this EOI report. Those two rows are highlighted as they are included for the first time during this update. So in math, 42% of our African American students met their growth goal and 47% of our Hispanic students met their projected growth target. Both are likewise shy of the 50% target for average growth. So as you all have eloquently pointed out time and time again, sometimes this data, it is just a single piece of data. And so um, I've shown you this chart before and I wanted to bring your attention to it again. If you compare this chart to the first time that we showed it to you, um, 
in March, then you would see that our kids are actually outperforming um, everybody else in the nation. So I've bracketed off sixth through eighth grade reading and math. And again, so this is if all things were equal, every kid in the United States was taking star and they needed to be at the meets grade level. And um, the national average or the national average is the purple mark and then the orange bar is where we are. So there's lots to celebrate and compared to the nation, AISD as a whole, all things considered and all things being equal, um, we are outperforming the rest of the, the United States. So um, I'm very excited about Dr. Wilson, my new partner. And so we're re-envisioning how we support middle school campuses. Um, the reorg will allow us to hone in on, on our most historically challenged campuses and provide them the support that they need. The reduction of assessments will allow us to focus our attention and energy on MAP as our progress measure. Finally, the addition of high quality instructional materials for our el elementary schools will pay dividends for our middle schools um, as if when we strengthen the primary grades, it creates a strong, a strong foundation for all students to succeed at high levels. So um, I, and from, uh, being at the PLC coaching academies and being around the 44 campuses, um, they, they're they excited about the reduction of assessments. So I wanna um, thank the board for leading that charge because that has been um, very well received by our campuses. Okay. Um, our academic priorities are aligned to um, propel student learning in sc school year 23-24. Currently, our curriculum design team is working alongside K-8 teachers to streamline our year-at-a-glance documents, our unit planning organizers, and align resource documents. Based on teacher and administration feedback, we are also focusing our curricular work to better align dual language so the SLAR and the ELAR are tightly aligned so therefore the teachers can plan together. So anecdotally on the street, since I've been around the teachers, um, at, you know, at these trainings, um, they're very excited about that change. And in addition, our newly redesigned documents are built upon universal design principles. So we've worked really closely with MET. We've worked really closely with the SPED department to be on this journey together in sync. Um, the PLC coaching academies are rolling with 44 campuses currently participating. Administrators and their leadership teams are immersed in uh, reimagining their mission, vision, collective commitments, and goal setting. And they're really focused on the four questions of the PLC. And finally, to, sh uh, to further shore up our tier one instruction, our units will help guide teachers through the four questions of the PLC with a laser focus on question number one. Um, what do we want our students to learn? This is the teacher clarity piece of the curriculum that is center, centered on unpacking standards, sequen sequencing the unpacked standards into learning targets, which include the criteria for success. So in other words, the thinking the students will need um, to do in order to achieve the learning goal in that block of allot allotted time. Um, and as our students are moving up the rungs of learning toward the target, the daily learning target, we are checking for understanding along the way at multiple points. Um, this is how best to close learning gaps because it's actually how you can close them faster, but it's also how you can even prevent them from ever occurring. So the idea is monitoring, um, you know, some would say minute by minute, but that's a little aggressive, right? But being sure that um, we're monitoring along the way to ensure that students are moving ahead throughout the su success criteria. So this is also something that we've looked at before. So again, um, there are some people, some academics, who um, uh, don't exactly um, trust Hattie's research, but for education, for educational um, purposes, he is pretty much one of the most reliable sources out there. Some will say that he's pulled in a couple of um, 
meta-analyses that they thought shouldn't belong in his, um, in his work, but he is one of the most reliable researchers out there on um, education. So again, what he's showing, what the diagram is showing you here is basically the effect size of different things that people try in education. And so the four of the things that we are laser focused on in regards to our curriculum and the supports that we're rolling out for teachers are all in this blue area. So if it's in the blue area, that means you're, um, it, you, the, the child, the, our children, our students are gonna grow more than a year. So point, 0 0.40 is the hinge point. That's a year's worth of growth. But you can see there are other things on this chart that are way above the 0.4. So 0.4 is a year's worth of growth. So anything more than that, then you're looking at a year and a half, two years, or even three years. So I'd like to bring your attention to the things that we are focusing on, which would be um, the uh, the teacher clarity, which is part of the learning target success criteria and formative checks. Um, we're also really focusing in on the collective teacher efficacy, which is part of the PLC process. And within that PLC process, MTSS is baked into it. It's very much uh, a part of what you do as a PLC. And uh, they refer to it as RTI, but you know it's essentially the same thing. And then the other thing that we are working really closely with MET on is giving students the opportunity to engage in discourse. Um, because we want to see more um, students talking to each other, students talking to the teacher, less teacher talk, because again, all of those things have a super high effect size, and um, we're, we believe that all these strategies working together, which you know none of them are going to be overly taxing on on teachers, are um, you know the way the way that we can make gains considering uh, some of the the backslide that happened because of COVID. So this is, an ex we li link this in, um, in the presentation, and I know that um, some of you have perused it, but we're, this is a, a draft of the curriculum, the new curriculum documents. Um, again, we used uh, rigorous curriculum design training in order to inform the layout of this curriculum. Um, we're really excited about the things that it has in it. It is organized around the four questions of the PLC um, because those are the things that the teacher teams will be discussing. So we thought, well, what if we make this, we organize this curriculum in order to support those conversations that the PLCs are having on their campuses. So. Um, uh, Again, we're, uh, we have teachers working on it right now. They're at O'Henry and somewhere else. They're at two campuses across the district. And we've got, it's the teachers, the ACSs uh, working alongside each other to co-construct the curriculum documents. And um, I, I think what's gonna be great about them is they're differentiated uh, when you kind of consider them as a whole. So there's the, the the broadest one is our year at a glance, which, which is not here. Um, but so for an expert level, level teacher, a year at a glance is pretty much all a, that kind of teacher would need to go off of. I taught for a very long time, for 17 years. I would print out the year at a glance and stick it on the filing cabinet just to ensure you know I was doing what I needed to do. So that's a broad overview. But then when we get into the unit, the unit will be something a, a document that the teams can use in order to collaborate around the four questions of the PLC. And then there's still going to be the lessons and other instructional resources for our first year teachers and other supports that they may need. So in a way, the curriculum, the curriculum is differentiated based on, um, uh, on our teachers' experiences. So we're excited to share some ex exciting things that are happening. So uh, the curriculum we're excited about, um, we are really excited about what occurred in summer school. And um, this, this kind of came to us as we, we can reinvent what summer school looks like for our students, so why not have fun? Why not bring some joy into their lives? So we said, let's do a PBL summer school. So, I, and I really have to give a shout out to Dr. Gloria Williams and Josh Jun, because when I told him PBL camp, he, he kind of didn't like that. Um, he didn't like camp, um, but I, I said we have to call it something fun so kids want to go to it. And um, he 
was telling us, and I, you know, got a little misty, that he just did the exit interviews for all of the summer school principals, and every single one of the summer school principals said it was um, like a, a great experience and that every single one of them would do it again next year if called upon to do it. Um, the same was true for the teachers, and um, some of the responses he got from the principals were that the parents were super stoked about this also, that they came out, because the last thing about the, the PBL summer school um, was that at the end you have to do a public presentation, right? That's part of project-based learning. And um, so this, the campus principals, the summer school principals did a great job of rallying and bringing in people to, to watch these kids present their projects. And some of the things that Josh told me that the parents said was, I have a super shy kid, super introverted, and I can't believe that my kid got up at the end and presented in front of a bunch of strangers. Um, he also said that there were um, parents that said like, I can't, I can never get my kid to go to school. And and, and this kid was up every day, ready to go. Just um, really loved the experience. So there's, you know, some quotes there, and I'm sure if you want to know more about it, Josh has all the information. But uh, that's been a really positive thing that's going to impact. These are things that are going on right now that are impacting where we're we're wanting to head. And then again, I mean, I just have to brag on our campuses. Uh, they have been able to go to four days of the PLC Coaching Academy. They have some of the best trainers um, that we could find. We, we ensured that they had the best people in front of them because we wanted this to be the best experience. And I did get a text from one of the principals that said, this is the best PD that I have ever received. Um, and so again, there's just a lot of positive feedback. Uh, you're gonna get a board update next week that has all of the reviews from the first cohort because they finished the first the first four days the fastest but I'll keep sending you all the reviews so basically the response response from all the participants and the highest score was a five and I don't think anyone rated um, that cohort one lower than a four so just amazing feedback that we're receiving um, from the PLC coaching Academy and then finally one, one more thing of joy was um, we were able to, this took a little bit of work, but um, we were able to work with an organization to bring um, some service dogs to Martin Middle School. And the children got to read to the, the puppies and it was a very magical experience. So all of these are things to say, I, I mean, I know that that may seem like that's not that big of a deal, but there's actually research that supports that it's calming for the students and they feel less threatened when they're reading to a cat or a dog. We, the first idea was cats first, but then people were like, no, 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 not, not cats. <laughs> I, I thought the cats were a little over the top two. So we did settle on um, maybe less uh, hy uh, hypoallergenic dogs and um, but that I mean these are just the things that we're working on that we're super excited about that we're proud about the direction that we're headed. Um, we have I you know I thought about adding a piece of Ted Lasso in here but um, we believe that these things that we're doing right now are, are going to be, they're the right things, um, and they're, they're still fun things that will bring people, um, students and teachers joy, because above all, um, one of the things that I keep bragging about, what, you know, being around the PLCs and, and the campus principals, and they've got a guiding coalition with them. So they're not having to think alone. They've got, you know, four or five other folks with them. Some of them snuck in like six or seven people. Um, so I, I was like, congr congratulations for cheating, you know, because Solution Tree will count every person. But there are some bold folks that, you know, try to s sneak in an extra one or two um, folks into the training, but it, I, I'm so impressed by, and th this is a testament to the, the work that's gone on in the district before. So there was already groundwork laid for PLCs. So this is just shoring up um, maybe some holes or some things that they were um, not exactly 100% sure about. So it's been um, reaffirming, um, and I think, 
uh, again, it's just been really nice to see how happy they are. You know, I'm surprised there's so many people there because it's summer and this was not exactly the easiest year in education. So to see that we've had hundreds of people voluntarily showing up to this training is a testament to our principals, our teachers, um, some instructional coaches, because, you know, some of them brought their instructional coaches, but uh, just really, really excited. Thank you. Um, sounds like a lot of great things are happening. So I appreciate that. Thank you. So trustees, now is the time for us to ask um, questions on the current vision. Our goal tonight is monitoring and ensuring our reality matches the vision presented. So when asking questions, we should try not to, try to focus on the data presented, asking questions about who, what, why, and how. So trustees. Yes, Trustee Hunter. I have a win. No. Go ahead. <laughs> so, um, thank you guys. Um, I have a question, a comment, and then an encouragement. And I'm going to do it in the reverse order because I think the question probably will um, take longer to answer. So, an encouragement um, we see reduction in assessments. We said that last year and it was not true for all schools. Partway, a couple schools are like, no, we planned on that data, we need that data, right? Um, but the word came down and kids heard one less test, but they still wind up taking that test. So if we say reduction in assessment for Austin ISD, it doesn't matter if you live east of 35 or west of 35, there's a reduction in assessments. And I'm, I'm really wanting us to make sure that that happens. Um, the comment is, when I look at this data, one thing that I found really interesting, and uh, Dr. Wilson, you almost went there, you did pull it up and teased it out a little bit, is that when I look at every single category, and we're looking at African American, Hispanic, special, edu you know, special education, emerging bilingual, all of that, right? Everybody has a set score, but within their own population, when you go one block over, to students who are experiencing poverty, the scores plummet, mm -hmm. except for one category, which is like from a 14 to a 13, which is not good, period. So this tells me the story that our children who are experiencing poverty are struggling academically. We already know that that's happening. What are we doing about it? That's part one. How are we, what is the implementation to better serve those students, right? The last question, or the second question, this part of it is when we see that our target is, say, um, 27 and we fall 15 points short, right? But next year it's supposed to be 35. Mm -hmm. What are we doing to ensure that we get closer to that new goal? So the first question is how are we better going to serve our emergent bilingual, uh, emergent bilingual students, white students? African-American students, students receiving special education services who are experiencing poverty because they are academically not performing as well as their same population counterparts. And then when we fall short of our goal, now we're down 15 or 11, but the new goal is 10 or 15 more. How are we going to get closer to that new goal? Yes. So I will say we agree um, with your comment about if we are saying across the board that we are reducing assessments that has to happen for all schools. And in the previous school year, we know that a lot of the TIP plans inside of those plans, we had already tied that before the school year began certain assessments for progress measures and checkpoints. So we will be more cognizant of that in the 23-24 school year. Um, I will also say that we firmly believe that you cannot assess students to mastery. You have to teach them to mastery. And also, you cannot intervene your way out of an inconsistent or a not so strong first teach. So our focus next school year, and it was very evident when you look at the Stetson reports and any other diagnosis or analysis or measures like that, that we have to focus on solid tier one instruction, ensuring that we have a strong first teach. And with Susan, Dr. Diaz and I this summer, we are excited about reimagining what that looks like. 
Um, I specifically have met individually with about 50% of secondary principals so far, and I plan to meet individually with the remainder of secondary principals as we transition into the summer, hoping to end before we even move into Leadership Institute. And I will say that the answer is always in the room. And the adults within our district have the answer. The secondary principals were loud and clear. There were commonalities and trends that emerged from just the data that I collected. I feel like I was doing dissertation again. Um, just coding and looking at the data that I've collected so far with that first 50%. And this is a mix of veteran principals, novice principals, principals on the east side, west area, south area. One of the trends that emerged was um, that they would like more time to work in leveled groups. So not so much so as learning communities, but high school principals with high school principals, middle school principals with middle school principals, especially when we already have that dedicated time that we can reimagine that when we look at principals meetings for them to collaborate collaboratively with their peers and work out and tackle problems of practices and things of that nature to help strategize and to help collaborate on what works best for what they need to do in schools. Also, we are reimagining how we provide supports in academics. Principals have been loud and clear about um, a lot of teachers are new to the profession and there has to be more intentional time spent in very uh, dedicated spaces for just-in-time training or whatever it is where, principal, where teachers sit together that are in job alike, like-minded, same content area, course or prep, or same grade level, and they are able to preview curriculum units. They are able to preview the upcoming lessons and talk about the strategies, practice those strategies, get support in those areas, and that can look uh, also be reflected in PLCs as well. So it doesn't necessarily mean going into an, an academic PD session, but in professional learning communities, just more time for them to control that agenda and to talk about those best practices and what works best. And then the third trend that emerged from meeting with, so far with secondary principals, was just um, increased support and professional learning opportunities for teachers and admin and leaders. When we think about the blended learning model post-pandemic, Learning and instruction has looked totally different than when we first left pre-pandemic. And one of the things, and Trustee Hunter, you mentioned it earlier today, you said when there is joy, kids are gonna show up. And we believe that that is also true for adults too. So when we think about the joy factor um, and what's missing in classrooms, when we think about post-pandemic, there is increased screen time with the Chromebooks and there's increased screen time with students. And that's a good thing. Like I'm happy that post-pandemic, everyone has one-to-one -one technology, but it also means there needs to be increased support and training strategically on the blended learning model. It's not the same as online learning. So when we make that distinction, we also have to provide the support and resources. We've already been in talks with our professional learning team about reimagining what that professional learning experience looks like in order to best provide. And this is just from principal. So imagine talking to teachers, like we have the answers. And, and Trustee Hunter, just one um, quick follow-up. Uh, we talked about uh, you know, kind of the correlation when we when students are identified as economically disadvantaged. And you think about the budget that you are passing tonight, hopefully, mm -hmm. cross your fingers. And we think about instructional coaches, you know, in Title I, and you know, where, where, do, where do those students Wait. reside, right, in our community? Title I schools, many of them. We think about um, the weights that we have previously allocated for staffing, uh, that those have been adjusted, right? We have small schools, you know, that, don't yield you know, more than, in some cases, one teacher per grade level. But now we have a minimum of, of two, right? When we say we're gonna create a floor so that we have that collaboration at each grade level. And so I think what you're, we're doing as an organization is totally aligning so that finance, operations, human capital, all of us understand the shared commitment to support um, instruction. And so that's just another way that kind of the, the dollars are flowing the way that they need to to support this overall mission. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Tracy's any other questions? Yes, I can hear Boswell. Um, thank you for this and for the data, um, which is continues to be difficult, but also for a really rich conversation about looking for complex reasons for really complex problems and complex solutions to it. Um, greatly, greatly appreciate it. Um, I have a question about, I, I pulled um, this same report from last year to see if I could see patterns in the schools last year and who was really doing well or really struggling and whether there were 
similar patterns. And what I saw was all over the map, that there were schools that did exceptionally well last year, that have fallen behind, schools that, that have made amazing gains since last year, some who, who went way up last year, you know, this year in English and way down in math. Like, it's all, kind of all over the map. And I'm wondering if you have a sense of what we're seeing and why in that inconsistency among campuses, because we're seeing some really exciting things, a few really scary things. I would say, by and large, like reading everywhere got much better. The math is a little more inconsistent. So do you have a sense of the complexity of what we're seeing and kind of what we need to be looking for and how you take that on? So I would say that one thing for us to consider is that last year's testing calendar if everyone remembers, students took math after STAR last year, and then our, that's an extra nine weeks of instruction that students had in some of this content. That's also when we got a lot of let's talks from <laughs> students of why are you making me do this? I just finished STAR. But we gave MAP this spring, right, it was right after spring break. Um, they came back, I think it was like two days later. Last year, they had a whole additional nine weeks of instruction and so I think it really depends on were you on pace like some of that is gonna gonna impact like were you on pace um, in terms of your scope and sequence um, where, where did you start the year because we also tested a little bit later in the 21-22 school year at the beginning of the year and this year we tested Literally, I think it was the second week of school we started right, right away. It was really tight. So even the testing calendar and these nine week gaps are gonna really make a difference in how the outcomes look. And also student sort of self-efficacy of last year. Some of those campuses, like you said, it's all over the map. Like, I just finished STAR, why are you making me do this? This year also, I just came back from spring break, why are you making me do this? Um, so there's all those little factors that are gonna contrib contribute, but I actually did the same thing to see like, is. Is there a pattern here? And in some places there is a pattern. Um, like, oh, this campus, it looks almost identical. And in other places, there were like huge swings. Mm -hmm. It was all over the place. And I also do think that it has to do with the testing calendar along what, what, what Heather is saying, that we were over testing the kids. So it was three SCAs, three maps test, you know, star and then more map, you know, so it, it was, it was a lot. Um, and so I think that, you know, um, Angel and I have kind of talked about that this will allow us to focus on map. Um, and again, I, it's not an excuse, but this initiative was rolled out during a pandemic and it has passed hands many times. So we do have a plan for um, how to implement MAP with more fidelity so we can get more um, reliable data because sometimes we don't know if this is testing fatigue, is it just, um, you know, kids clicking through because of fatigue and not setting up the right environments or people, um, there's still some misconceptions about what is the purpose of this. So there, there's some, uh, some relearning that we're gonna have to do um, and we have a plan for that and we actually um, added to have some extra PD days with the MAP consultants, so that way we can reimagine how we are going to re-re-re-roll this out. But again, I think what's gonna make the, the, the data probably more consistent and more reliable than what we've seen in the past few years is going to be the, the fact that there aren't six assessments that we're asking them to do. So, you know, this will make it easier to just say you don't it's not six tests and you're not doing these tests back to back to back um, instead you know it'll be the the main focus of um, you know just how we're monitoring again it's one point it's one point of data or it's three point points of data throughout the year but um, so you know you have to be careful about what you how you look at it and how you use it but um, we we have been in talks about why the, the data has seemed inconsistent and again it's a complex problem and there's lots of factors that are adding toward towards that well and i think dr diaz one of the things that you just said is it's complex and and when you look at the data and you kind of 
you know, really try to understand like what is happening at a specific campus? You know, why did something change over the last year or 18 months? And there are multiple examples within AISD where once you begin to tug on that thread of discovery, you realize that there were multiple things that happened. You know, in some instances, you know, we had vacancies and so classes had to be combined and you had individuals, you know, subbing or doing or, or teaching in an area where they're not necessarily as strong or maybe where they should be better positioned because there's vacancies and we're making adjustments on the campus. Then you think about, you know, the various um, leaders on the campus, assistant principals, principals, you know, if they're being pulled in different directions and they're not able to support staff, then what does that look like? And why do we have so many vacancies? Did we provide the principals with the right supports to make the decisions they needed to make early in the year? So, you know, we get into the weeds of this, and I think what we often find is that it's a collective, like, ownership, like human capital, school leadership, you know, finance, like all of these things, like, have a role and ultimately impact these numbers. Um, so we're really trying to tell that story and, and really understand why each campus gets to where they are and know that all of us have a something to contribute to, to support success long term. Well, thank you for that very much, the, the real complexity about it. And, and I think when we talk about our board retreat last Monday and, and a really strong interest in leaning into more meaningful monitoring reports, this is exactly what we were talking about in that room, is really saying it's not a simple problem with a simple solution and you can't say more PLC will fix it. It's so much more than that. And, and yes, we need those systems and those best practices and we know that there are so many other things happening. Um, so I really appreciate the focus on this and it's really exciting to imagine um, what you might be able to bring to us when, when this is the thought pattern. So really deeply, deeply appreciated. Um, thank you all for that. Um, and, and thank you for the collaborative leadership about kind of realizing the answers are in the room and, and I've been hearing from middle school principals specifically when they go to secondary meetings, the focus is so much on graduation on these really profound high school needs and that's the middle school story we hear forever that it's kind of this forgotten place where the need is really so big and so different and so special. Um, so thank you for that. I think that will lead to really, I think we need to lean into our middle schools in a really big way in so many ways with mental health, with academics, with joy, with all of it. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see where that leads. Um, if puppy reading day happens again, please let me know. I would love to come. Um, it is it is a big deal. So I would love to be there. I think there may be some other trustees who might also like that. Um, I will let them name themselves. Um, and then I love the PBL camp and the joy and the parent reactions. Thank you for sharing some of that with us. I would love to see more of the responses you received. Um, but really from the parents, from the kids, the enthusiasm, thinking about how that translates into families wanting to choose our schools, into kids being excited to show up every day, all these things that we know feed into that student's success. And they, the students did say that they wished it was longer. That's amazing. That's beautiful. That's camp, right? I wish camp was longer too. Um, so I'm, I would love to know how, whether and how you plan to bring that PBL, make space for that during the school year, because I think there's a model that says we need to double block everyone and really drill down, or we can really trust what we say. We can actually do what we say, that we trust that when we have a rich learning environment, mm -hmm. the other things will follow, that we know kids need to know how to do all these things, but that strong teaching will lead to the right results. So I'd love to just hear a little bit more about the philosophy of whether and how that might make its way into the school year. So, so the great thing about this experience was it gave our teachers, they, we, of course, they got top-notch training too, so they got the Buck Institute, um, so, which is the premier trainer of project-based learning. So we made sure they had um, the best they, they possibly could have, and they um, were able to go to three Saturdays of training, and at first people were not very excited about it, but then once the kids got there and the project started rolling, um, it was a little bit different um, experience for the teachers. But the, the great thing about that is there were, those are, it's an army of teachers that now have that training. And also they have access to a bank of 
already um, pre-made uh, project-based lessons. So the, 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 the unit is already designed for them. And um, some of our specialists attended alongside them. So this was our dipping our toe into it and, and thinking about ways that we can expose more teachers to this kind of learning, experiential learning. And then also um, with our central office folks also receiving that training and thinking about how can we start adding these kind of opportunities into the curriculum, which we have done a little bit of but not on such a grand scale yet and all of this just occurred right so it just happened but those are things that um, the teachers were excited about we had mentor teachers that are excited about it and our a ACS's are excited about it and what we what the possibilities are for it in in the future and adding more of those kind of activities into the curriculum so again this was our first foray in it um, and uh, it was super positive, and so we are definitely going to look for ways to make that uh, more of a norm than an exception. Awesome. That is super exciting. So thank you. And to Trustee Hunter's point, and I think what a lot of us had talked about from the dais before, our goal is to have everyone's education be rich and ambitious and exciting and excellence everywhere and, and really hope that this is a universal, not a you get it and you don't. Um, you're allowed to not do it, that. And I want to have a shout out and some proof of concept. Travis Heights Elementary is in District 5. Um, Travis Heights is 65% students from families with economic disadvantage. It's 41% emergent bilingual students. They have an A rating. They have an A in closing the gaps. They have an A in progress. They have a B in student achievement. Um, and they move mountains to make sure that every kid in every grade has two major project-based learning experiences every year, one each semester. They have an amazing showcase where they share it with the community. Um, I got to go this spring. It was incredible. The students were presenting. It was just this incredible richness. Um, you look at that data, that's the kind of school that might lean heavily into test prep but they're leaning heavily into project-based learning and getting all the other stuff done. So I, it's really clear that it can be done um, and, and it's full of joy when it happens. So I'm so grateful um, for this and really excited to see if, if what we value and believe, if you guys can make it real and it comes back to this. So thank you. Trustee Kaufman. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to echo the positive comments and everything that's just been said. Um, I appreciate that. I also want to commit to bringing my four dogs to our next board meeting so you all can have <laughs> dog therapy while we're here. Uh, not the pig, just the four dogs. Um, so, um, but I just have two quick questions. I really don't want them answered now, but I just want to ask for materials. Um, one, I, I would really appreciate seeing what the written support or guidance plan is for teachers in middle school who are teaching students who like literally can't read, right? So what is our approach when a student, whether they're in special education or whether they're a newcomer or whatever, if they are um, such that, not that they didn't pass star, right? But that you hand them a book and they cannot sound out the words, that type of can't read, right? And that's one challenge. We've kind of conflated those two, that not passing a high level end of course exam on English two means you can't read. And that's the same as you pick up a book and you can't, you're illiterate. Like, so there's, I would like to just make sure that we, I would like to know what our plan is that we're implementing in middle school for supporting teachers to create success for students who can't decode text. Um, and then the other thing I'd like to request, since it's not really pertaining to this because it's elementary, but I would love, I appreciate the unit planning organizer that you'd share with us on the board um, update and also that you shared in this packet. But I would love to see the combined for dual language that has the, the um, unit planning organizer for dual language showing both the English unit and the Spanish unit and the parallel, right? So I, I'd like to see those parallels that you were saying that's, uh, that are allowing teachers to plan together, particularly in for this third grade, the third grade one. Absolutely, Great. and thank um, you. So part of it is that they're it's still currently writing those units. Yes. So the reason I included that one in there was because it was one of the most fleshed out ones. It was kind of a prototype nice. that we worked with in the central office just to play around and make right. sure but, that it worked. Okay, and 
um, which is part of my concern because if the prototype that's been fleshed out and developed is the English version, then that suggests to me that we're not planning carefully for dual language first and then we're working backwards to ensure that it's working for English, but that we perhaps are still planning first for English and then handing it to bilingual teachers to say, please translate this. So that's why I'd really like to see the fleshed out protocol also, just so I can just understand how that's playing out. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Yes, Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, I'll bring my dogs, I guess, too, just because everybody's talking about it. Um, so I, I, I had a, a couple of comments, and then I, I wanted to ask some questions. I wanted to thank Dr. Wilson for talking about PD uh, being joyful, because I have definitely been to some that are not. <laughs> and, and I think that absolutely, like, I, I taught middle school, and it's, you have to get them up and moving, because they just go crazy if they sit for a very long time. And I would go to tons of PDs for adults where we were being instructed on tactics, your tools to use with, with middle school children, but they were not being used on us and people were nodding off. And I, I think that they should be modeling all the time. And so I, I agree with that. Um, I, I do also um, appreciate the, the emphasis on, on the learning being blended, like truly blended. Um, and, and I do think that that, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to turn to that. I'm going to back up one thing really quickly. Um, I also really liked the, the discussion around PBL. During the pandemic, I, I taught it lively and under Dr. Holiday. And one of the things that she did that I really, really liked was during, you know, hybrid teaching, she used our Fridays as a PBL day, and she it was it was it took a ton of work to do it. But students that needed intervention were given opportunities for intervention for half of the day on Friday, and the other half of the day, based on their choice, sorry, they were put into um, a content area where they could engage in a content specific PBL, and it took a ton of intentionality, like a ton. And she had to constantly, I'm sure, and her admin team find where students were at to be able to give an updated schedule every single Friday. That, that, that was a lot of work, but kids loved it. They were the ones that were there in person with us doing the PBLs. They, they loved Fridays. Like it was their favorite day of the week, understandably, because they had all that time as middle schoolers to get up, to move, to engage in content that they themselves had selected. So building that into the normal instructional day, I think is wonderful. It, to, in, Hopefully we can do that. I, I did want to um, go back to what I said about blended learning and it, and it being truly blended and just to emphasize the amount of time that it takes to plan instruction like that, to find materials, teaching again through online learning, I became a web designer temporarily because I had to learn how to code and put it onto the blend page and then it's too much, right? But but they, it takes a lot of work. And so when I when I look at the the unit plan that you provided in the board update, I I know that as an experienced teacher, and I'm sure Dr. Diaz, as you were as someone of 17 years, you can take that and very quickly start to envision instructional materials that kids will use that are in line with the directions that are in that plan. But my concern is, are those materials going to be provided along with this unit plan? Or is the expectation that the unit plan then goes to like a PLC at a campus and then they reference that and then build out the instructional materials themselves? Because when I think back, when I first started teaching in the district, my PLC had a teacher that had been teaching for 46 years and a couple that had been teaching for 20 something years and that was just my PLC in my department. So there were years of experience. But if I think about that same department now, the most experienced teacher has been teaching for five years. And so the process to go from a unit plan to then bringing all of those instructional materials to life, it's, it's a lot more difficult. And so when I think about the number of first year teachers that are going to be entering next year um, and how they would use this unit plan and turn it into instruction, um, I'm concerned with getting from what I see before me 
point A to then point B into the classroom in front of children. Mm -hmm. So could you elaborate on that? So yes, I can. Um, so again, there are three levels to the correct curriculum. The first one is gonna be the year, uh, the year at a glance. The second one is the unit that you're looking at. But then the next piece of it, the next layer, is going to be lesson level resources. So there's going to be three documents that are interwoven together. So again, the idea is if you've got a PLC that's got somebody with 48 years of experience in 28 years, um, they may just need the unit to go off of and pull resources um, that they've used in the past. But if they're not at that level, then there's one level deeper in the curriculum for them to go to that will be aligned to the resources and, and have lessons for them to um, modify or use as is. Oh, and sorry. also we know, you, I know that any kind of curriculum document can be obtuse. That's why it was very important for us to have teachers the, uh, doing this work alongside us instead of something that we just invent and then surprise here's a new curriculum every year so we knew that we needed to have the teachers alongside us because I have worked with many different type of curriculum and um, if you don't understand how it was designed then you might have the propensity to turn away from it so we it was very important for us to involve teachers because we see the teachers as being part of the co-construction of the resources but also the ambassadors that will be able to go back to the campus and explain all of the elements and what can be done with each section of the the curriculum documents I thank you I appreciate the explanation of how the materials them skill, themselves are scaffolded um, for for teachers. That was exactly um, my concern. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other trustees have questions or comments? Oh, yes, Trustee Sabata. Thank you for your presentation and everyone's comments. Um, so I guess my question is, and. <clears throat> I know there's a lot of work our staff do to prepare for our students' success, but how, how do they communicate with parents to help them reinforce what the expectation is of what, you know, for the students so that parents can help? Uh, because that's, I think that's a piece that's missing, that we give students things I remember back in the days when we, all those students would get a planner, right? The teacher would write the assignments on there and that's the way we were able, I would have my kids read me every day what their teacher wrote, um, everything. And then I'd have my husband review and make sure they told me everything, you know? But there was a way to communicate and, um, and know what was going on. <clears throat> and. I knew what I needed to do to make sure that they did their homework and that they needed this or that. So how, how are, where is the, the piece to communicate to parents for reinforcement? Because I think that's very important to this work. So I can speak to the fact that, you know, having recently come off a campus, people were still using planners. People are still having students write down, here's what the assignment is. I think the challenge there is out of the pandemic came some good and also came some struggles. And so with everybody putting everything up on Blend, our learning management system, for a while, many teachers moved away from that because it's in Blend and parents can log into Blend and see it there. That's one of those practices that we some, some people unintentionally abandon and others have brought back the planners. Others have said, I'll take a screenshot of what's in Blend for the week and send it out in my weekly email or my paper newsletter, whatever it is. But I think that is a pain point. I know as a mom who you know, may or may not have someone who's going to tell me what he's actually learning at school, I have to go in there and hunt and peck and see, like, is this what you're doing? And that's not what you told me you're doing. Um, so I don't think you know what's actually going on in the class. So I think that is something that 
I also want to give campuses the freedom to do what works for them mm -hmm. and teachers the freedom to do what works for them. Because whenever we say it has to be this way, there's a teacher who's like, but I found this great other way and it really works for me and I get really good results for it. And a principal who says, I've learned in my community, this is the best way. We have to send paper newsletters. Paper newsletters really work here. Um, so this, a lot of that is campus specific and teacher specific, but I think as a trend, we got away from this idea of everybody's writing in a planner um, just because it was the pandemic and we didn't hand out planners because it was one more thing we were going to touch and disinfect. Mm -hmm. No, uh, freedom is good. We want them <laughs> to be able to have that freedom, but just to have that expectation of accountability that there is a, a, some form of, of communication with the parent. Uh, for example, uh, for many years we would get the test scores. Well, I didn't know what the test scores meant, you know, but I just looked for the A's and the B's. And, uh, and so when we started learning about the test scores and how even though my daughter was doing straight A's, she was a whole year behind. So, you know, so we don't know that. And so even if we get the information in writing, it doesn't mean that we interpret it correctly. And so, and especially if we're looking at moving the numbers up and with students in poverty, that's the people we need to be able to take time and do some workshops. And you know, that's what it took for us to have a workshop on how to understand the test scores. What's the difference? with the A's and the B's and the test scores from, from the state. You know, we're not taught that. Um, we're just asked for fundraisings, you know? Or let's raise some more money and more money. But <clears throat> it's important to engage the parent early so that they know instead of after the fact when they get the report card and say, why did my child get an F? How come nobody told me? Because I hear it so much, you know? Blend is good, but it's, I'm still not technology savvy, and I won't be. It's too late for me, you know? So uh, I can only do YouTube, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but it, that's reality, you know? Um, it's just really difficult, and so I just w want to be bring some attention to that. <clears throat> also, um, how, uh, how also, what other supports are, are you working with internally that, that is there for them after school? Because um, part of what we learned during that process is a lot of kids just went home and sat down and watched TV because there's no money to do anything. And so that's where we created Primetime to be an enrichment opportunity, not tutoring, but something they always dreamed of doing and they would love, and then they love coming to school because of that after school program. And it was tied to your reading or math or whatever the goal of that campus. So it has to be holistic, you know, and, and extended for the population we're talking about because they don't get it. We we don't get it in the classroom. We'll get it. We'll get it. Probably playing basketball, learning the distance shots, you know, and the measurement of the court and all that. And then they understand math is important, and started getting more attention to math and reading and those kinds of things. So, um, so I just wanted to ask you if that's how what you're thinking around that in the extended learning day. I think um, so. That I think that you've given me a great idea, um, and it's one of them. Well, actually, you gave, gave me a couple of great ideas. Um, one of them would be the idea that maybe we can work with our fam family support specialist and uh, our other parent support specialist because we have different kind of incarnations of them throughout the district um, in, in regards to uh, maybe giving them some information about the curriculum, giving them information about how to read assessment data, um, giving them some tools to advocate for 
um, their students. Uh, so I, I love that suggestion, and um, Dr. Wilson and I can work. You know, again, this is a whole system of people mm -hmm. working together. Mm -hmm. And um, so working on prime time would be another connection with Dr. Williams, but definitely something that we can explore mm -hmm. our enrichment activities for after school. Mm -hmm. Uh, absolutely. And uh, in talking with Councilmember Fuentes, those are the kind of things they're starting to look at, too, because I've been visiting uh, after school programs and they're good programs, but I don't uh, I don't know how they're linked to some of the things that we're talking about in our scorecards. And I think they could be and should be and can be very uh, effective. You know, it's fun just to do, because I remember when I was doing prime time at uh, Aikens High School, I organized it, and I had 160 kids. Everybody thought it was impossible. Nobody wants to stay after school in high school. Uh, but everybody was into anime art. And I had 60 kids in that one class. You know, so there's ways to bring them and just get, got you know, that, that whole group just got really close and they did all kinds of stuff together with Anime Art. So, uh, so I think this can really inspire a lot of our kids to get deeper and to own their education where we begin to connect uh, some of the programs that we have available to us. Um, and then I just want to give a shout out to Karina Noriega. She is the director of the Victory Tutoring Program who last year uh, brought the, the dogs program to our summer job program. That so was our dog our hookup. She's a good friend of mine from the Valley. <laughs> yes. She's one of my best friends. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, and then she brought it to our backpack big kickoff for AISD. <laughs> but that is so working because so many of our kids just need, they love dogs, you know, and, and, and if it, they want to read, they're going to learn to read to their dog, you know. Forget reading to mom, they want to read to their dog. And so whatever works, you know, we got to meet them where they are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, trustees, in the interest of time, I'm just going to, if you okay, if Do we you move on? Thank Do you. you. <laughs> so thank you all very thank much. You. Great presentation. So uh, before we vote on the consent agenda, um, the board, and I'm really sorry to all the people that are here waiting, uh, but the board will convene briefly in executive session uh, to discuss one of the agenda items. Council, do I need to name which agenda item it is? Okay. And um, this is pursuant to Texas Government Code Sections 551.074 and 551.071. So thank you, and we'll be back um, as quickly as we can. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back. We are back in open session at 11.57 p.m. So we will now move to the consent agenda. Before we move forward, I would like to announce that the administration added three separate consent agenda items that were not part of the information session. These are 11.16 through 11.18 um, board resolutions to accept grants from the Office of the Governor. These were added as updated guidance from the Office of the Governor, necess um, necessitated the board including these as individual approval items to allow AISD to submit grant applications. So the administration requests to remove um, and not vote on two consent agenda items, items 13.5, proposed termination of professional employees during a probationary contract, and item 13.6, proposed termination of, pro of professional employees during a term contract. The items are not necessary as we no longer have proposed terminations. Uh, so, uh, Trustee Whitley Chu, do you have an item you wish to pull and discuss for separate vote? Uh, yes, I'd like to pull item 11.4. Okay, great. Um, trustees, are there any other consent items anyone would like to pull for a separate vote? Yes. Yes. Item 15.4. Okay, 15.4. Okay, cool. All right, so. It's already, oh, was there? Oh, it's, it's, already, it's already a separate vote. Oh, yeah. Was it You're right. 15.4. Yes. Oh, okay. 15.1. Yes. And 15.1 is already pulled. So Thank you. we're good. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay, so. We only have one that hadn't already been uh, scheduled for a separate vote, and that's 11.4. So let's see, Secretary Boswell, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Yes, I move to approve items 9.1 to 9.3, item 10.1, items 11.1 to 11.3, item 11.5 to 11.18, Item 12.1 through 12.2, item 13.1 through 13.4, and items 14.1 through 14.2. Okay, great. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, so uh, is there any discussion on any of the consent items? I have a, a question on 1116 and 1117. You can ask. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on uh, 1116, only the um, resolution was available in our packet. Are there any contingencies in the grant that AISDPD would be obligated to? Can, can you, what, you, when you say contingencies, like additional costs that might be incurred? No. If, is there anything that AISD Police Department would be required to do if they were called? There's not a contingency that says if called upon, you would come and... Like they couldn't be seconded or anything like that. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So one of the things that we did is we worked with Chief Sneed, uh, as well as Michelle Wallace, to identify any constraints around the grant. Um, it, it's really truly to provide that resource at the expense of the governor's office. Okay. Excellent. Uh, thank you. And then on um, the truancy prevention program, are these funds dedicated for specific prevention initiatives, or could they be used to hire um, graduation coaches? Um, the current plan is that it would support six campus-based case managers that will identify and support 450 chronically absent students. Okay, so then it's dedicated? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so um, having a motion by Secretary Boswell and a second by Trustee Sabata to approve consent items. 9.1 through 9.3, 10.1, 11.1 .1 through 11.3, 11.5 through 11.18, uh, 12.1 through 12.2, 13.1 and to 13.4, and 14.1 through 14.2. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And I don't know if we still have Trustee Lugo on. Do you know? Okay. All right. So we will now move to those items that um, have been pulled for from the agenda. And uh, we only had one of those. Uh, and that was 
four related to the Family Resource Centers. Um, Secretary Boswell, do we have a motion? Um, is there anyone or, who would like to make a motion? Yeah, anyone yeah. would like to make a motion on 11.4? I know we've considered. For purposes of moving us along, uh, yeah. I move for the acceptance of 11.4. Okay. okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, so having a motion by uh, Vice President Foster and a second by uh, Trustee Zapata to approve 11.4. Um, is there any discussion? Um, yes, Trustee Kaufman. Uh, well, I just want to be clear that the rec uh, there were a lot of comments that said a lot of different things. I just want to be clear that what the item states is that the Board of Trustees approve Austin Voices for Education and Youth and Communities and Schools as independent vendors to operate and support Austin ISD Family Resource Centers. Am I correct in that it does not in here state that that a contract will be given to either one or the other or both. It says that we are authorizing them both as vendors. Is that correct? Or is there something in here saying that we are voting to actually give a contract and fund one organization? So the, the intent of the agenda item is for, for the administration to enter into negotiations with both vendors to support family resource centers. Uh, one of the things that I always caution the board when uh, not cautioning the board, but as part of practice, uh, in any contract, you know, there could be the instance where the negotiation doesn't finalize. Uh, this happens from time to time. So the, I don't want to make the presumption that we will get to a contract because it takes both sides to negotiate. Um, but this is to enter into negotiations, but the intent would be to enter negotiations with both parties and to have both parties support family resource centers. Um, so I would just note that I, based upon my own reading and based on the calls that we received, I do have many concerns just around how this particular RFP played out, both with how it was written and how the, um, you know, some confusion around some of the scoring. Um, so I would just want to just note that I have concerns about the process that was followed here. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Uh, Trustee Whitley Chu. Um, yes, yeah, so yeah, I also want to echo your uh, Trustee Kaufman's concerns about some of the scoring and you know also looking at so when we're looking at our vendor um, capabilities, you know we have a vendor who has been doing this work in our community for years and years. And we have another vendor who's been also doing great work in our schools who I've had the opportunity to work um, with CIS when I was at Pierce and, and our kids love them and, and the staff love them as well. They did you know great job working with our students. Um, we have you know Austin voices that have been in these schools and built community and built relationships with our community that's long lasting that sort of, you know I, I am concerned about, a quick switch um, at the beginning of the school year or even like how that would affect our schools, our community. And, you know, that doesn't, with the, a partner who's a wonderful partner but doesn't have that particular experience. Um, so, you know, here, you know, we have like the option of voting yes or voting no on this item. Um, so I'd like to hear about what considerations will be made with um, what services and who's providing services to our schools next year if we approve both of these vendors. Christine, we're, we're okay so far? I mean, it, I think you can speak to just the process and what, what happens it kind of like what you were speaking to with regard to Trustee Kaufman's question is, is what will be the next steps? Okay. So, um, Trustee Whitley Chu, uh, you know, what will occur moving forward is I'll reach out to both vendors. Um, I myself, the superintendent's office, will do this. 
Uh, we will develop a negotiation schedule. Um, our, our goal, as, as it needs to be, is to um, arrive at a, a agreed an agreement um, sooner than later, right? We want to make sure that our, um, our school communities are supported uh, when they start the school year and certainly recognize that any disruption uh, is an impact and we want to minimize that and plan around that if it occurs. Uh, so what we will do is develop a negotiation schedule. I'll meet with both of the, the parties, both of the vendors, um, have conversations around um, you know, the elements of the proposal, uh, the alignment with our school needs, understand uh, where the opportunities exist for a collaborative partnership um, for not only this year but future years, and then um, begin the negotiation. Uh, so that process will be collaborative. Uh, my hope is that it, it is an expedited process um, and, and the superintendent's office will be overseeing it. Trustees, any other questions or comments? I have a comment and then a question. Um, understanding that when we're expending public funds, we need to have a, a routine process to go through to, to reconsider um, partnerships and vendors and make sure that we're using the funds. This, this process exists for a reason. Um, that we also know there are disruptions when longstanding relationships are disrupted. I think we saw that with the Vita Clinic that we still haven't bounced back from as a, a recent example. Um, and that when we have these processes, we need to be able to trust really clearly that the processes have been properly implemented, that they meet, you know, that the it matches the criteria that were put out in our RFPs. And I think um, there are some concerns. So I think um, my question is, if we were to vote no, would that jeopardize services that our families and students have come to rely on? Kind of what, at this point in the year, when plans are being made for August 14th, and, and even before, kind of what position does that put our families and our students in? Yes, Trustee Boswell. Um, so uh, there would be a disruption. You know, we would, um, you know, our standard process has been that we bring, uh, you know, agenda items and contracts to the board for approval that would allow us to enter into negotiations. Um, and so because of that, there hasn't been contact with any of the vendors, you know, up until this point. Um, you know, but I, I also acknowledge that, uh, you know, we have to do our best about limiting any um, disruptions as we move forward. Uh, a no vote essentially would either require us to go back and recompete um, and, you know, traditionally that's a 60-day time frame from market to board. And when I say market, I mean releasing the RFP into the, into the, the market. Um, and that would obviously move into the school year. So that would be an area of concern. Uh, and we'd want to limit that. Um, and there may be ways to um, kind of mitigate that. But that would be the, the first step, would be essentially re going back to the proposal process. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions from trustees, comments? Oh, Trustee Hunter. Okay. Sure. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Trustee Kaufman for reading and, and kind of recentering us, and uh, thank Trustee Boswell for reminding us why we sit here in, at midnight. Um, thinking about these sorts of issues. Um, I've had to make a leap from advocate to board member. And advocacy, you always want to serve, you always want to fix, you always want to do those things. I'm bound by the state of Texas to do only so much. That is the hardest thing for me to do. And in this particular item, I've volunteered, I've served, I've worked with, with all these groups and so I have a heart to want to serve, right? But what I'm called to do tonight is to turn it over to our administration so that they can do their work. And so when I speak with my advocacy friends and they're like, well, why can't you, why can't you? And I think that's something I really want to help um, our community understand more is though I have, we have some sway in certain situations. We are limited in what we can and can't do. We are not all powerful. I wish that were the case, 
because then I can make money rain, right? We could do those sorts of things. We can't do that. So thank you again, Trustee Kaufman, for um, reminding us what we're supposed to be doing. And at the end of the day, our goal is to serve families and to serve children. And in this instance, that's turning over negotiations to our administration. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Hunter. Uh, Vice President Foster. Sure, I just wanted to, um, in, in advance of all of our future conversations, um, really just acknowledge uh, the, the deep respect for communities and schools and the deep respect for Austin Voices in Education and Youth. I, I bet, I'd be willing to almost bet money that there's not a person on the dais that hasn't personally worked with, volunteered with, been in service to, and, and been empowered to, been, been, been put in a position to do great things because of the existence of these two um, organizations. I mean, my relation, I mean, I've sat on strategic planning for probably both of them. At the, I mean, I've, we were deeply involved in, the, in these uh, organizations, and there's much love and much respect. And however things turn out tonight, um, we have some work to do in terms of correcting our processes, tightening ourselves up. We've kind of, it, it hasn't gone smoothly. And the most disconcerting point of the evening for me was any hint of, well, this organization, well, that organization, which overwhelmingly public commenters did not go there. People offering public comment passionately said, this is why I think it should be like this. And there was very little of it's because they're not as good as us. But we invited that. And the community didn't take the bait. They wanted to stay ethically above board in preservation of our community. So I'm, I'm so proud of the, the public commenters and the way they brought really important points to the fore, but did it in a way that was fully gracious. So. We have some work to do on our side. One of the things that I've been doing is looking at policy, and for us, we have CHE Local, which says where our room is. And what I've now learned is that we have standard operating procedures around talking to vendors that aren't aligned with our policy, which is to say policy says you can't talk. Vendors and folks can't talk except in certain conditions. And included in the certain conditions are negotiation over the scope of work, um, clarification, uh, evaluation of bidder's proposal, engaging contract negotiations. So there was actually room for conversations to be had two weeks ago when this first came up as an information session item. But our, the, the, our regs, our standard rating operating procedure wasn't in alignment. Now, we're talking about thousands of pages worth of documentation, so it's hard to find what's not in alignment until you find what's not in alignment. We have now found something not in alignment. So from a policy committee standpoint, uh, we have work to do. Um, I guess I just, so I just wanted to make clear our love for these organizations and make clear uh, how proud I am of the community and then make clear that we have work to do, however this vote turns out. Thank you, Trustee Foster. Anyone else? Um, so, did you have a comment? Yeah. Okay. I, I, sorry to speak again, but I just wanted to echo the appreciation for the organizations. I also want to just echo the appreciation for all the speakers tonight, especially those who have been um, both lifted up by the organizations and also those who have been serving the organizations. Um, it's great when we see our parents involved and and becoming, you know, parents being served and then developing servants servanthood for others and so i think it's just a really powerful thing but i just want to echo again the importance that i personally and i believe i my colleagues on the dais agree that our partnerships our community partnerships are are extremely important to us and very valuable and i think that along with many other areas where our district has to continue to to self-examine where we've broken trust or where we've lost trust is to recognize that we have community organizations in this community who we have broken trust with in the past and to think of that as we pursue things like this to recognize that um, that just like the trust with our students and the trust with our employees and the trust with our families that the trust with our community partners is really essential so I just you know I like I'd like to think that we're going to move forward however we do this um, 
with an eye towards really honoring and valuing that and fixing any kind of broken trust that we have. But thank you, CIS. Thank you, Awesome Voices. And thank you, everybody who spoke tonight. All right. Thank you. Um, and I just want to double. Oh, go ahead. I also want to acknowledge the role of our city and county in sharing this work with us, that, that the success of our students is the success of our community and that, that in addition to all of our community partners, this is one of many places where our other local governments lean in with us. So, um, I see Trustee Lugo on the screen, but I just want to double check. Trustee Lugo, are you there? And did you have a comment? No? Okay. Maybe it's just residual. residual. Um, so I, I'll make a, a comment. Did, Trustee Sabata, did you have a comment? You're looking. Okay, <laughs> just making sure. So this was actually one of this is actually one of the more difficult votes, I think, and I wasn't expecting that. Um, and I think, in my mind, first of all, I am. I think there really do need to be some more clarity in um, in the actual RFPs because some of the terms can be interpreted different ways. And we, and so I understand um, some of the questions and comments that we heard today from people about, um, ex, you know, and I've heard over the past couple of days about experience in the development of an FRC. And, um, and so I'm, I'm a little bit hung up on that part of this. Um, at the same time, I have to really think about my vote is not like for this organization or that organization, it's for the kids. And at the end of the day, um, I think that's what my vote is gonna reflect. And I just, you know, I have confidence that the administration is not gonna interrupt work that has been successful. Um, you know, however this vote turns out tonight, but we wanna continue building on um, and what we, uh, what we have in our schools. And both of these organizations had have done so much for our community, especially through COVID, and I just appreciate it deeply. And um, so that's my comment there. So at this point, um, I'm sorry. Okay, go I ahead. Another, um, I just, I, I want to address other concerns that were brought up by people. And so I just wanted to verify with uh, mm -hmm. Superintendent Segura that, that through the process, despite whatever flaws there may have been in the process, that um, that we're confident that there were no conflicts of interest that entered into this, either perceived or actual, that would have interfered with a, a, a um, fair and balanced choice. So I know how I feel about it. I guess I wanted Christina. I just, it's okay. I don't think we need to name any. I just want to just confirmation that we have, you know, that you have considered all of the various possibilities of conflict of interest and that you're confident that the right people are making the decisions that wouldn't then create that perception that there may have been a conflict? So, uh, Trustee Kaufman, I take conflict of interest um, very seriously. I, I will tell you that after reviewing the documents, I feel confident um, that that wasn't introduced in this process. Uh, but I do agree that there are many areas for improvement in the process, uh, and, and we will address those moving forward. Thank you. And then I just want to clarify that if I were to vote yes on this, that I'm not necessarily saying that any funding is going to go to either one, that it's just like some of the other things that we've recently approved, where we approved 15 different vendors and the administration chose three to purchase materials from. And so by selecting these two, we're still creating space for the administration to make a decision about what's the, based on negotiations of what the best approach is to Create, to maintain these FRCs with the available people. That's correct. Okay, so we're giving you the flexibility to do that. The authorization yes. to negotiate, correct, mm -hmm. based on the needs of the campuses and mm -hmm. our students. Okay, so we're not guaranteeing either all or nothing goes to either, like that's going to be, there's a variety of outcomes. It could, all, they could be one vendor, could be two, or it could be the other vendor. That's. We're not voting to say any of those options. Right now, no, no trustee. We're, 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 Y'all are voting to allow the administration to enter into negotiations with two vendors uh, for these services. Thank you. Okay. 
We're ready to vote. <laughs> okay. Uh, having a motion by Trustee Foster and a second by, I think it was Trustee Zapata, is that correct? Um, to approve item 11.4. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Six, seven. Okay. Um, all those opposed? Okay. So um, the motion passes with seven um, approving uh, and one opposing. So the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to move on to, yes, thank you, <laughs> the next item that was uh, pulled from the, or uh, hold on, let me go back to my script here. I'm just gonna look at your script. What do I do? Oh. Okay, <laughs> tell me where we are. Um. I'll find it, I'll find it, don't worry. Sorry, we have lots of paper up here. Yes, I think we're right here on number 15. Here. Number 15, Page 21. yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, apologies for that. So, Secretary Boswell, uh, do we have a motion to approve items 15.1 and 15.2? Yes, I move to approve item 15.1, approval of an interlocal agreement between the University of Texas at Austin and Austin ISD for district access to national interest networks and 15.2 memorandum of understanding between Austin ISD and the University of Texas principal residency program. Thank you. And I just wanted to say that it was the national intranet um, networks. Oh, intranet, yeah. not interest. <laughs> for Thank sure. You. No worries. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. So, trustees, is there any discussion on any of these items? Okay. So, having a motion by Secretary Boswell and a second by Trustee Zapata to approve item 15.1 and 15.2. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Okay. Um, those opposed? Those abstaining? Okay, we have two abstentions, um, Trustee Kaufman and uh, Trustee Foster abstaining, but the motion does pass. Secretary Boswell, uh, do we have a motion to approve items 15.3 and 15.4? In a minute, yes, we will. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I move to approve item 15.3, approval of an interlocal agreement between Austin Community College and Austin ISD for Federal Work Study Student Employment Program, benefiting AVID students at Austin ISD and 15.4, MOU with Austin Community College Teacher Residency Partnership. Is there a second? Second. All right. Trustees, is there any discussion on any of these items? All right. Having a motion by Secretary Boswell and a second by Trustee Zapata to approve items 15.3 and 15.4. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Those opposed? Anyone abstaining? Okay, we have one abstention. Trustee Hunter. Uh, but the motion passes. Items for separate vote. Um, Secretary Boswell, do we have a motion to approve 16.1? Yes, I move that the Board of Trustees adopt the fiscal year 2024 budget as presented in the attachment to the agenda item, which includes approval of general fund expenditures totaling $1.82 billion food service fund expenditures totaling $45.5 million, debt service fund expenditures totaling $236.5 million, and an appropriation of approximately $53 million from the general fund's fund balance, including $19.6 million offset by ESSER, reserves to cover anticipated shortfalls due to proposed budget investments. The district also acknowledges that the state of Texas may hold upcoming special legislative sessions that could require an amendment to our budget and expenditures, and during the fall that those changes may be accounted for in this budget or may necessi uh, necessitate an amendment. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> okay. Was that Trustee Kaufman? Okay, mm -hmm. great. Okay, so um, just trustees, is there any discussion on this item? Yes, Trustee Zapata. Okay. 
As, um, <coughs> as uh, we heard earlier in um, testimonies um, about the need for our um, athletic trainers, um, it's, and it's so critical for our schools to start with them. Um, you know, it's been, some of our schools have had challenges getting students interested, and there's been an effort to really get more students to participate. But, and then on the other side, we're saying, well, we want them to participate, but we're not gonna protect them. Um, so I am really, really would like us to see about that 3% cost that was shared earlier, and we could reallocate that for hiring of some more trainers for our campuses. If we can make that amendment. So are you, um, are you making a motion or? Well, I guess I'll need to make it in a motion, yes. I would like to make a motion to make that uh, change from uh, the, uh, what was it called? The, uh, the funding, I'm gonna the compensation you for just funds. A second, okay. Because I believe our board okay. council has something to say. Okay. So, so you have a motion on the table to approve the agenda, to, you know, with the caveat that was explained. And so if you would like to make a motion to, uh, amend that motion to approve the budget with this additional caveat, and I'll probably need you to restate it. Um, so you can make a motion to amend the current motion, right? So if that's what you want okay. to do. Yes. And you just, just, just say how you would like to amend the current motion. Okay. I would like to make a motion to amend the motion to uh, to um, re to reallocate the three percent compensation staff. I don't know how else to identify that population, but the ones that are getting the three percent uh, to to reallocate those t funds to be able to hire more of the athletic trainers for our, for our campuses. Is that correct? That, if that's what you want your motion to be, then yeah, it's okay. correct. And okay. then you just need a, a second, uh, and then you, you'll, the board will take a vote on whether to amend the motion as you described. Okay. Okay. And, and you may need dis discussion on it you know, if you, if you choose. Okay. So thank you, Trustee Zapata, for raising that. Um, so Trustee Zapata has made a motion to amend the current motion to, um, to not give the 3% raise to that. AP uh, 13s and above. AP 13s and above, and instead reallocate those <coughs> funds to um, fund more athletic trainers. Is that correct? Okay, so is there uh, is there a second? Can, oh. or, excuse me, President. Are Go we ahead. allowed to have discussion about this before we vote on the, the whether yeah. or not the motion is seconded, or do we have to have the the, mo the vote for the second first and then we discuss? I think you need a second yeah, before you, you engage in discussion. Okay. okay, then I second. Okay, great. So we have a motion by Trustee Zapata, a second by Trustee Gonzalez. Is there discussion? Uh, yeah, did you have a, qu a question? Uh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm no, sorry. go for it. No, no, no. Um, I just need to clarify again. I, I rem it was a long time ago. It's around 9 o'clock. Um, <laughs> this is one of those six in one hand, half a dozen in there. Did you say that this group did not receive a raise last year? Correct. Thank you. Okay. Trustee Gonzalez? So, our. To Clarify, I guess, what Trustee Sabata is asking about. We're ask, Trustee Sabata is asking to delay the raises for the three percent raise for P thirteen, as though the hiring of the athletic trainers was going to be delayed. Is that what we're we're saying? That I know that the yes. dollar amount of those two yes. 
or is not equivalent. Correct. But it's my understanding that Trustee Zapata is asking if rather than delaying the hiring of athletic trainers, we delay the 3% yes. raise and instead go ahead with the hiring of the athletic trainers. Is that what I'm understanding, Trustee Zapata? Yes. That's correct? Thank okay. you. And so there, could, oh, go ahead. Could the administration talk about the feasibility of that? So um, my first thought on this is that they're not equal amounts. And so um, if this were to be explored, we have to identify, you know, of the $200,000 plus or minus, um, how many of the six remaining um, uh, trainers would you be able to fund? It wouldn't be all of them. It'd be two, maybe three. I'd have to get the final numbers from, from human capital. Uh, I, I think in budgeting processes, it's always preferable to do compensation and, and raising and any increase in compensation all at one time. Um, as I said before, I am very confident uh, that we'll be able to get those trainers. Right now, we're just stuck between a rock and a hard place because of where we are with the state legislature and some variables that have yet to settle. Um, but as I said before, it's a commitment from the administration uh, to make sure that we get those trainers uh, on those campuses. We do view it as a safety concern. Um, but I don't know retroactively if the opportunity truly exists to add a raise mid-budget cycle for that category group. I just, in practice, don't know how realistic that is. Just being honest. I don't know if that's helpful. Thank you. That's helpful. Did you have another question or anything? I do. I, I don't actually know who these people, I don't want like names, but I don't actually know what an AP 13 or 16 is. I probably should, but I just so, don't. Think. So there was a conversation, um, uh, I think in March or April, we talked about what AP 12 and 13, and, and it ends up being the executive director uh, level. So uh, executive directors in the organization are those, many of them are, are those that supervise principals. Um, we also have them within the administration. Uh, and so they are supervisory, um, they, they lead a lot of the work, they are the connection between strategy and implementation in many cases are in, and are very, very important. Uh, so that's where that line is. Above that would be your assistant superintendents uh, and, and chiefs. Um, and there aren't many of them, which is why the dollar amount is, is small relative to the total budget. But um, we are always competing for, for individuals at all in all job categories, uh, and so I, I do want to to acknowledge that point that was made earlier that there hasn't been a compensation adjustment for that group uh, for a little while now, um, and again, it's it, it's something that we have to consider as we move forward building up the teams. And over the course of the last year, we have had many vacancies. We are in the process of trying to staff up, um, so it would be a something else that have to consider as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Gonzalez. Sure. Um, there were uh, vacancies at the executive director level? Oh, we've had exec, <laughs> there have been vacancies everywhere. Um, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> um, uh, absolutely. And so I, I don't have the exact number of executive directors within the organization, uh, you know, in school leadership alone, just the ones that oversee principals. There were nine. We've actually added one to support middle schools or support secondary to provide additional supports for middle schools. Um, but again, we have them um, in operations. For instance, uh, we have an executive director of transportation that oversees you know, 600 bus drivers and transportation folks. We have executive director of service center, which oversees plumbers, electricians, uh, and there's 300 individuals there. So those would be in that same category um, as well. So we do have them throughout the organization. Uh, and that's generally the level that they reside at. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Um, yes, Trustee Boswell. I have a question for Mr. Ramos. Um, what would the impact, if we were to amend the motion further to, what would the impact be of um, maintaining the 3% raise and adding the, moving the athletic trainers from a deferral to a now on um, the, the degree to which we need to go into our reserves and on our fund balance 
for this year and and kind of projecting out how much more difficult would it be to kind of find the savings so, for the budget as a whole. So my recommendation based on your comments, uh, Trustee Boswell, would be to adopt the budget as proposed and then in August come back with an amendment to uh, reduce our expenditures by half a million dollars so that we can move forward now with hiring the trainers. And so if you give me a month, I can find half a million dollars in our budget. No. Thank you. So and, um, not to kind of push that a little bit, um, but based on timing, you know, given the dollar amount and the fact that we would still have to go through the process of interviewing, identifying, hiring, that those those individuals couldn't in many instances not even come on board until after that amendment even occurred. So we don't have to begin the process after we approve the amendment. We can begin the process earlier because we can't overspend as a district by function. We're just starting the fiscal year so that there's no way that's going to happen. Uh, but knowing that we have to find 500000 so that we can begin the process of hiring the six trainers, uh, that gives us the time that we need to dive further into the budget, which we're already going to do uh, July, August, September. And so by doing that, we'll bring a preliminary, well, we'll bring our first budget amendment to the board in August instead of October, just specifically addressing the $500,000 for the trainers. Yes, Trustee Sabata. Well, some of the callers have had a said that uh, they had already uh, they already had candidates ready to go and they were going to have to call them back so um, so we would still have to wait till October to hire no is that what you're saying no. okay. so if if the the board gives us a direction to bring back an amendment in August okay. we could begin the hiring process now uh, because by the time we hire these trainers, they would hit the new fiscal year, and then we would find the 500000 to make sure that we, again, it's a budget-neutral item for us. And so that would be the, the ultimate goal. Yeah. If well, that, I, if that yeah. would be the board's preference. If we delay a pay raise, uh, it's my understanding that we can't retro a pay raise, so we could only give a pay raise from the date that it's approved. And so if we wait till September, uh, the pay raise would only be effective September and forward. We couldn't retro it back to July 1. That's a good point. Right. Well, it's like right now we have only two of the eight that we're going to be hired, right? Correct. And so what's the difference of hiring three more with this 3%? Um, even though we can't do the six, but at least we'll be able to cover more schools. So in looking back at the figures, it's closer to 500-500. So the 3% raise was more expensive than what I thought. It's not 250, it's closer to 500, half a million. So it would cover the six. Okay. So then that's my recommendation. I would still want to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Can we check on the what the motion was? Was it really? Is the motion stated as? Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, I, I had understood it initially to be, can we look for cost savings from the AP 13 to 16, and that would be cost savings for the year, which would free us up to pit fund those positions now, and would ultimately help us to address the cuts that we need to make ultimately. So that's kind of how I understood it, and I would like to. Uh, you know, I am torn on that idea, but I do think that when we're making some really, really hard decisions right now, I think that when we look back to the consultation agreement, I think a healthier consultation agreement would not have included the 3% for AP 13 through AP 16 at the time if we knew that we weren't getting state funds, because now we are making the decision between giving someone currently making $200,000 a $6,000 raise versus, you know, um, so I just want to put that in context. I, I value the work that our executive directors and higher do. I appreciate the, the, the market that we're in where they could go somewhere else and potentially do the same work for more money. Um, 
but it's, at a certain point, it's not all about money. At a certain point, it's about your commitment to a district and the children that it serves. And at a certain point, even though we can always use, all of us can always use more money, everyone can look and say, like, wow, if I could get paid more, then I would be able to do X, Y, or Z. But we just made a big deal out of providing a $4 an hour raise for people who are currently making $16,000 a year to allow them to make 20000 ish, 20, 16 to 21 or something like that. And at the same time, we're handing out $6,000 raises and, and $4,000 raises to people making 130000 So I think, but we're also, we have the consultation agreement and there's an expectation that we're gonna provide that. So I think that that's another challenge with it. So at the same time, there's a commitment that we said that we're gonna hire athletic trainers. And so at some point, we are gonna to have to renege on some of our commitments and some of our promises. But yes. Uh, so. Just a comment. I appreciate those comments. Um, the one thing I, I want to understand is we brought a budget to the board two weeks ago. That was a recommended budget. We got feedback from the board to reduce that budget. Mm -hmm. And we got that feedback through an information session and based on tables that we received from, for several, from many of y'all. And so we came back with an, a budget that's lower than what we actually felt comfortable bringing forward. So my question to Ed is, why is it not why is it not simply just adding the five hundred thousand dollars back because we were actually still going to be less than the budget that was brought forward two weeks ago and and a month ago and so I guess my that, that would be my question to to Ed. Um, so <clears throat> so we can do that. We would just need to adjust the final motion. Okay, so I would like to just speak in favor of continuing to honor the commitment we made through the consultation agreement that includes the pay raise that everyone is expecting at this time. I would like us to continue in the future, however, to continue looking for ways that we can flatten the organization and have a less six-figure salaries and support more people at the five salary, if I did a salary. Um, and I would also like to advocate for also maintaining that commitment to the trainers if possible for safety concerns. It does that. Yes. So I just want to clarify. So the budget that was presented to us tonight is a, is a little lower. It's a little lower than, than what we saw it. two weeks ago. Correct. So if we added the athletic trainers in tonight, we would still be lower, lower. than we were two weeks ago. Correct. Correct. That is a true statement. It's fascinating. <laughs> we, we take feedback, we make adjustments, you forget that, so that, that's, that's um, so yes, that opportunity still exists. Okay. Right, it's an amended, it would be an amended motion to add that back into the budget. Yeah. Yeah, so. Okay, so, okay, so, I'll, well, the condition, I, here's my interpretation. The conditions are more favorable <laughs> right now with for what you want, only because it sounds like we have a little bit more wiggle room. But, I mean, we're going from deficit to more deficit. I mean, that's, we have the money. Like, we ha we're, we're going into our savings. When we say deficit, it's not like we're taking credit right. to do this. Like, we're, we actually have the savings. Right. So it's just digging deeper into the savings. Um, than we were originally planning to tonight, but this is kind of, it's, it's actually not as deep as it was two weeks ago because Ed re-ran some numbers and, and already. The team. Uh, yeah, the team did. And Ed and the team. And so I hope that makes sense. There's essentially room to add the trainers in without taking out AP 13 and above and that would still leave us better off than we were two weeks ago. Correct. That is 100% correct. Thank you, Professor. Okay, so go ahead, Andrew. I just want to say thank you to um, Superintendent Segura and Mr. Ramos for engaging in this discussion. This is not something that I had discussed before this evening or even thought of until Trustee Zapata brought it up. And so I just really appreciate the fact that you're like not only entertaining this conversation, but very much like engaging with us in a collaborative, like it's great. Thank you, I appreciate it. It is. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't be doing that so much. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I too want to thank you. I, I didn't know I was going to bring it up either. Uh, so thank you. 
And can I ask our board council, are we able to amend the motion? Would the person who made the motion have to amend it? Or she could, I, I think we got to vote it down. Maybe we need to withdraw. Or we maybe withdraw if Trustee Zapata is willing to withdraw her motion to amend, then we could amend the. In a different direction. A motion. Okay. So would you like to withdraw yeah. it and offer a different? Okay. And would you like to offer a replacement motion, um, which would not necessitate a swap? But it would just be adding to. Okay. So I need to take a stab at it. <laughs> so I want, I would like to. Mike, please. Oh. Okay. So I would like to amend the. I would like to amend what? The, the motion to approve the budget. Would you like me to try, Trustee Zapata? Yes. Okay. So I think maybe what you want to do is move to amend the, the existing motion. motion to approve the budget as described by uh, reinstituting the allocation for athletic trainers. Does that, okay. does that okay. cover it? That covers it. Now let's see if is I remember it. Enough? Okay, I would like to amend the motion to uh, reinstitute the 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 three percent uh, uh, compensation for no, not, not that part. By oh, adding oh, the athletic I'm sorry. Trainers. The allocation. For the I would like to trainers. amend the motion to add the to approve the budget, to as, approve described. The budget as described and add the uh, trainers, athletic trainers, to the budget. Okay. So. Okay, great. So we have a motion to, uh, let's see if I get it now. We have a, a motion to amend the existing motion um, to approve the budget as is, but then add in the athletic trainers. Okay, and that's a motion by Trustee Zapata, a second by Trustee Gonzalez. Is there any discussion? Okay. I want to say as a principle of practice, at the last minute, I would find cutting out something we agreed to for people abhorrent. And so I'm really glad that that's not that's right. what we ended up having to vote about. Exactly. And I, I love, to Trustee Gonzalez's point, okay. I love the discussion. Thank you. And I would like to add that I think we're all reacting to the idea that it's abhorrent to endanger children in our organization's care over half a million dollars that Doesn't like each do. child's life is incalculably um, uh, precious and and I think that's what we're all reacting to and, right. and remind us that it's a really horrible position to be in in a place we don't have to be but I'm yeah thank you okay. all so all those in favor of Tracy Zapata's um, amendment um, raise your right hand or raise your hand Okay, the motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Yay. Now. We have to read it again. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah so no, now we go back. Anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. I just know that I, I do think, I do go back. I think it was a typo on page 16, because on 16 it says proposed investments, six FTEs for trainers at a cost of 170000 And then it says under the delayed, that should have been six true. FTEs yeah. for 0. 0.51. Yeah. So I just want to clarify that we're not. Moving six to a total of 12, right. moving six to a total of eight. Correct. Okay. Thank okay. Um, okay, so now we're going to go back to the original motion to approve the budget. Um, wait. Yeah, the, the amended. The amended. Yeah, the amended um, budget. And we have to take a new motion for that? Mm -hmm. Or do we go back to the no. original? Okay. You have the original that's now subject okay. to the amendment. And, Thank you. And okay. for transparency, we're adopting a budget with a $52.25 million deficit versus at the information session a $53 million deficit. So we're still okay. lower than. Oh, we can spend 75 million. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just for 750,000 more. It's a different decimal point. Now you guys know how I shop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so now we are, um, so that we had a motion by, I believe it was Trustee Boswell, yes. to approve the budget um, as amended with a, and do we need a second? I second it. Okay. Oh, and we have a second by, seconded. yes, with the second by Trustee Kaufman. Is there any discussion? Oh my goodness. Okay, so all those in favor, raise your hand. 
The motion passes unanimously. We have a budget. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so Superintendent Segura, do we have any new appointments approved by the budget tonight? Um, well, it approved by the board motion. Uh, yes. Approved by, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> approved by the uh, board tonight. Yes, I'd like yes. to uh, congratulate Dr. Angel Wilson, uh, our new su assistant superintendent of secondary school leadership. You yes. saw her yes. present earlier today. Yay. Congratulations, Dr. Wilson. And then right, right next to her, uh, Lakeisha Drinks, uh, our new assistant superintendent of elementary Yay. school leadership. <laughs> we have uh, Crystal Frank, who is not with us. Uh, she'll be the executive director of bond uh, contracts and procurement construction management. That is a bond funded position, so not general fund. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, and then Christine Fox will be the executive director of state and federal compliance accountability uh, in the chief financial officers um, division. So congratulations. Yeah. Well, girl. Okay. That's awesome. Congrats to all of you. Uh, so we will uh, now recess the open meeting at 12. Oh my gosh, 12.53 a.m. and move to executive session pursuant to Texas Government Code sections 551.074, and 551.071. When we are finished with the executive session, we will briefly return to the open session to take action on transfer appeals and to formally adjourn the meeting. The action and adjournment will be recorded and be included in all replays of tonight's meeting. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening.